Whole Story Quest Audiobooks presents The Follower by Robert White Narrated by Nicholas Cam I decided that if the police couldn't catch the gangsters, I'd create a fellow who could. Chester Gould Remembrance Day, 8th of November, 1987 Rick Fuller's Story I remember it as if it were yesterday. Des Cogan and I had been attending the parade at Leominster, Hereford. We got there around half past ten and stood around on the corner of Broad Street and Church Street, ahead of the eleven o'clock service at the Priory Church. Des smoking his pipe and me moaning about it. I'd first met with the dour smoking Scott back in the late seventies. Just two skinny, angry young men with too much testosterone for our own good. We completed the pre-parachute selection, P Company, course, and depot, para, in Aldershot together. That allowed us the honour of wearing the maroon beret of the 2nd Battalion Parachute Regiment. From there it was over to Northern Ireland for what seemed like one endless war of deceit, death and destruction. Due to us both completing selection for 22 SAS together... We were spared the battles for Goose Green, Wireless Ridge and the capture of Port Stanley, where the shiny two acquitted themselves so valiantly. The Falklands aside, Des and I fought alongside each other for almost ten years. He was my closest friend. Once the church service was over, we watched the wreath laying at the war memorial, ahead of a return march to the Royal British Legion and a few beers with the old boys. For me, it was a day of sadness, yet a day of celebration. Remembering the dead was one thing, but being alive to tell the tale was quite another, and deserved a beer or two. The Legion was a big single-story affair on South Street, and although it boasted a large concert room, we squeezed ourselves into the lounge. It was packed, and we had to shove to the bar every round. This journey, to and from each refill, also involved some serious slagging off of any crap hats en route. I drank a little more back in those days, before Cathy came along and ran me in. And although this banter may have looked serious to some onlookers, it was all good friendly repartee, really, and I always enjoyed the day. We ended up sitting in a corner with two old RAF boys who revelled in their tales of bombing raids over Hamburg and Dresden. Love it, hate it, agree with it or not, it's a tradition, a thanksgiving, one I personally think should be upheld forever. With no smartphones or internet, news didn't travel quite so fast in those days, and it was just after one o'clock that the first reports of a bomb going off across the water in Ireland started to seep through. When a news flash finally showed the first pictures of the cenotaph for Enniskillen, County for Manor, the whole bar fell silent. Des gave me a look I knew only too well. We dropped our pints on the table, eased ourselves out of the club, found our car and self for sterling lines. As the day progressed, we all sat around the TV or listened into the radio for news. As you could imagine, none of it was good. Eleven people dead, many old-age pensioners who had survived all the Nazis could throw at them. Dozens of onlookers terribly maimed and wounded. The PIRA later admitted that its target had been the British soldiers parading to the memorial. History went on to tell us that the Enniskillen bomb did indeed explode as a group of UDR soldiers made their way to the cenotaph. But it missed them, and instead buried innocent people under rubble and hurled masonry towards the gathered crowd. Of the eleven people killed that day, three were married couples... One guy, Gordon Wilson, whose daughter Marie died in the blast and was himself wounded, went on to become a peace campaigner. Fair play to the bloke. Of the seriously injured, thirteen were children. We knew there had been trouble in the province the week before and expected some form of backlash. Tensions between the RUC and the Provost had been running high after the police clashed with mourners at the funeral of two PIRA volunteers. When a gunman fired a three-volley salute over the coffins, the cops went in all heavy-handed and fired plastic bullets into the crowd. One of the coffins was knocked to the ground. 
It was a mess, but no one quite expected the level of retaliation seen at Enniskillen. Des and I had been on strip duty, part of a CT, a counter-terrorism troop of 16 blokes. The lads were split into four patrols. I, as a corporal, led one of them. Des was my number two, alongside Dave, the butcher Stanley and Frankie Green, my explosive man. We were all a similar age, between 25 and 30, and got on like a house on fire. When we weren't away or on standby, we socialised together. Des and Frankie were married, but somehow still managed a good few nights on the lash. I knew Des's Mrs. Anne didn't like me too much. I put that down to the fact that every time I brought him home, he was legless. The bomb remained the talking point all week. All our team had completed at least two tours over the water and knew the script, but we're all getting tired of listening to the same old rhetoric on both sides. Something needed a change, and after the carnage of Enniskillen, thankfully it seemed that even the most fervent Sinn Féin supporters were calling for an end to the violence and were demanding a political settlement. On the Friday, after the bombing, as we trudged from a killing house carrying hundreds of pounds of kit, piss sweat through and freezing our tits off, we were met by one of the senior CRW trainers, Pat Evans. The counter-revolutionary warfare wing was set up in the 70s to train other squadrons in CT work. Pat was a top bloke and really knew his stuff. He trained us in advanced pistol work, explosive entries, room clearing and the like. It seemed our patrol had been summoned to the head shed. You lucky bastards, he said, lighting a fag. You have to get some fucking sunshine. Do anything to get out of the rain, some fuckers. He wandered off in a cloud of smoke, and I felt the tell-tale rumblings of excitement that only a mission could provide. We cleaned and stowed our kit, showered and changed out of our sodden clothes and got a brew on. By the time we'd finished the first pot, we were joined by the O.C. in a fresh-faced suit. "'Right, lads,' said the O.C., grabbing a cup for himself. "'Listen up, you're off on a jolly.' The suit was of a similar age to our patrol, lanky with a white blonde side shed hairstyle. He didn't introduce himself. He simply perched his backside on the edge of the table we sat around all casual as you like and ploughed on in an accent right out of his Oxbridge upbringing. The Enniskillen bomb was made up of 18 kilograms of Semtex, 40 pounds in old money, he began. It was hidden in a sports bag and left against the gable wall inside the town's reading rooms. It had a crude timer that was set to explode at 10.43 hours just before the ceremony was to start. Who made the bomb and who planted it is not your concern. However, the Semtex it was constructed from was provided to the PIRA by the Libyans, by Gaddafi himself. And that is very much your baby. I pricked my ears up at that. I'd never fought in the desert or against the Arabs. My old man served in Aden, the Yemen, and that hadn't ended well. The suit lifted an expensive-looking briefcase from between his feet and pulled out a sheaf of papers. Now we all know that our pal Muammar Gaddafi began to supply weapons to the Irish back in the early 70s. However, it appeared his interest in interfering in the Troubles had waned. That was until the Yanks killed his adopted daughter last year in a bombing raid. As those aircraft were launched from UK bases, old Muammar decided to teach us a lesson and start supplying the paddies again. Now then, a couple of months back, the French kindly intercepted a ship. He checked his papers. The Escand, in their waters, bound for Ireland... It had 1,000 AK-47s and two tons of Semtex on board. Frankie Green whistled at that snippet. Exactly, countered the suit. Now we are not suggesting for a moment that you nip over to Libya and dispose of our pet despot, as he does have his other uses. However, we do believe we know the identity of the chap who is the go-between, the facilitator of these transactions between Gaddafi and the PIRA. He turned some pages, found a grainy black and white photograph and dropped it on the desk. Abdallah al-Mufti, gentlemen. He's 32 years old and an Egyptian by birth. He is a Muslim, but he is not a fanatic or a freedom fighter. He doesn't care who receives his guns and explosives so long as he gets paid. 
He is a dealer, pure and simple. He will trade in anything from slaves to socket sets. Obtaining this picture and the intel on his whereabouts has cost the lives of two very good chaps. We want the blighter gone. Pronto. The O.C. put down his cup and addressed us. So, lads, this bloke Al Mufti is holed up in a place called Tiji, a small town in the municipality of Nalut in the northwest of Libya. It's located about 240k southwest of Tripoli in the Nafusa Mountains at the northern edge of a major oil field. It's also home to a Libyan forces barracks. Our initial idea was to drop you chaps in Halo, light up this bugger's quarters with a beacon and let the RAF do the rest. However, Downing Street don't agree. The house is close to a mosque and a hospital, and that kind of collateral damage isn't acceptable. Therefore, as you will need quite a bit of kit, we'll get you to the Tunisian coast by sea, then it will be up to you from there. Once you get eyes on this Al Mufti chap, do the business and piss off quick sharp. I looked at the guy's picture. He had the weathered face of a man who had spent many months in the desert sun, with sharp light eyes that just had to be blue in the flesh. He wore a full beard and the standard Arabic checkered headgear, known as the kafia or kufia. The shot had been taken from a distance and Al Mufti was watching something or someone intently. He looked a mean fucker. How much support will this guy have? I asked. I mean, with the Libyan army holed up in the town, can we expect them to protect him? The suit began to put his papers back in his briefcase. Al Mufti has his own protection group. Our intel says they number between 20 and 30. They are battle-hardened and well-trained, taken from all over the Muslim world, men who have grown tired of war and have been tempted away from their various conflicts by the handsome wages he pays. However, al-Mufti is also a close personal friend of Gaddafi, and the soldiers in Tiji are loyal to Gaddafi's regime. What can I say? This is a job that needs to be done quickly and quietly, Fuller. Don't wake the sleeping dog, if you know what I mean. I knew exactly what he meant. Sterling Lines, Friday the 13th of November, 1987 Des Kogan's story. I was gutted about the Enniskillen business. All my family were descendants of Irish Catholics. My old man had been born across the water and he knew what it had been like to grow up in the sectarian hotbed that was Belfast. He'd quickly learned how the provosts worked and what kind of influence they had over the local community. Strangely, he never questioned my motives when I joined up. There's good and bad everywhere, he'd say. Just make sure you're on the right side of that, son. He was really wrong, was my old dad. That said, the bombing had opened up many of the old wounds, and some of the more vocal lads were gagging for a bit of revenge on the paddies. I kept my head down and my mouth shut. I didn't need a fat lip just because I kicked with the wrong foot. We'd only been back home ten days ourselves. Our troop had been over the water since May the 9th. Ringing my wife Anne with the news that I was off again didn't go too well, I'll tell you. The minute the suit had left, the O.C. dropped a thick file on the table and we all sat around the table pouring over maps of TG and aerial shots of the target premises. We drank pints of tea, offered different opinions on how best to tackle the job and took the piss mercilessly. A couple of sweaty hours later, we had a plan we considered would work. The head shed had organised our transport. First we would fly to Malta, a friendly face in that part of the world where no one would ask questions. Then it was a nine-hour boat ride to the Tunisian port of Jazis, located at the southern end of the eastern peninsula, named the Delegation. We chose Jazis as it was both a major port and a popular tourist destination where foreigners didn't stand out like a sore thumb. The boys from Whitehall had a contact there who would provide a jeep, fresh rations and get our equipment past the port authorities. Then it was a two and a half hour drive along the P-19 to the Libyan border, dump the vehicle before the checkpoint and a tab to Tiji. Piece of piss. 
Abdallah al-Mufti's house was a single-storey square block of a place, flat-roofed and well-fortified. It was situated on a narrow street of similar buildings that we had to presume would be occupied by civilians. As the O.C. had said, within 500 yards was a fair-sized mosque and a small medical centre. Even with modern weaponry, the RAF would have wiped out half the community. The boss was right, and their strike was a non-starter. Rick had asked me to act as quartermaster for the job, something I enjoyed and had done before. With the prospect of meeting up to 30 well-armed and trained fighters, we needed some big stuff to go with our personal kit. I found us an AW-50F, a folding stock variant of Accuracy International's AW-50, which fires the multi-purpose Ralfos MK-211 cartridge. The round combines a penetrator, high explosive and incendiary effect all in one tidy package. They make a fucking mess, I'll tell you. Our model was also fitted with a Hensolt NSV-80 night vision sight as we figured we may end up fighting in the pitch black. At 15 kilograms, the AW-50F is four times the weight of a typical assault rifle and the .5 calibre ammunition weighs a fucking tonne. But I reckoned it'd be worth the extra effort as it would take on a light armoured vehicle or punch through a concrete wall. Four M16A3s with extended 30-round mags and four Browning L9A1 high-power SLPs finished the picture for weaponry. Some would say the Browning was outdated by 1987, but I'd fired it all my army career, as had the other lads in the patrol. Better the devil you know. Also finding their way into our Bergens were eight HG-85 fragmentation hand grenades, each containing 155-gram TNT and around 1,800 fragments. Great for fighting and built-up areas. As our plan didn't involve us fighting a single round, you might say this massive armament was over the top. But if we were forced to fight our way out of TG and back over the border with half the Libyan army on our tails, well... Of course, each of us would be taking those little things that made us comfortable. Frankie Green had the most important job as our explosives expert, and he was busy sourcing C4, reels of cable, tremble switches, detonators and the like. Frankie actually enjoyed blowing things up. He hailed from Barnsley, South Yorkshire. They breed them tough down there, and Frankie was no exception. The son of a Yorkshire coal miner, he spoke with a thick accent using thee and tha rather than you and your. He'd been married from the age of 17 and had three kids. His wife, Karen, was a big girl in every way, whereas Frankie was as skinny as a rake, a wiry little tough fucker who you'd have to kill to beat in a scrap. If anyone ever dared mention the size of his missus, Frankie would say something like, They don't know what they're missing, they. They need something to get hold of at night, they knows. He was also a steady Eddie. We nicknamed him Captain Sensible after the singer. He was always so calm and collected, spoke when he had something worth saying, and was an all-round good bloke. When I look back at my career in the army, I reckon Frankie was one of the few blokes I met that had a really solid home life. Butch was another matter altogether. Dave the Butcher Stanley got his nickname after he cut off Argentinian soldiers' ears as we mementos during the battle for Goose Green. Fucking weird if you ask me, pal, but anyway, Butch was also a dab hand in a scrap, especially at close quarters. Having a bloke like Butch at your disposal was all well and good, but if we found we needed his particular brand of expertise on this job, we'd be in the shit big time. Butch smacked his own personal kukri, the knife the Gurkhas used in battle. Once he had that in his hand, blood would be spilled one way or the other, even if it was his own. Where Frankie was easy going, Butch had a temper. Luckily, Rick always seemed to be able to keep him in hand. I hoped that remained the case, as I had a feeling this job was going to need cool, calm heads. Rick had a thing about flashes and bangs, and he'd packed half a dozen stun grenades to make him feel better. Me? I took my pipe and a good pair of beanos.
Sunday, 15th of November, 1987. Rick Fuller's story. It had been lashing it down when we took off from Hereford, but by the time we were loading our kit onto the boat that would take her to Zhaj's, the Maltese sun shone warm on our backs. None of our patrol had shaved since we got the nod for the trip. Every fucker seemed to have a beard in the Arab world. We thought it may help us mingle. As I watched the lads humping Bergens onto the deck, I considered we looked a right rough bunch. We wore boots and desert cargoes, but after that I'd left it up to the individual. I just made sure each of the crew had some warm clothes as it gets terribly cold after dark in that part of the world. Also, we all had the traditional Arab headgear in our kit. Once we got on the road at the other end, with a bit of luck, the beards and the kofia would give us a chance at passing for locals on first glance. Our boat was an old fishing vessel, all brightly painted, the type you take pictures of when you're on your holidays. However, it was manned and skippered by a crew made up of 1st Battalion AFM. They were all from C Company, the Maltese Quick Reaction Force, used for high-risk operations, based at how far. They didn't say much or ask any questions, just the way I liked it. The nine-hour trip meant we could eat and get some essential kip. The AFM lads really looked after us in the grub department. They made us a traditional Maltese meal, starting with a dish called caponata, a vegetable salad made from chopped fried eggplant and celery, with capers, olives and peppers. After that came suffet talfenek, a spiced rabbit stew with piles of fresh bread, all washed down with tafit taza, a Maltese version of builder's tea, made with condensed milk and served in a glass. It was the best meal I'd had in ages. As the old boat pushed lazily through the water and the sun set over the bow, Des, Butch and Frankie sat cross-legged on the deck playing cards. They looked like they had a care in the world. Me, I lay back against the boat's bulkhead, stretched out my legs, crossed them at the ankles and closed my eyes. The rhythmical chug of the old diesel engine and the warmth of the evening sent me off in an instant. I slept like a baby. It will be my last for a while. We were met in Jarzish by a man from the ministry. He was a posh boy with good taste in clothes. He did his job to the letter and made sure that all our kit was unloaded into a jeep without a customs guy in sight. I got the impression he was destined for the security services. He had that quiet, unruffled confidence about him. Within 40 minutes of docking, we were on the road, sporting our new beards and headgear, ready for the two-and-a-half-hour drive to Libya. The plan was to dump the jeep about 10 kilometres from the actual border and then tab the rest of the way over rough ground at TG. The head shed had given me a handheld GPS unit to play with, one of the first I'd ever seen. I viewed it with some suspicion and decided not to rely on it. The Americans had developed the system, but back in the late 80s, there were only ten satellites up in the sky for the units to feed off, making them less reliable than the modern units of today. Even so, I was told in no uncertain terms not to lose it. Apparently, they were very expensive. Unusually, the tab across the border went like clockwork, without the faintest sign of bother. The only thing I would say is that if you ever doubted the cold in the desert at night, I'll tell you this. It's colder than a witch's tit. We all carried personal shortwave comms should we need to talk to each other. I, as patrol leader, had a satellite phone should we get in the shit. Just who yours truly would ring to get us out of the proverbial brown stuff would be another matter. Air support was never going to be an option with a medical facility and a mosque so close to the target premises. TG, Libya, Thursday, 19th of November, 1987. Des Colgan's story. We'd found our LUP, laying out point, just after those 700 hours. The sun was just about up and beginning to warm our frozen bones. Sometime around 1600 hours we knew it would drop like a stone again, plunge TG into darkness and the temperature would plummet into minus figures. We were hunched in a dried-out wadi that ran north to south, some 500 metres from our target. Deep enough to conceal us from any nosy locals, but close enough for me to get eyes on Al-Mufdi's premises with the binos. 
We dropped our burgans, got some much-needed rations down our necks and a brew on. Feeling a little warmer, we then sorted out our kit, checking and rechecking our weapons. Freddy was already setting up his own personal bomb-making factory as he hummed a little tune. "'What oh, are you singing?' I asked. "'On the claim all about that,' he said. I shook my head. "'It's a tale about this lad-like,' he explained. "'He goes up on moors with no hat on, and he catches his death of cold.' I laughed. "'You're a fucking alien, pal. Nobody can understand that shite.' Freddy rolled C4 in his palms to warm and shape it. It's a good Yorkshire June, Desmond, and I wouldn't understand. I left him to it. Tishy was bigger and more modern than I imagined, and contemporary buildings were visible in the far distance. That said, the area around our target was stock poor. Sand rendered low rise flat roof dwellings sat opposite each other, divided by tight alleyways. Narrow pothole streets were home to skinny wild dogs prowling around sniffing for scraps. Local women carried baskets of vegetables on their heads as they trudged to the local market, and men in national dress drove the odd goat in the same direction, hoping for a sale. Al Mufti's house was located on the corner of a narrow lane and the wider tarmac road that ran between the oil field and the town proper. This meant we had a good view from our wadi, but would make getting in close difficult in the daylight hours. The land between our position and the target was flat as a pancake, with no cover at all other than the odd telegraph pole. If we got caught out there, we'd all be slaughtered in an instant. Our plan had been simple enough. Ensured Abdallah al-Mufti was all tucked up in bed, getting close to the house under cover of darkness, attach enough C4 to blow the thing sky high and fuck off quick sharp. Simple, eh? Not so. The gaff was not only bigger than we first thought, maybe five bedrooms, but also under armed guard. Two men with AK-47 slung across the chest patrolled the perimeter. They looked tired or bored or both, but they or their replacements would have to be dealt with before we could plant our charges. In addition to the two sleepy heads, a crew of other faces, mostly dressed in typical Arab terrorist garb, wandered about the street, smoking and carrying everything from AKs to GPMGs. They didn't appear to have a purpose, they were just there. The building opposite our target was a larger structure with a high-walled rear yard, it wasn't a dwelling, more of a storage facility. Our 18-ton six-wheeler had already trundled around to the back gate's early doors. The truck was on its axles, fully laden, and the wandering terrorist types slipped in and out of this building at regular intervals to help with the unloading of whatever its cargo was. Whitehall's estimate of 30 guys supporting Al-Mufti was conservative, to say the least, and as the morning wore on, our head count continued to rise. We stopped bothering at fifty. Parked directly outside the front door of our target's house were three vehicles. The first was a Toyota pickup. It had the suspension jacked up and big fat tyres fitted to enable it to negotiate the desert terrain. Experienced desert drivers are a godsend. They know exactly how much air to have in the tyres to get you where you need to go. In some conditions, they run them almost flat and carry a small compressor in the back to reinflate them when the ground changes. This Swee model also boasted some kit you wouldn't get offered as an optional extra in a Toyota showroom. It had an M2 bolted to the roof. The heavy machine gun designed by John Browning had a full belt of .5 BMG cartridges sitting next to it, all ready to be fed into the weapon. Even though the M2 was an old weapon, first deployed in World War I, in the right hands, it was devastating. Behind the Toyota was a Mitsubishi Shogun. It had the same wheel treatment, but was all clean and shiny with privacy glass to the rear. Obviously, Al Mufti liked to ride in air-conditioned comfort, rather than in the dust-filled open air with his troops. The final vehicle was another pickup truck of indeterminate make that looked like it had been in a war or two. Just before ten hundred hours we had movement from the house. It's up, said Rick sharply. 
The tired patrolling guards perked up no end, and the seemingly random set of faces that wandered the street between the house and the storage facility suddenly became an organised drilled cordon, all taking their previous agreed positions, weapons at the ready. If Ronnie Reagan himself had been an overnight guest, he couldn't have been happier with the security. It was only once this team had got their shit together that the close protection crew who all appeared to have been sleeping in the main house appeared. First, the three drivers stepped out and started the engines of their respective vehicles. Next came the guy in charge of the M2. He clambered up onto the lead pickup, fed the belt of cartridges into the weapon and corked it. He looked a big, muscle-bound, mean fucker and scanned the horizon in that direction. Then four more guys exited and jumped in the back of the second pickup. All had AKs, seemed switched on and well-drilled. I focused my binos on the front door and held my breath. Two massive faces stepped out. They were black, of African origin. Nigerian, Sudanese maybe. No flowing robes for these boys. It was all tight black t-shirts, Levi's and Ray-Bans. Both sported tan leather shoulder holsters with big calibre chrome SLPs sitting in them. They stood either side of the door scanning the street, which seemed to have cleared completely of any locals. Even the scabby dogs had fucked off. Everyone was waiting, including us. Then there he was, Abdallah al-Mufti. He was a tall, handsome man, lithe and long-limbed. The full beard he'd sported in his photograph was now no more than designer stubble, and his jet-black hair was slicked back and tied into a ponytail. Those light eyes on the black and white shot we'd seen were the sharpest blue. He stood on the doorstep wearing a pale linen suit and white open neck shirt, king of all he surveyed. Butch caught the AW-50, but Rick placed his hand on top of the sight and shook his head. Not now. al turned. Standing behind him was a stunningly beautiful woman in a long yellow dress that hugged every curve of her figure. At her side was a boy of about nine. He was a serious child and wore the traditional Arabic white dish dasher and crocheted skull cap. He carried a brightly coloured plastic toy in his left hand. Resting in the crook of the woman's olive-skinned arm was a baby of about six months. Al Mufti kissed his children and then the woman, who we could only presume to be his wife. She smiled as they exchanged a few words. Then he turned to his bodyguards, gave them the slightest nod and they escorted him to the shogun. I could see why Butch had been tempted to let go a couple of rounds and try and take out our boy as he stepped out into the morning sunshine, but the chances of a clean shot and a buzz living to tell the tale would be minimal. Escape back through the desert at night gave us a chance, and the daylight and with the firepower at Al Mufti's disposal, we would be picked off like ducks in a gallery. The three-vehicle convoy did a U-turn at the junction and headed slowly back up the narrow street past the house and away from our position, kicking up a cloud of dust behind it. Just another fucking day in the office, said Butch. I turned to Rick. There was no way on God's green earth any of our patrol were going to blow up that house with two kidders inside. We need a new plan, I said. Rick Fuller's story. Al Mufti was in control of a small militia that seemed well trained and switched on. They weren't all Arabic either. There were white faces mixed in there, Slavic or Russian, and the two Africans closest to him were not the only black faces. I counted at least another five, and they all worked alongside each other with no issue. The building opposite the main house both worried and intrigued me. After Al Mufti's convoy left, the remaining guys were in and out of the place constantly and the sounds of trucks being loaded and unloaded echoed from the rear yard towards our position. I turned to the lads. I'll bet a pound to a pinch of shit that gaffy's Al Mufti's arms dump. Two points, said Butch. Des let his ghastly pipe and took the briefest drag. Aye, I'm with you on that, pal. Well, that can do not wait, though, said Frankie. Not with Burns in house opposite like. Light that place up like and it's likely to take out half the fucking village. Frankie was a family man, the only one of the patrol with children, 
But his judgment wasn't flawed. He was right. I wasn't a fool either, and I'd never buried my head in the sand. Collateral damage was a fact of war. Men, women and children died in conflicts. It was horrible and distressing, but sometimes unavoidable. However, killing Al Mufti's wife and children to get to him was not an option. Even blowing up the building opposite was a last chance saloon moment. I nodded. So, we have to take him in his vehicle. What if he doesn't come back any time soon? Asked Butch. He'll be back, said Des stowing his tobacco. Nor luggage, not even a briefcase. I agree, I said. This is where his operation and his family are. He won't be gone long. Frankie gripped a grey box with a retractable antenna in his left hand and a smaller device with protruding wires in his right. He held them up in turn as he spoke. Here we have a radio transmitter and receiver, just like the ones used to drive my lad's toy car back home. The transmitter sends a control signal to the receiver via radio waves and the receiver, using a tiny circuit board, carries out that command. In this case, opening or closing a simple circuit. If I can get underneath his shogun... I can plant a charge big enough to slot fucker and take out the lead and following vehicles, even detonate it from here. I looked at him. And the house? The kids? Frankie shrugged his narrow shoulders. This box has a range of about a thousand yards. If we plant our charge tonight, we wait until our guy sets off tomorrow, and when he does his U-turn at the junction... Boom. That's as good as it's gonna get, pal, said Des. I shook my head. Well, I don't know. That means we'd have to fight our way out in daylight. I had a lot of thinking to do. Never being any good at waiting was a weakness of mine, but Butch was even worse. We all took turns at keeping watch whilst the others tried to get some kip, but Butch was irritable to say the least. His infamous temper was never far from the surface, and I knew I'd have to keep an eye on him. You know what pisses me off? He asked me. I gave him a look but stayed quiet. He was going to tell me whether I wanted to hear or not. We have to push your foot around with these ragged fuckers, yeah? Worry about a fucking mosque or a hospital. Even a couple of kids in the gaff. The paddies don't worry you there, slot, eh? He shoved a thick thumb over his shoulder in the general direction of our target. These camel fuckers don't give a shit either. They know that their explosives kill women and children every day of the bastard week. It's what sets us apart, Butch, chirped up Frankie. And us, the difference between a soldier and a terrorist. Butch wasn't having any. He pulled his M16 from his shoulder and began to strip and clean it, even though it was immaculate. Slot the fuckers, all of them, that's what I say. Frankie shook his head and got on with building his bomb. Things seemed to quieten down in the street after noon, when the heat of the day made physical work difficult. By 1300 hours we had no shade at all in our waddy and were struggling. Water would become an issue sooner rather than later. That said, the sun position gave me an idea. Maybe we could exit in daylight after all. At 1316 hours the nearby mosque speakers crackled in a life for the afternoon prayers. It seemed like the whole village turned out as one, except for our Mufti's men. They simply lay out prayer mats on the ground where they stood and did their business in the open. All of them, African, Eastern European, Russian, Arab, every man a devout Muslim. It wasn't just money that tied them together. The sun started to go down just before 1600 hours. It was weird when you experienced it for the first time. One minute it was broad daylight, the next... Pitch black. At 16.32 hours, we saw the headlights of our Mufti's convoy flashing down the street, back the way it had left. Once again, the seemingly undrilled mob that wandered about the place formed a cordon and took up strategic positions for the arrival of their leader. His coming was the mirror image of his exit. His beautiful wife and two children at the door to greet him. Butch was at my shoulder. I said we'd just slot him now and fuck the consequences. Butch was a great guy to have around in a fight, but his temperament ensured his decision-making left something to be desired. I turned to Des. I reckon he's a creature of habit. I think this is his routine. We'll plant the charge under the Shogun tonight and detonate it when he leaves tomorrow. 
just like Freddy said. Des turned down the corners of his mouth and nodded. You expect to make the border in broad daylight and forty degree heat with half the Libya and at our backsides? I have an idea, I said. Better be a fucking good one, said the Scot. No sooner had our target closed his front door when the mosque fired up again and the call to evening prayer began. Des scrambled over to me, excitement in his voice. If this fucker walks to the mosque now, I say we take our shot and forget the charge. Butch looked me in the face and gave a beaming smile. No women allowed in the temple, mate, eh? And with Des, if he walks, we slot him. Except he didn't. Our Mufti stayed firmly in his house, as did his close protection team. The men outside went through the same routine as the afternoon session, praying where they stood. By 1900 hours, it was all over. Except for two new shiny sentries, the street was dark and deserted. The smell of cooking wafted towards us on the chilled night air, and Des got a brew on as our mouths watered from the smells coming from the village. Frankie shuffled over to me and sat, his hands cupped around his mug, warming his fingers from the desert cold. What time are you thinking, Rick? They say the time of deeper sleep is around four in the morning. I'd say then, mate. He nodded and seemed distant for a moment. Listen, if things go tits up and I get compromised, I don't want you silly fuckers coming in for me. I locked eyes with him. We don't leave men behind, Frank, you know that. He shook his head. This is different, Rick. There must be sixty blokes out there. They all look pretty sorted, too. Let him two on the picket will see to us all in a matter of seconds. No, mate, don't do out daft. If it all goes wrong, I need to get out of here, all of you. I rested my hand on Frankie's skinny shoulder. My responsibility is to the whole team, Frankie, and that includes you. We'll get you in and we'll get you out. All of us will be on that boat back to Malta tomorrow. You'll see. Frankie smiled and slouched back to his spot, away from the rest of the patrol. He was a bit of a loner and didn't say too much. So when he did, you listened, as he normally made sense. We'd watched the sentries patrol the perimeter of the house for the last two hours. And they were obviously as cold and tired as us, and that around oh, 0200 hours... They huddled together against the gable wall under a blanket. By 0300 hours, they appeared to be sleeping, their AKs resting on their knees. The only street lighting was at the junction of the main drag and Al Mufti's road, and that consisted of a solitary flickering street lamp. Even if the sentries were awake, they would have little chance of seeing us. From leaving the safety of our LUP until we got within 50 yards of our target, I reckoned we would be in pitch black. Well, so I thought. We'd soon find out. At 0330 hours, we bunched up with one last brew, looking out over the ridge of the wadi in silence. My devastatingly cunning plan was to get us all in close to support Frankie, staying in the inky blackness just over 50 metres from the plot, fanning out across the opening of the junction and covering the Yorkshireman's back. It wasn't just a case of putting the whole patrol in the firing line. It was a psychological boost for the man at the sharp end. My call. Once Frankie had fitted the device to the underside of the Shogun, we would all return to the Wadi and begin the long, patient wait for our Mufti to set off to work. With our target safely tucked in his Shogun, Frankie would then remotely detonate the device from the cover of our LUP, taking out all three vehicles in one hit. Then, and this was my brilliant idea, rather than run west to the border as the enemy would expect, we would turn north and stay in the Wadi for a couple of k's, then turn and hopefully avoid any search parties. Easy, eh? At 0345 hours, we had one final check of our kit. Once we were happy that we had no loose flaps, no undone buttons, everything squared away as it should be, we moved. Des had the extra weight of the AW-50 and four clips. Butch and I had our M16s, grenades and brownings. Frankie checked his device one last time and handed me his M16. He needed speed of movement. Let's go blow something up, he said. Des Cogan's story.
Wright gave the signal for us to leave the wadi and we moved at a steady pace, being as quiet as possible. The darkness was both a blessing and a curse. The uneven ground was difficult to assess with such little ambient light. The last thing we needed was a turned ankle or worse. Once we'd covered about 400 yards or so, we fanned out, giving us eyes on the gable of the target premises, the front door and all three vehicles parked out front. The two sentries were still huddled together under their blanket. I wriggled myself into the prone position with the AW-50 and took a close look at them using the Hensolt NSV-80 night vision sight. From what I could see, they both slept like babies. Game on! As I lay on the ground, I instantly felt the cold of the desert floor filter through my clothing, and I was glad that we didn't intend to sit in position for too long. Each mag for the AW-50 held five Ralfos MK-211 rounds. The wee buggers would slice through light armour and then blow the fuck out of whatever was inside. As Frankie set off on his lonely task to fit his device under the Shogun, I quietly slid the action forward and took aim at the M2 sitting on the top of the Toyota. After shit hit the fan, that was the first thing to go. Butch was off to my left and had the sentries covered. Rick to my right had Frankie's back. As the wee Yorkshire man hit the corner of the street, he was momentarily bid in the amber glow of the solitary street light. The boy was no fool and he didn't stay visible for more than a second or two and hugged the building opposite, staying in the shadows. There was hardly any moon, just enough to see the vague shape of a man scurry across the street and roll under the target vehicle. Frankie was on plot. It was 04.12 hours. Three minutes later, the imam of the nearby mosque picked up his mic to announce prayer time, and the whole fucking job went to shit. Rick Fuller's Story Frankie was under the shogun. I could just make out the slightest movement. As the call to prayer echoed along the street, I felt a knot in my gut the size of a football. The door to the building opposite opened and Guy started to trudge sleepily out into the darkness of the street. This time some wandered towards the mosque itself like moths to a flame, whilst others stuck with their routine and lay down mats in the road. Despite the hour and their purpose, all carried weapons. The two sentries pushed off their blanket, stretched themselves and sauntered towards the front door, directly opposite the Shogun. One rooted about in an alcove and pulled out two mats. They were going to kneel and pray within feet of Frankie. I clicked off the safety of my M16 and made sure I had both of them in view. Pushing the pressel on my shortwave comms, I whispered into my mic. Stand by, stand by, stand by. Our luck was out. As the first of the guards touched his nose to the ground, something must have triggered in his peripheral vision. He jumped up, startled, and grabbed his AK. I knew the best I could do was prevent him from giving away Frankie's position, so I put two in his chest and two more in his partner before either could get a shot away. A split second later, the whole place went off. Our Mufti's men poured in in the street, from the mosque, from the storage building, and from the main house. First from the house itself was the big guy who manned the M2. He clambered onto the Toyota, but the moment he reached the weapon, Des opened fire with his AW-50. The round struck the heavy machine gun and exploded, sending the barrel spinning into the night and tearing the guy to pieces in the process. I heard Butch firing his own M16 and instantly men were dropping like flies in front of the storage facility. He fired in short bursts and changed his position after each, rolling in the desert sand to confuse the enemy. Des fired again, this time at the engine compartment of the Toyota, the explosive charge in the AW's cartridge blowing the bonnet into the night and destroying the engine. Flames leapt from the vehicle and lit up the street. I kept my eye on the front door of the main house as more of Al Mufti's crew barrelled outside. They were in the light, firing wildly, unsure where the threat was coming from. We were in the dark, and other than our muzzle flashes, they had no way of identifying our positions. I opened up again and took down two more at the door. Then they found Frankie. Two men had been taking cover behind the Shogun, and with its raised suspension, Frankie had been in plain sight. I heard the eye pitched crack of the Yorkshireman's browning and one of the men cry out. The second man was about to push his AK under the Shogun and let fly, but I caught him in the throat and head with two rounds before he could fire. 
Frankie's only cover was a narrow entry that led towards the rear of the main house. I hit my comms again. Frankie, you need to move now. Roll out towards the front door and we'll cover you. Get into the alley ten metres to your left. I didn't wait for him to answer. Just poured rounds towards the men exiting the main house whilst Butch did the same with the storage unit. We needed to buy him precious moments. Dozens more men were running down the street from the mosque screaming in Arabic and I wondered exactly how many we would have to deal with. One thing was for certain. If Frankie didn't make the alley in the next few seconds, they'd be on him. Des fired at the approaching hordes with the AW-50, then gave up with the big cumbersome weapon and let go with the M-16, dropping two or three guys and sending the rest scattering for cover. I saw Frankie sprint along the pathway and dart left into the ginnel that ran alongside the property towards the rear of the house, and I felt instantly better. He was sure-lived. The second he turned, there was a tirade of automatic gunfire from deep in the alley, the muzzle flashes lighting up the narrow lane. My heart sank. I tried the Yorkshireman's comms. Once. Frankie, come in. Twice. Frankie, do you read me? I got nothing. There were lights and engine noise from behind our Mufti's property and I heard a vehicle driving away at speed. No one needed to tell me that it was our target, his wife, his children and his close bodyguards on their way to safety. In that moment, I realised that Frankie Green had walked straight into our target's CP team as they were extracting their subject. Our Mufti would not be fighting us today. We had failed, and we'd lost a good bloke. Gritting my teeth in anger, I emptied my second 30-round clip at the approaching militia, dropping four, maybe five more. But they still came. The enemy's return fire had been wayward at the beginning of the battle but now they were getting their shit together and identifying our positions. The sand around me was kicking up white hot 762 and 556. I was forced to wriggle down into what cover I had, and it was getting harder to get my own shots away. Then one of their guys opened up with some big stuff. They'd found a second M2 from somewhere and loaded it with .5 Tracer. It crackled through the air above my head, the massively powerful rounds light in the night sky. We were massively outnumbered and outgunned. It was time to fuck off, but not before we did the maximum damage possible to our Mufti's operation. Des put a round into the Shogun with the AW-50 and blew the engine compartment to pieces. Even though Frankie had managed to plant his device under the car, C4 is very stable and cannot be detonated by a gunshot, even one so powerful as the one fired by the AW. It must be initiated by a shockwave or detonator. I threw one of my HG-85s under the car. 180 grams of TNT did the trick. Triggered the C4 and the Shogun was blown ten feet into the air, spitting lethal shards of razor-sharp metal in all directions, killing and wounding several more of our enemy. I knew if we wanted to put distance between us and the marauding hordes, we needed an even bigger bang. For once, I had to agree with Butch. This was no time to worry about collateral damage. Our Mufti's kids were long gone and any civilians with any sense had fucked off too. I hit my comms. Des, put everything you have left from the AW into the front of the storage building. Roger that, was all he said before he started the steady single shots into the warehouse. If I'd been right and the gaff was indeed our Mufti's dump, we were in for a major firework display. On shot four, there was a whoomph from deep inside the building as the incendiary rounds did their job. I pressed again. Let's get the fuck out of here, lads. I got two Rogers from Butch and Des. Frankie Green's comms remained silent. Des Colgan's story. We waited a further twelve hours at the RV, just in case Frankie had somehow survived. Of course he hadn't. Our mood was black as night and hardly a word was spoken on the drive back. Our sailing back to Malta was no better and Rick prowled the deck like a wounded rhino. Even Butch stayed out of his way. We docked at Hay Wharf and were driven to a small hotel in Valletta by one of our crew. Once there we were met by another man from the ministry. He took a short brief from Rick and fought off quick sharp. We all knew there'd be a full debrief when we got back to Hereford and were in no mood to be preached to by a suit. 
The three of us went out that night and got royally pissed. Having a drink for Frankie was the easy part. It was Rick who would have to go and see Karen and the kids with the news. Debriefs are a necessary part of any operation. Anyone who says they can't learn from mistakes made shouldn't be in the regiment. We were all grown men and had to face up to our failings as well as our victories. Our O.C. was a good bloke and he put a positive spin on the whole operation. After all, even though Al Mufti survived, he had destroyed his arms cache and decimated his militia, killing between twenty and thirty of his men. In effect, we had put his business out of action, at least for the time being. The suit, the same suit that briefed us before we left for Tiji, was not so complimentary. He couldn't understand why we didn't just blow the house. When we mentioned the two children we knew were inside, the fucker just shrugged his poor shoulders and shook his head. He said the result was disappointing. We had to hold Rick down to stop him from snorting him. There was the usual whip round for Frankie's family, and all the troop had a beer for him. His body was never recovered. Twenty years later, the Thirsty Scholar, Manchester. Lauren North's story. It had been a near-perfect lift. Had Rick, Des and I not consumed so much Irish whisky, we may have been capable of inflicting enough damage to our captors to cause a scene outside the scholar. However, the end product would have been the same. The force was overwhelming. We would still have been taken. We'd just been nursing injuries. The instant I'd sat in the rear seat of the Range Rover, there had been the merest hint of a prick to my skin on the left side of my neck, and suddenly... All in the world was rosy. Less than an hour later, I found myself in a small military-style billet. Single bed, thin mattress, metal chair, slim green locker. A woman stood in the room with me. She watched me intently as I took in my surroundings. She had escorted me from a helicopter to what was, to all intents and purposes, a prison cell. The attractive blonde wore baggy USA combat camouflage fatigues that hid her figure. A nameplate on her breast pocket announced her as Willis. Underneath this was another emblem. Three stripes. So, Sergeant Willis, then. She studied me some more, then seemed to make up her mind about something. I think, ma'am, you may be intoxicated, she said. I eyed the woman with no modicum of irritation. Of course I'm fucking intoxicated, Brittany, or whatever your name is, I've consumed near on a full bottle of Jameson's and one of your, let me search for the right word now, buddies has injected me with something that almost makes me like you. I understand, ma'am. No, you don't fucking understand. Come to think of it, why all this ma'am shit anyway? Me and you are the same age. You are thirty-eight, ma'am, and I, on the other hand, am twenty-seven. I eyed the girl and considered exactly how much more she knew about me. Okay, she did look younger. She was mid-height, and despite the fatigue, you could see she was lean and fit. She had that all-American girl thing going on. Probably before her decision to fight for her country, she'd been a cheerleader, head girl, top of the debating team, that kind of stuff. She had sharp baby blue eyes to match the blonde locks. She also had the good sense to keep me at arm's length, as I was truly pissed off and not as drunk as she presumed. Despite the sedative, I knew we hadn't travelled far. We'd been lifted from outside the Thirsty Scholar, just off Oxford Road, Manchester. Not the nicest establishment in the city, but one our team was particularly fond of. We'd ended up there as we couldn't bear the depression of the official wake. One of our group, ex-Turkish Special Forces and all-round good bloke J.J. Yakim, had been killed on our last job. We'd been celebrating his life. Well, actually, we were approaching the point of shitfest and about to eat Indian. Then the Yanks turned up. They were all American, too, with sharp suits, buzz cuts and the same sir and ma'am script that Brittany seemed intent on. In my very happy state, I'd noticed we'd been driven to the city airport, the grand name for a small airfield close to the M60 and the massive retail park, the Trafford Centre. 
From there, the helicopter flight had only been 15 minutes or so. I have to say, being extracted by what appeared suspiciously like the CIA was a fairly pleasant experience when it came to the transport. In addition to the Range Rover Vogues, they must have rented the poshest chopper in the world to take us to... Well, that was the question, wasn't it? Where are we? I asked. Menworth Hill Harrogate, ma'am. Willis pronounced Harrogate with a very large O in the middle, suggesting her southern bell roots. I'd lived not seven miles from Harrogate as a student nurse. Menworth Hill was notorious with the locals. It was built in the 1950s, and although it had always been commanded by an RAF officer, the 500-acre sites littered with massive golf ball-shaped domes called Ray Domes was really run by 451st Air Base Group, them and the US National Security Agency. These guys were essentially snoopers, using the massive power of the Ray Domes to intercept intelligence information and communications on behalf of the West's would-be enemies. You're not the 451st, I said. Willis looked surprised that I would have that level of knowledge about the base. Probably the same look I gave her when she divulged my age. No, ma'am. I cocked my head and waited. It was obvious Willis was not the talkative type. She changed the subject. Do you need anything, ma'am? Some water? You said you guys were about to eat. Are you still hungry? I suppose a taxi back to Manchester is out of the question. It is, ma'am, at least until you're briefed. And when might that be, Brittany? Unamused, Willis turned and opened my green locker. She removed a set of similar fatigues to her own, together with a towel and some toiletries. A shower and some sleep, ma'am, and I'm sure you'll feel more obliging. She dropped the pile on the bed next to me. I'll be back for you at 0700 hours. If you need anything before then, just knock. And with that she was gone. I didn't feel obliging at all. I was very fucking upset. Once alone, I had a better look at my cell. Ground floor, thirty square feet max. One exit door, heavy triple locks. One window, no bars but reinforced glass. I'd need an axe and a day to get out by force. For some reason, our captors had taken my heels. They were nice too. Black patent, a four-inch spike by Zelda. I wanted them back. They were five hundred quid. To replace them, the United States military had kindly left me a pair of plastic flip-flops. Inspecting the pile of clothes Ms. Spears had laid out on my cot, good old Uncle Sam had also added a pair of cotton briefs that looked big enough to parachute with in a size 34B white brassiere. Not since I was fourteen, love. One set of camouflage fatigues, a bottle of shower gel, toothbrush, paste and a plastic comb. I scooped it all up, dropped it on the lone chair by my bed and did what I'd been trained to do under these circumstances. I slept. Dawn broke. I woke. I guessed oh four fifty hours as my watch had gone to the same place as my heels. My head was clear again, but I needed some sharpness. The best way is endorphins. Your own. I started with some squats, just one hundred, then tricep dips, fifty on the edge of the cot. Another fifty on the chair to change the angle, then press-ups, crunches and burpees. I finished with sprints on the spot at thirty-second intervals until I was blowing like a steam train. Twenty minutes or so later I paced the small room, hands on head, breathing hard and sweating. Stepping out of my underwear I ran the shower. Ablutions completed, I pulled on the cotton briefs and looked in the mirror. Mrs. Doubtfire. Leaving the bra on the bed, I slipped on the fatigues, pushed my feet into the plastic numbers and ran the comb through my hair. I approached the heavy door and knocked. Just as I figured, it was opened instantly. Brittany had been replaced by a sharp-featured woman of Italian origin. She had the name Forgione and the same three stripes underneath. Ma'am, she said. Groundhog Day. I'm hungry, Sergeant. I said flatly, for Gioni nodded. Right away, ma'am. How you like your eggs? I managed a thin smile. Poached, brown toast, no butter, orange juice, tea, black, no sugar. Another nod and the door closed. 
Well, at least they don't intend slotting us any time soon. If Jamie Oliver himself had been standing outside the door with his pan on the boil, the service couldn't have been quicker. The door opened and in walked the Italian job, tray in hands. I considered making for the door as she had been so slack in her routines, arms full, door ajar. Then I noticed that my exit was blocked by a guy the size of a small holding. For Gioni almost smiled. Maybe her idea of a little joke helped pass the time this early. My order was delivered exactly to my specifications, with the addition of a large bottle of Evian and a new bra, size 36C. I looked at the packaging and wondered where you found an M&S open at that time in the morning. Once Foggioni had left, I looked around the room for cameras. I finally found four and made a note not to exercise in my victorious secret again. The Americans had a shocking reputation for a lack of security when it came to anything computerized, and I had the horrible feeling that my bouncing assets would be available to download by the population of every trailer park in the deep south by lunchtime. That said, the breakfast was excellent. No sooner had I finished my tea, in walked Willis and the man mountain from the door-blocking incident. "'Good morning, ma'am,' she chirped. "'I hope you slept well.' I laid down my cup. "'I think you already know that, Brittany, especially as there are at least four cameras in this room, and now, in addition to my age, you know my brazier size, too.' I turned to the Hulk. All six six of him. Muscle Beach would have paid the guy just to stand around. "'And did you enjoy my morning workout, Mr. Universe?' There was a flash of perfect white USA teeth and two raised, plucked eyebrows. Impressive, ma'am, he said, his voice as deep as a cavern. I gave him a sarcastic smile and wasn't sure if he got the message. Irony's lost on you people, isn't it? I added. A little of Sergeant Willis's perfect customer service skills slipped as she bit onto my remark. I figured it may have the desired effect... The you people part hitting the spot. The Americans being a nation of individuals who care more about where they once came from rather than where they actually were. My people, she announced, hailed from Cornwall, England, ma'am. She just about held her smile and added, so I think I might have a grasp. I stood as we were obviously going somewhere. Why is it, I began, that you felt the need to tell me that Cornwall is in England? Weirdly, us Brits know that kind of thing. Man Mountain turned to Willis. Isn't that ironic? I gave up. I was marched along three long corridors. Their cement-rendered walls were painted drab army green, and my flip-flops slapped against recently mopped cream-coloured linoleum-tiled floors. The further we marched, the more the decor improved, and with it the security... Card swipe doors turned into card swipe doors with an armed guard attached. Finally, we arrived at a set of double oak numbers, nicely varnished, brass fittings polished within an inch of their life. No key card here, just a pair of large, shiny handles, guarded by two large, shiny marine types. One guard checked Willis's ID and nodded to the second. He opened up, and I was shown inside. Rick and Des were already seated in beautiful leather wing-backed armchairs. Both were dressed identically. White crew neck t-shirts, camo combats, plastic flip-flops. One large Chesterfield chair remained, obviously reserved for yours truly. Des looked quite chirpy. Rick looked like he was about to kill everyone. I sat. Des leaned over. You are right, hen? I nodded. Did you try the breakfast? I had blueberry pancakes. Poached eggs, I said, then leaned towards Rick. What about you? He glared at me. Do you think we can wait to see what the fuck this is all about before we start exchanging cookery tips? Des winked at me. He didn't sleep well, I reckon. He's not keen on his trousers, either. There was more glaring until the doors opened again and in walked two men. Willis and our two shiny marine types visibly stiffened, but remained at their at-ease position. Not military, then. The first guy in was medium height, mid-forties, good teeth, good shape. Definitely not short of a dollar or two. He had a weathered face, 
probably due to spending his downtime sailing his own yacht or such like. He was dressed casually, which I considered was for our benefit. Levi's, white open neck shirt, sleeves rolled two turns. His whole demeanour announced, I'm a busy man, but pretty chilled about it. The second looked a whole new ball game. Late twenties, six-two, broad-shouldered, sandy, blonde, buzz-cut, black suit, white shirt, black tie. He carried in a shoulder holster something chrome, not standard issue. He looked a serious player. Delta Force. He turned to our guards. And there will be all. Thank you, Sergeant Willis. He had a surprisingly quiet and calm southern drawl that didn't match his appearance, and for some ungodly reason reminded me of Tom Hanks in Green Mile. Mr. Rich, but casual, perched himself on the end of an imposing, ornate desk that sat in front of our three chairs. Indeed, the whole room was impressive. Gone were all traces of the drab olive paint and linoleum flooring. These were replaced by delicate pastel shades and thick-piled carpet. All the furnishings looked like they were straight out of chaplains of Chelsea, and I considered that the room would usually be reserved for the highest-ranking visitors to the base. Had I not been wearing Bridget Jones's pants and plastic flip-flops, I may have been more comfortable. Tom Hanks stayed where he was, between us and the exit, hands clasped in front of him, eyes sharp. Both men waited until we were alone. Mr. Casual opened his palms and smiled. Unlike Forrest Gump, he had a sharp East Coast accent. Boston, maybe. I trusted him as much as a Hong Kong taxi meter. Good morning, folks. My name is Mason Carver. I trust you've been treated well and you haven't been inconvenienced too much. Rick folded his arms but stayed quiet. I figured he wouldn't be silent for long. Once Mr. Casual realised he wasn't getting a cosy reply, he dropped the hotel manager act and we finally got on with it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, as we're all good. I work on behalf of the U.S. government here in the U.K. My role is to head up organized crime investigations that are of national importance to both our countries. He means his CIA, muttered Rick. Carver pressed on. My colleague here is Mitch Collins. Mitch has only been in the U.K. a short while and has been drafted into Menwith Hill, especially for this investigation from the Drugs and Alcohol Unit of the FBI. He will be working alongside you during this inquiry. Des was in. We're a second there, Mason. We're not working alongside anyone. In fact, we're not working for you all, see? Now, you may think it's acceptable over in fucking La La Land to take away a man's liberty, feed him a pancake or two, and then hope he's all sweetness and light by the morning. But I know. And I can see by the look on my pal's faces here, neither are they. So if you're hoping for some kind of hands across the ocean type of agreement here, I'll go as far as to say you're in the shit. Carver smiled again. It was the kind of grimacing effort I once put on during my mate's wedding when the photographer insisted I stood next to my ex-husband for the group shot. I do like your accent, Mr. Cogan. He began patronisingly. And even though it's a little difficult to understand, you are a very funny guy. Des was not amused. You will not think it's funny if I get off this chair, pal. And Big Mitch over there won't stop me either. Mitch twitched slightly, but didn't move. Carver raised his hands, instantly conciliatory. I guessed it was not a tactic he was fond of. The guy needed something from us and needed it badly. I think we all need to calm down a little. Rick couldn't hold it any more. Stop fucking about, Carver. The CIA wouldn't have dared to lift us and bring us here to men with ill without authorization from the firm. Not even you guys are that stupid. The USA used this place and our airspace with the permission of the Crown. You are our guests. This base is commanded by a senior RAF officer. He'll know we're here, or at the very least he'll have been told to turn a blind eye. So, what's Cartwright got to do with all of this? Because I smell his very expensive aftershave all over this little job. I shot Rick a look. Every time I'd ever heard that man's name, it meant trouble. Carver looked to Mitch Collins. The big guy stepped forward, slipped off his jacket, removed his holster and weapon, and dropped everything on a nearby chair. He too rolled his sleeves two turns. 
I was right. They wanted something. A we, he began, have an issue. No, spat Rick. You have an issue. We have homes to go to and a business to run. Mitch seemed to have a long fuse. Mr. Fuller, sir, as you have already correctly intimated, you were here with the blessing of Her Majesty's government. Now, I understand that you may be upset at last night's operation, but I assure you it was a necessary evil. We had to move extremely quickly. We needed you on board and briefed by the end of today. Time, as they say, is of the essence. I caught the big fella's eye. What do you mean, with the blessing of Her Majesty's government, Mitch? Carver slipped in. For the first time, his tone had a trace of discomfort in there. You've been, um, loaned to her for a while. Des shook his head. The Scots ever shortening fuse there for all to see. I'm no a fucking lawnmower. You can't lend me on a Saturday morning and give me back old Bonnie on a Sunday. Last I looked, I was flesh and blood. I know what you deep south boys are like next. You'll want us picking cotton and singing old man river. Mitch stifled a smile at that. He held up his hands. Oh, look, guys, I know this is weird, and I assure you we left the shackles back home. It ain't exactly what we're accustomed to, either. We would love to use our own boys on this job, but it ain't possible, pure and simple. And more to the point, you guys, pointed Carver, have all the necessary qualifications and experience to complete this task quietly and quickly, and that is what DC requires. DC, said Rick. Mitch pulled up a chair. People in high places, guys, the usual suspects. They pull the strings, we dance the dance. I eyed the big fella. He was handsome in a boyish way, with sharp grey eyes. What if we say no, Mitch? He shrugged. Then we walk away, today, now, before we tell you any more. After all, we are supposed to be on the same side, aren't we? We needed you here fast, but you ain't our prisoners, or slaves for that matter, Mr. Colgan. Carver was in again. He was here to sell the job, no doubt. That said, you will be turning down a very rewarding opportunity, very lucrative indeed. That's what they all say, said Rick. For lucrative, see dead in the dictionary. I agree, nodded Carver. Dangerous, yes, but worth one million dollars cash. We all sat up at that one. Never one to look a gift horse in the mouth, Des leaned forward. And just how long do you figure this wee job is going to take then, pal? We would hope, replied Carver, that everything is brought to a successful conclusion within a week. But this is a murder inquiry, so the ball is essentially in your court. A murder, said Rick. So call the cops. They are investigating, sir, answered Mitch. But the British police have constraints, rules, regulations, things that slow down the process. Who is the victim? asked Rick. The FBI man remained tight-lipped. An American student studying in Manchester. Rick smiled at that one. Okay. Mitch, what about the perpetrator? Carver interjected again. We believe perpetrators, at least two at the scene. GMP have intimated that the murder scene was very unusual and have not ruled out religious or sexually motivated attack. However, DC strenuously believe that should this be the case, then mistaken identity could be the only possible explanation. The victim has no priors, no connections with any criminal gang, has nothing to hide on a personal level. That is their official stance on the matter, and will remain so. Rick's gaze drifted between the two men. And what about you guys? What is your stance? Mitch and Carver remained silent. Okay, said Rick. I take it this is a dead or alive kind of mission. Carver shrugged. Let's just say the folks in D.C. would prefer the former. Rick interlocked his fingers and placed both hands behind his head, a broad smile on his face. Call me old-fashioned, but I just want to be clear here. You guys, let's just call you the CIA for the hell of it, on the orders of P. 
people in high places in Washington, let's just call them politicians, have permission to offer one million US dollars to us three tired old mercenaries to slot a few religious, sexually motivated fanatics from Manchester, rather than let justice take its usual course? I think you have grasped that particular nettle, Mr Fuller, said Carver. Rick looked across at Des, who gave the merest nod. I followed his lead. I mean, we all knew that Mitch and his pa were lying through their very white teeth. But come on, things always come out in the wash, and a million dollars is a lot of money in anyone's book. Rick nodded back. Looks like you have a deal, Carver. Des Cogan's story Beware the man bearing gifts, I say, even fucking blueberry pancakes. Look, it was obvious that the Yanks were telling half a tale, but when did the farm last come up with the good stuff? And to be fair, the reason for Mitch and Mason's very tight lips would soon become apparent. Mitch seemed a decent enough bloke, but Carver, well, let's just say I admit a few of his kind in my time desk-bound weekend warriors who did the politician's bidding and to hell with the consequences. We were marched from the plush surroundings of Carver's office back to our accommodation. Once there, we were handed our clothes and shoes back, nicely laundered and pressed. Then we were given the opportunity to scrub up again and offered some brunch, all very fucking civilised. I passed on the food and opted for a large pot of tea. Within the hour we ended up sitting around a low table in what was obviously a classroom, minus Carver who had some pressing business to attend to. Despite being built like a brick wall, Mitch Collins had a nice easy way with him, and I took to the guy immediately. He dropped a pile of papers onto the table and stacked them neatly to his left. They all spotted big red stamps across them announcing they were top secret. The Yank checked his watch. OK, guys... It's now just over 24 hours since the body of Todd Blackman was discovered in the ground floor apartment of a dwelling in Ann Coates, Greater Manchester. Todd was 20 years old, born 11th July 1977 in Louisville, Kentucky. He was a keen musician and studied composition in college before persuading his parents to allow him to come to England to continue his education. He'd set his heart on completing the music production degree course at Salford University. He was in his first year. As for the details of the crime itself, we're having difficulty obtaining much information from GMP's SOKU, Serious and Organized Crime Unit. We have found the city's head of that department to be a very obstinate man, but I'll come to that momentarily. The chief inspector seems reluctant to share too much about Todd's injuries or the scene. Therefore, we are somewhat in the dark. However, we regard this as a double-edged sword, as there remains little press coverage about the killing. One of D.C.'s prime objectives. The folks in the White House are very keen for this to remain so due to the possible political fallout back home should the press start to sensationalize the killing. I was getting tired of the smoke and mirrors already. Well, what do you know, pal? And why would the press sensationalize anything? Matt shuffled uncomfortably in his seat. You know what the news guys are like, Mr. Cogan. They love blood and gore. And as one of the few facts we have been able to obtain is that Todd was tortured before he died, and he bled to death, we would like to keep those facts under wraps for as long as possible. In fact, until you guys deal with the perps. Did the kid use drugs? asked Rick. Mitch put his diplomatic hat back on. Ah, I'm not saying that Todd was an angel. Louisville, at least the area in which Todd lived, is a very conservative part of the United States, and once away from that influence in a cosmopolitan city such as Manchester, Todd probably wanted to let his hair down a little. We believe he smoked the odd joint. Mitch looked around the table at our unsurprised faces. 
Lauren seemed deep in thought for a moment, her eyes focused at a faraway point. She turned to the American and locked on his gaze. Not often folks get tortured for smoking a joint in Ancoat, Mitch. She sat back in her seat. So where did Todd live? Was he killed at home? Mitch shook his head. No, ma'am. Todd rented a private apartment on the keys. Lauren raised her brows. Wow, not like my university days, Mitch. Four girls in a grotty two-bedroom flat. Mitch allowed the mirror's smile. No, ma'am, but I wouldn't know as I did in the town college. The big fella moved on. Todd's parents are in the air as we speak. His father, John E. Blackman, will be travelling to Salford General Hospital to formally identify his son the moment they land. Rex sat up at that, a quizzical look on his face. What does the E stand for, Mitch? Collins did that wriggle in his seat again. I think you'll find the E is for Eisenhower, Mr. Fuller. Rex snorted, a light exploding in his head. So now we're getting to the nitty-gritty here, are we? The father of our dead boy's none other than Senator Jonathan Eisenhower Blackman, front-running presidential candidate. That is correct, but... But nothing, Mitch, spat Rick. That pile of papers to your left, what are they? Collins placed a palm on top of the pile and took a deep breath. They are classified documents, Mr. Fuller. Documents regarding Todd Blackman's movements during the first month of his stay here in the UK. I nearly spat out my tea. Then they tell me you lot were supposed to be babysitting the boy. Mitch nodded slowly. At first, yes, that would be correct, Mr. Cogan. Lauren cocked her head. So are you in the deep brown stuff then, Mitch? Mitch again considered his words. The team who were initially responsible for the safety of young Todd and their command are currently in the States for a debrief, ma'am. I poured another cup. I fucking bet they are. Rick leaned over to get a closer look at the papers. Mitch kept his hand on top. I am sorry, Mr. Fuller, but presently these documents are classified for U.S. eyes only. Rick flopped back in his seat. Let me get this straight here, Mitch. Your pain is to find the people that murdered Todd Blackman, and there under your hand are reports from field agents who have been following him around Manchester for a month. Don't you think there may be a slim chance that your guys may have already seen and identified one or more of Todd's killers? Mitch's hands didn't move from the pile. As Todd had been here in the UK for six months prior to his murder, and these reports are now five months out of date, I think that is unlikely, sir. But I will have the reports cleaned later today, and then you and your team will have full access. I knew what Mitch meant. Before we went over to Belfast to slot Paddy O'Donnell, our MI5 handler and old spy by the name of Catsight, supplied us with various field reports from the agents who had been watching the Irish minister's movements. In every statement, some text had been edited. Thick black markers had been used to erase code names and other details the firm thought too sensitive for our eyes. Some of the intelligence had so much text removed it was unreadable and useless. I wondered just how many other reports sitting under Mitch's hand would end up the same way before we got our grabbing mitts on them. I pointed to the pile of papers. So how come you had him under protective surveillance and then dropped it after a month? Mitch pulled a face that told the whole room he wasn't a happy camper. Obviously Carver had not wanted to be the source of all the good news and had left all the awkward questions to be fielded by the big man. I believe the team were stood down under orders from D.C., sir. Lauren gave the American a puzzled look. What? You remove surveillance altogether? Mitch snapped the bridge of his nose between thumb and finger. You must understand, ma'am, if your subject doesn't want to be protected, doesn't want his movements reported, then it makes the job of such a small team almost impossible. I believe the agent running the brief reported as much to Todd's father. 
I also understand that it was Mr. Blackman himself who stood the team down. I let out a low whistle. That's a fucking serious guilt trip. Mitch nodded. I do believe you're right, Mr. Cogan. Lauren drained her cup. The plot thickens, eh? Despite your diplomatic language, Mitch, I'm beginning to form a picture here. The deceased is a kid from some shit-kicking Bible belt out. He has an overprotective father who is not only running for president, but is one of the richest men in the world. Daddy is powerful enough to pull the CIA strings, and you guys get the job of keeping an eye on little Todd. You were tasked with ensuring the kid doesn't get into the kind of mischief that may embarrass his father and hurt his presidential ambitions whilst here in old blighty. Am I warm? Much nodded. OK, but Todd has different ideas and gives your boys the runaround, making their job impossible. Your words, not mine. The lead agent reports this fact to Daddy. Now I reckon that Mr Blackman Senior would be very pissed off at the news that little Todd was misbehaving. Correct? Correct, ma'am. I thought so. And would I be wrong to suggest that Daddy wanted his son back in Kentucky, away from the bright lights and temptations of Manchester, where he could keep an eye on him? I believe that he had that conversation with his son, ma'am, yes. And Todd told Daddy to go fuck himself? Match almost smiled at Lauren's use of language. Maybe not in so many, but he did, yes? Yeah. How long ago was this? Almost five months ago, ma'am. And Daddy then pulled the plug on the surveillance? He did, ma'am. So you and your buddies haven't seen Todd in those five months? No, ma'am. No surveillance at all? Matt shook his head. Lauren jutted her chin towards the pile of field reports. And you say there is nothing in those that might shed any light on what happened in the following days or weeks, or what may have got our little rich kid tortured and killed? Matt rubbed his face with his palms. To sum up, ma'am, during our operation, on most days Todd went to school and came home as expected. It was his nighttime activities that proved difficult to assess. You see, soon after our assignment started, it became apparent that he had discovered that he was the subject of protective surveillance. Being the son of J. E. Blackman meant that Todd had been used to bodyguards all his life. He hated the lack of privacy this gave, and it was one of his reasons he'd been so determined to come to England to study. He considered he would be both anonymous and safe here in the UK. Finding out his father had surreptitiously informed both the FBI and CIA of his plans did not go well between them. Mitch raised his eyebrows. The boy began to use any surveillance techniques as a matter of course. He'd been forced to learn these as a child. Growing up as the only son of the ninth richest man in the world it came with the territory. We did our best with the resources we had, but when Todd went out into the city at night, more often than not, we would lose him. Lauren met the American's gaze, and definitely no evidence of hard drugs. Matt shook his head. If there was any drug use going on, ma'am, we had no way of assessing the extent of it. However, to our knowledge, Todd had always been a clean living boy. And all this was reported to Daddy? asked Lauren. Of course. And Daddy wasn't happy. An understatement. J.E. ordered Todd home, and as you so delicately put it, Ms. North, Todd, of course, refused. Would you say that Senator Blackman was a vindictive man, Mitch? I don't think the Senator would do anything to endanger his own son, ma'am, if that's what you mean. But he ordered the plug pulled and just accepted that his son was a spoilt brat who wouldn't do as he was told. Are you a parent, ma'am? Lauren darkened. I think that as Sergeant Willis was party to my brass eyes, you already know the answer to that one. My apologies, ma'am. I was merely trying to point out that even if you were rich and powerful, you can't always control your kids. Lauren recovered her mood. So what got young Todd killed, Mitch? And why do you believe the cops have been so tight-lipped? 
Well, ma'am, we were kind of hoping that you would be able to help us out there. Me? Yes, ma'am. I believe you know the senior officer in charge of the investigation personally. Matchley threw a report in front of him. One Detective Chief Inspector Larry Simpson. You should have seen the look on Rex Coupon when he heard that little gem. Rick Fuller's story. Lauren gave me the longest look. I knew what she wanted to say, so there was no need to say it. No need to worry, no need for jealousy, all part of the job. I wasn't so sure. Detective Chief Inspector Larry Simpson was the head of Manchester's serious and organised crime unit, Soku. He first appeared in Lauren's life when he'd posed as her boyfriend, attempting to infiltrate our operation. Even though the bogus relationship had been in its early stages, once Lauren had discovered Larry's true motives, she had felt horribly betrayed. From that day, Lauren had always considered that the detective owed her for his deception. As a result, some months later, she secretly met him to obtain information we desperately sought in our investigation into the murder of Spiros Macris. Just before we left for Albania, Larry had visited Lauren again at her home. This time, and telling her that his feelings were genuine, he begged her to leave the team and start a new life with him. She caught my eye and smiled a nervous smile. She was incredibly beautiful, and I knew she cared for me. I nodded. Enough. We needed to get moving. I stood up and looked out of the window, collecting my thoughts. I did my best to lighten the mood. Okay, Lauren, you need to go and change before meeting our pal Larry. We can't have you looking like Cruella de Vil in your funeral outfit. Charming, she said. Don't be chachy. Anyway, before that you need access to a computer and printer. Consider that done, sir, said Mitch, grabbing the offending reports from the table. Seemingly relieved he was no longer the subject of our cross-examination. I turned to him. He was indeed a big lad, with a rower or swimmer's physique. He wouldn't want to meet the American in a dark alley, yet he had an almost gentle way about him that made him instantly likeable. Listen, Mitch, I said, first off, we don't do Sir, Marm or Mr. here, OK? We call ourselves by our names or worse, and as we have inherited you for the foreseeable, you need to get used to that, and Lauren's use of the Anglo-Saxon vernacular. Mitch gave a broad smile. Okay, sir. I mean, Rick. Yeah, good. I pointed at him. Just make sure that computer is secure, okay? He nodded, but I didn't believe him. As soon as you've done that, son, lose the sidearm and pull on some casuals. We're going on a visit, so we'll need a car. Mitch looked out of the window towards the car park. I can obtain a pool car, Mr. Fuller. What make are they? I asked, removing my tie. Chevy, mainly, or Hyundai? I shook my head. I don't drive either of those cars, Mitch. Get one of the Range Rovers you lifted us in. The Vogue will do, unless you have a sport knocking about. I prefer that model, especially one with black leather and cream pipe. Mitch looked around the room. Dares had a big smile on his face. You'll get your step, Mitch. We'll come aboard... The Yank left shaking his head at the mad English people he'd been landed with. Finally, we were alone. Am I the only one who thinks this job stinks to high heaven? I said. I got two shakes of the head. I turned down the corners of my mouth. Not a happy bunny. I'll get onto Cartwright as soon as I can and find out what being loaned out entails. I looked towards the door. Mitch seems a good boy, but I reckon he's only here to keep an eye on what we get up to and report back to Carver, who will have sent it a Blackman's ear, no doubt. Now, very important, I don't want to have to explain to Carver why he's all American boys lying in a gutter in Moss Side with his head blown off. So if anything comes on top, get him out of the way, OK? Two nods. Good. I rub my hands together. Right, Lauren, get on the net and find out everything you can about Senator J.E. Blackman. Family, friends, business dealings, gossip, likes, dislikes, you know the script. Print everything so we can start a dossier. 
When I get back, I want you to go straight to Lawrence's offices. I'm sure you can handle him. She smiled at me again, this time with slightly more confidence. Easy, she said. Des, grab one of the pool cars. You've got my Korean engineering, do you? The Scot fumbled for his disgusting pipe. I mind you being a smug prick, but if it means I can get out safer with smoke, I suppose it's okay. Now, don't be touchy. I want you to go to Hancock's and find the murder scene. It'll still be under guard, but have a snoop around the area, visit the pubs, chat with the natives who's running around that part of town. You good at that? I am good at getting punched in the kipper for asking stupid questions, too. I slapped Des on the back, just as Mitch reappeared with a laptop and a printer balanced precariously in his arms. Yeah, good, I said. Are we ready? Mitch plugged in the machine and set Lauren up with a password. All ready, he said. Excellent, I managed. And the car? Mitch smiled. Ah, oh, God, is a sport, Mr. Fuller. I mean, Rick. I gestured towards the door, please, with my transport. Good lad. Right, first we need to swing by my place so I can change. Then we're going to see Egghead. Egghead? Yeah, he's a clever guy. Now, do you like cats, Midge? I drove. The car was tight and responsive, just as I remembered my own model to be. However, the Americans had spared no expense, and our model was similar to one I'd owned. Well, before Goldsmith and Company came along. It was the supercharged version, delivering 390 bhp as standard. It came with Stormer 20-inch alloys and Brembo disc brakes to stop the big beast. Sounds were provided by a Sirius satellite radio nestled into limed oak wood trim, and we sat comfortably encased in black leather sport seats. I made a note that at least part of my $333,333 fee for the job was going to be spent at my local Jaguar Land Rover dealer. Mitch sat in silence in the passenger seat. Either he wasn't the talkative type or he was following a brief of least said the better. Either way, it suited me. The Manchester traffic was its usual ponderous self and it took a full hour to drive to my place in Bowden. The American didn't attempt to move as I pulled up outside my apartment building. He just gave it a quick glance. Nice, he said. Ten minutes later, I ditched my black Paul Smith number and found Olive Ralph Loren cargoes and a cream polo. I gave Simon, our friendly tech, head a call to ensure he was still awake and got back on the road. So, what's your story, Mitch? How long have you been here in England? For just over eighteen hours. I was in Germany when the shit hit the fan. I got the first flight out. Does that happen a lot in the drugs and alcohol agency? Mitch turned slightly. I go where I'm told, sir. I don't ask too many questions. I took that as a mind your own business. Not even hit the gas as we made the M60 slip. Changing the subject, I asked. What's your background, Mitch? Me, I was just a small town boy, you know. You've seen them places on the TV. I'll pick up trucks, baseball caps, and bottles of bird. I needed to escape the place, so I joined the Marine Corps. After two tours of Iraq and two more in Afghanistan, I changed my camos and the boots for black suits and shiny shoes. The FBI, they picked you. After a spell, in a way, yes, sir. That sir thing sits well with you, doesn't it, Mitch? He smiled. Yeah, I suppose it does. You must have impressed in your Marine Corps days to get picked up like that. I did okay. I was sure he did. And now you get all the good jobs, Mitch. You get to work with our ragtag team. Not so ragtag, Mr. Fuller. I mean, you were decorated five times, first one, H-17. And Mr. Cogan, well, he sits alongside you with four gallantry awards. It was north, however, I admit, is a paradox. A paradox? Yes, sir. I've been party to your recent MI5 files. I mean, Lauren is one tough lady, that's for sure. The job in Belfast, her subsequent capture, I mean, wow. And she fights alongside you guys as if she was born to it. Yet she's so beautiful, you know what I mean? I knew what he meant. 
So, the firm gave you access to our files? That is correct. Cartwright, a man I'm sure you are familiar with, agreed it before you were selected for this role. This selection process, how did it come about? I mean, this is the firm granting the favour to end all favours. As I understood it, relations between our country's security services were strained, to say the least. Mitch shrugged. That kind of decision-making is way above my pay grade, Mr. Fuller. I'm just here to help us all. I managed a small laugh at that one. Here was a guy caught in the middle of a political shitstorm. Jumped the wrong way once and his career was in tatters. I also had the sneaking suspicion this newfound special relationship had something to do with our last job in Albania. After all, Carver was the head of the CIA's organised crime unit. Goldsmith would have been high on his list of targets, and he would dearly have loved to have been able to interview him had Cartwright not pulled his smoke and mirrors trick in Strangeways Jail. I made another note to speak with our old spy chum in Whitehall. I glanced over at the American. You know something, Mitch? This guy, Larry Simpson, the cop that Lauren knows, there's no love lost there. If he has his way, he'll take us all down, even her. We could all end up facing prison for the rest of our days. And I'll tell you this, I've already used my get-out-of-jail-free card with the firm. So I reckon if this job goes to hell in a handcart... The boys at Quantico, the Pentagon, Whitehall, or any other fucking place you care to mention will walk away and swear on the Bible they never met us. And that will apply to you, too. Mitch nodded. Makes you wonder why we do it, huh? I gave him a wry smile. Well, for me, it's a million dollars. Anyway, we're here. Egghead, or Simon to his friend, lived with his mother Ethel in a rambling old farmhouse just off the M60, M66 junction in a town called Ramsbottom. The front yard leading to the entrance was full of junk, seemingly just thrown down and left. No one in the family ever intent on moving it. Weeds grew through the cracks in the path to the front door. Reminds me of my old trailer park, muttered Mitch, kicking a discarded paint in. I did a quick recce. Just watch my back, Mitch. If any of Ethel's cats come near, you shoo them away, OK? Mitch nodded. Now I understand the cat question. I take it you're allergic? No, Mitch, I wear good clothes. Just do as I ask, OK? I knocked and waited the usual year and a half for Mum to open the door. Then we ran the traditional gauntlet of pussy cat deposits as we climbed the stairs towards Simon's room. Finally, he appeared at the top landing... His face seemed even rosier than usual, as if he'd been doing something rather more physical than tapping a few keys. Hey, Mr. Fuller, good to see you again. Simon had an adjustable wrench in one hand. He caught me looking at it. Ah, this. He held it up. Just sorted out me mum's bog. Seems to have sprung a leak. I turned to Mitch. He means the John. Watch those fucking cats. Mitch nodded his understanding. You brought a mate with you then, Mr. Fuller, said Simon, stating the obvious. Mitch Collins, I said. He's American. Really? Simon stepped down a stair and took Mitch's hand. Come up, Mitch. Come into me parlour. Where in the states you hail from, then? Alabama, Simon. Wow, yeah, like the song, Mitch. Sweet home, eh? Funny, I flew over there yesterday. Mitch looked confused. You flew in from the states last night? Simon found a spot for his wrench and rubbed his hands together. We're not actually flew, Mr. Collins. More like it's the lift. See, I hacked into one of your fancy satellites for an hour and had a mooch at what it was looking at. Mitch gave me a look. He hacked into a United States satellite? Simon beamed. Yeah, chop it was. Right good crack. I leaned into Mitch. He means it was fun. Simon was oblivious to Mitch's consternation. Anyway, what can I do for you fine gentlemen? We sauntered into Simon's workroom, which, in contrast to the rest of the house, was not only clean and tidy, but mercifully cat-free. I closed the door behind us. I need to get information from a computer, I said. Simon shrugged. OK, easy enough, Mr Fuller. Not when we don't possess this computer, Simon. Not when it belongs to a senior policeman. 
Simon shivered theatrically. Oh, please don't mention the plot in my presence, Mr. Fuller. The old crone has just made me lunch. Nice bit of pork pie. Put me right off, it does. I was losing my patience. Simon! Mitch quizzed me. Plod. Cops, I offered. They get held up both palms. Okay, fair enough. So where is this computer and can you get any access to it at all? It's in Levenjune Police Station, the property of one Detective Chief Inspector Larry Simpson. Uh, yes, maybe, but only for a short time. Simon shivered again. You do know this bloke is the head of the serious and organised crime unit, Mr Fuller. I cocked my head. Really? Now that is a fucking surprise. I raised my voice slightly. So can you or fucking can't you? Simon nodded and smiled, his idea of a little joviality over. Of course I can, Mr Fuller. He rooted in a drawer for a moment and removed a memory stick, inserted it into a laptop, opened a file, copied it to the device, removed it and handed it to me. I raised my eyebrows quizzically. And? Whoever is going to visit this Mush Simpson needs to get him to connect that stick to his computer. May I suggest, Mr Fuller, that you or one of your colleagues load something onto the device that the old Bill would find interesting, so as to make it look all kosher-like? OK, and? And as soon as Plod opens the stick, the code I have just programmed into it releases a clever little worm into his computer and sends me a message here. Simon tapped the top of a monitor on his desk. I can then remotely download anything he has access to, and him being the big cheese, Mr Fuller, I would suggest that is everything important. And how long would that take you? Depends on the size of the files, Mr Fuller, but if it's just text and still pictures, 60 seconds, maybe 90 at a push. If it's video, a minute or two longer. Jeez, that's fast, said Mitch. Simon beamed, his red cheeks shining in the fluorescent lights of the room. Thank you, Mr Collins. We do try to please. I went to my back pocket. OK, Simon, how much for the stick? A monkey, Mr Fuller. I nodded and started to count out cash. Simon shifted from foot to foot, as was his want. But that doesn't include the download, and I'll need to know exactly what you're looking for, Mr Fuller. It would take too long to copy everything he has on there. I gave Simon a look. Go on. He did his best not to beat about the bush, but Simon couldn't help it. Well, Mr Fuller, that kind of depends on how sensitive the nature of this information is. He's extremely sensitive, Blurted Mitch, it's regarding the murder of an American student by the name of Todd Blackman, the only son of presidential candidate Senator J.E. Blackman. Simon raised both brows and a solitary finger. Ah, now that sounds serious and expensive. In that case, I'd want five large, Mr. Fuller. I gave Mitch a hard stare. Perhaps you should never play poker, eh? The American gave a meek smile. I turned to Simon. OK, you'll get your five, but only when I've got the documents in my hand. Fair enough, Mr Fuller. Oh, and whoever is visiting this mush at the cop shop needs to bring the stick away with them. It will take a while, but eventually, if you leave it there, the security breach will be traced back to that storage device and therefore the face that delivered it. I nodded to Mitch. Let's go. We tripped down the stairs to the front door and outside into the fresh air. Carp Sharp? asked Mitch. Police station. He nodded. Mush? Guy. Okay. Monkey? Five hundred pounds. He scratched his head. Jeez, Rick. Does anyone speak English in this country? I smiled at him. Wait till you start having a deep and meaningful chat with our dead. Now that is a different language. Lauren North story. Of course, I wasn't convinced that the computer I'd been given was in the slightest secure. Indeed, I wasn't convinced by Mason Carver or Mitch Collins, for that matter. Call me old-fashioned, but most women can smell bullshit a mile away. It's just that sometimes we choose to ignore it. Secure laptop or not, everything I needed was the stuff of public record. If any hacking was required, I would leave that to Simon. Which brought me to my main issue, to what was weighing on my mind. 
To what concerned me far more than the Americans' obvious economy with the truth was the fact that I was going to have to visit Detective Chief Inspector Larry Simpson again. Rickard found out about our last meeting by pure chance. He seemed to accept that it had been innocent enough. It was, wasn't it? I mean, one kiss under those circumstances. I did my best to push the whole thing to the back of my mind and concentrate on Senator Jonathan Eisenhower Blackman. I started with Google Images. That way I could get shots of him, his wife and hopefully Todd all in the same sweep. There were hundreds. Gala dinners, meetings with current and former presidents, rallies, conferences, hustings and baby kissings. All seemingly with his younger, loyal and very beautiful wife in tow. Todd, however, seemed not to be around too often, and when he was, did a fair impression of a bored, surly teen. J. E. Blackman was fifty-two, young for a presidential hopeful. He looked a tall man of slim build. Just one scroll of the photograph showed a youthful J. E. in various poses, wearing basketball gear during his college years. Then there were dozens of him dressed in army uniform. His meteoric rise within the military shone in all its glory sporting more medals on his chest than it seemed possible to obtain in one lifetime. There was Major General J.E. Blackman in Iraq, in Somalia and in Afghanistan. It seemed our president-in-waiting had done a fair amount of front-line command work. Certainly not an office-bound animal. He looked like he still kept fit, as did his raven-haired wife Ursula, who at thirty-eight, yes, I know, my age, looked fabulous, dutifully smiling for the cameras. I selected one picture that depicted the whole family together and played around with it, zooming in here and there. It was labelled Kentucky Derby 2006, so recent enough to get a fair impression of Todd, Mum and Dad. The family was surrounded by serious-looking bodyguards, all dark suits and sunglasses, FBI-standard uniform. J.E. and Ursula were looking front and centre, smiling. J.E. with one arm raised to the crowd in acknowledgement of something or other. Todd, however, was in conversation with his closest minder, and from his body language he would suggest it wasn't about the horse racing. I cropped everyone from the shot except Todd and the bodyguard, enlarged it as best I could and printed it. Todd Blackman was a good-looking boy, tall, lithe, hair as jet black as his mother's, cut conservatively and swept to one side. He had dark eyes, good clear skin, and even though he wasn't smiling, you just knew he had the perfect teeth to match. The bodyguard was holding up a hand in his direction. It was a, I'm sorry but you can't, type of gesture. Todd's brow was furrowed and he pointed towards some unseen destination out of shot. If we needed any confirmation of what Mitch had told us earlier, that one picture communicated the whole story. Todd was a prisoner of his father's political ambition. Another fifteen minutes saw me with a dozen or so good clear shots of the boy and his parents printed out ready for Rick's dossier. I was about to move on to Wiki his dad when I came across a scanned image from a local Louisville newspaper. It was dated February 2006. The picture showed someone covered in a blanket being led from a building into a waiting car. Whoever was under the cover was flanked by dozens of uniformed police and plain clothes officers. I zoomed into the bottom of the shot. The text read, Todd Blackman bailed by Louisville Police Department. Well, well, Todd, I said to myself. Have you been a naughty boy? I'd just minimised the page and began to search for the newspaper's website when in walked Sergeant Willis. She was dressed as she had been on our first meeting and carried a sheet of papers. Hello, Brittany, I said cheerily. The sergeant strode over and dropped the papers at the side of my printer lifted a chair from under a nearby table, spun it around and sat legs apart, arms leaning on the back, bright blue eyes examining me. It's Caitlin, ma'am. My name is Caitlin. We locked eyes for a second before I offered my hand. Lauren, I said, but of course you know that. Caitlin shook her head. Actually, no, ma'am. It's one of the things I don't know about you. Really? And... What can I do for you, Caitlin? Willis shrugged. Mr. Carver asked me to look in on you, see if I could be a man of service. I pursed my lips. Did you know Todd Blackman? 
No, ma'am. His father? I know of his father, ma'am. Any idea why Todd was killed or who killed him? No, ma'am. Then I don't see what possible help you can be. Willis put a palm on her forehead. Yikes! Sorry, ma'am, you sure are sharp with me. I only came. I suddenly felt a complete arse. No, Caitlin, you're right, that was sharp. It's me who should be sorry. But it's not every day you get kidnapped by the CIA. He tends to make one a little tetchy. I understand, ma'am. Do you? Well, I'd be pierced. I smiled. Eh, hey, swear enough. Large sums of money do that to a girl. You guys are completely freelance, then? I should have guessed when the files I was given referred to you all by code name. I really did not know your true name. Only Collins and Carver were privy to that information. I nodded, resigned to the truth. It can't be long if you don't exist, Caitlin. Willis blew out her cheeks. I don't think I'd have the guts to do that, ma'am. The army is my life. I mean, belonging to something, being part of the machine, knowing that your back is covered, well, it's kind of a given. I know what you mean. When I was nursing, it was just the same. Press a button and they all came running. For a moment, I felt very alone. I spoke to myself as much as to Willis. I had some very good friends back then. But not now. I shook my head. What would I tell them I did for a living? Caitlin smiled. She was indeed a pretty girl. Hit woman? I smiled back and suddenly realised I hadn't been able to confide in another female for a very long time. Oh, yeah, that would go down well. My old mate Jane would be on the phone to all and sundry in a heartbeat. Caitlin rested her chin on her hands. I know this sounds crazy, ma'am, but, but what about love, you know? I mean, you're a mighty fine-looking woman. But how can you possibly hold down a relationship when, as you say, you don't exist? I bit my lip at that one. Not wanting to answer, I turned the tables. What about you, Caitlin? Here you are, thousands of miles from home. I don't see a ring. She smiled. I have someone back in the States. He's army. Cute, too. I sat back in my seat. The thought of driving to Levensume to see Larry weighing heavy. Well, I have someone, too. Well, I have kind of two someones. Two? Complicated, huh? Willis raised her brows. Well, that wasn't in your file, girl. We both laughed, and it felt good. Caitlin picked up the papers she'd walked in with and handed them to me. These are for you guys, anyways. They are the reports from the surveillance operation Mitch promised you. You can scan them in with that printer if you want copies. Thanks, Caitlin. She turned to leave, but I called after her. Sergeant Willis? Yes, ma'am? Did you know that Todd Blackman got himself arrested before he came to the UK? Back home in Louisville? It was last February. He made the papers. Caitlin nodded. I do recall that incident, ma'am, but I understood that no charges were filed. No charges? No, ma'am. So what was young Mr. Blackman arrested for, Caitlin, before these mysterious charges were suddenly dropped? The sergeant examined her highly polished boots before giving me a very uncomfortable look. It was the same ants-in-the-pants game Mitch had played earlier. I understand the allegation was that Todd was curb-crawling, ma'am. The cops thought he was cruising for sex. The plot just got stickier. Des Cogan's story. A bean pole of a guy called Dwayne Ford found me a car. It was a grey Chevrolet Ford door saloon. Ford, being from Tennessee, called it a sedan, but again he'd call the boot a fucking trunk and a bonnet a hood, eh? He'd asked me where I was from. When I'd finished explaining that Scotland was not a state of the United Kingdom... Why, I didn't wear my kilt every day and that Mel Gibson was actually Australian. We got on, OK. I had no idea why Rick was so snooty about the Chevy. It was basic but quiet and comfortable. I turned the radio to a 24-hour news channel and set off towards the M62. 
my mind full of questions. Ancoats, once actually part of Lancashire, is a quarter of a mile from Salford as the crow flies. Once a thriving industrial area with dark satanic mills towering above the rows of terraces, no one would have ever described the place as pretty or middle class. But from the early noughties, some people, people with pots of cash, had begun to have other notions. Ancoats was changing. As Soku had been so tight-lipped with the Yanks about the exact location of the murder, we had no idea where in the town Todd's body had been found. So I stopped at a newsagent, refilled my tobacco pouch and bought a map. Spreading it out on the passenger seat, I took a marker and carved up the area into quarters. Once I was happy, I began to crawl around each one in the Chevy. I was working on the premise that the house would be cordoned off, a police presence would be outside and the venue would be obvious for all to see. It was a boring, tedious job, no doubt, but lots of jobs, particularly in the military and the police, are dreary. There's always lots of standing around, lots of watching for people who never show, lots of waiting for it to kick off. Of course, this is often followed by short bursts of shockingly terrifying action. The reason we do the shit job in the first place. Ancoats nestled alongside the already trendy up-and-coming northern quarter. It reminded me of some Glasgow suburbs that had undergone bad times, but someone somewhere had decided that those times were behind it. There were lots of older houses still evident, long terraces with doors straight out onto the street, the old one in disrepair, but many either renovated or in the process. Other rows boasted small walled gardens where the new, upwardly mobile residents planted brightly coloured flowers in tubs and boxes. Larger detached properties that once housed the wealthy mill owners were now home to new money and were split into apartments or small offices. What had been tight shopping areas, grocers, tyre shops, computer repairs, phone unlockers, now gave way to coffee shops and boutique trades. The residents would be sipping latte from a jam jar at four quid a pot before they knew what hit them. The sun shone and Ancoats went about its business with all the hustle and bustle of a once poor but now thriving community. I crawled the streets, one by one, checking them off my map, looking for the scene of a gruesome murder. Finally I found it. The street was a row of garden-fronted post-war three-storey terraces. All seemed to be the same mix of bare brick and painted rendered, and all appeared to be in the same state of repair, as in newly renovated. I noted that the porches of each dwelling had been added to the properties during the refurbishment, and that brushed steel electronic door system entries were fitted inside all of them. The whole street was obviously owned by one company, maybe even one guy, and each house was divided by three. Sixty trendy apartments situated in an up-and-coming part of the city. Not bad, eh? However, as with many redevelopments in inner city areas, there was nowhere to put your posh motor and a plethora of expensive parked cars sat nose to tail on both sides of the street, two wheels on the pavement so as to allow just enough room for other posh vehicles to drive up and down and knock your fucking wing mirror off. The cops were guarding number nine... The windows of the ground floor were covered over. The pavement out front was taped off. A police van and a crime scene investigations unit prevented anyone from getting too close to the house. Two uniforms stood guard. I noticed the gaff had a wooden sign in the garden. It announced Lucas Estates and the London telephone number. I wrote it down and cruised by. There was nothing to see, but at least we now had the address of the scene and the phone number of either the owner or his estate agent. More important than the address was what the locals knew about the murder, and now I had the right street, I could start making a nuisance of myself. I did a right and right again and came across a corner boozer, the Prince of Wales. Miraculously, a hundred yards up from the pub was a space just big enough for me to park the Chevy in. Well, Rick did say check out the local pubs, eh? Mix with the locals... I never want to disappoint the wee jobby. I stepped into the entrance of the place. A mosaic floor greeted me with the Prince of Wales feathers picked out in red, green and gold at my feet. 
I pushed open a heavy door with a frosted glass window and was instantly greeted by a wonderful aroma that only a wee backstreet boozer can provide. Afternoon drinking. You can't beat it, pal. The lounge was no more than twice that of an average house. The intricate mosaic of the entrance hall gave way to a simpler pattern that would still have cost a fortune today. Dark mahogany pews lined three sides of the room, and I noticed that they still had service bells fitted on the walls behind. Ornate brass roses, each with a large ivory button in the centre, yellowed with hundreds of nicotine-stained finger pushes, an enamel plate below announcing its purpose. The early afternoon sun shone into the small room through one of the beautiful Victorian windows that ran along the street side of the pub. One had a horse-drawn dray and the name of the brewery etched into the glass. A long-lost art. A trim woman in her forties collected glasses from a table underneath it. Despite the presence of the barmaid at the table, I figured that waitress service had long since been discontinued, along with the disconnected bells. However, on a positive note, the glass collector was a trim wee thing, barely five feet, dark brown hair to his shoulders with a good figure. When she turned, I saw she had a pretty face, no makeup to mention, and dark, expressive eyes. She saw me and smiled. You all right, love? she asked. Not Mancunian, Lancashire somewhere. Let me get these and I'll be right with you. Ah, oh, you're right here, nae bother. I sat at the highly polished bar, more ornate brass hand pumps, spotlessly clean, well managed, but just dying. Dying along with the old Anne Coates. Sandy wine bars in the new found cafe culture were on the up. The northern quarter was walking distance and the bright lights of the city just a short tram or bus ride away. All this meant a place like the Prince was on its last legs. Shame. I liked it. And the staff were none too shabby either. I watched the wee girl fill the glass washer. A putter of a similar age to myself, maybe a tad younger, forty-two maybe. She switched it on, wiped her hands on a towel and gave me another smile. She was indeed a handsome woman. Now, what can I get you? I'll have a Guinness, love. Guinness it is, she repeated, finding the right glass and starting the lengthy process that is the correct pouring of the fine brew. You're not from here, then? Glasgow. Ah, yeah, should have known with the accent. We have a couple of our regulars hail from that way. I nodded. There's a few of us, and we tend to get around, hen. She acknowledged my black suit and black tie I'd yet to change out of. Funeral bring you this way, then, is it? Aye, kindly. She made a funny clicking noise with her mouth and pulled a what a shame face. Oh, someone close. I almost told the truth. Oh, damn it, pal. Right, she managed, handing me my pint. My hobby was in the forces. Nine years he did. That'd be two fifty, love. Well, he's double price. Seem about the husband. I sipped my brew, and very nice it was too. Just as well kept as the rest of the gaff. What does your husband do now, then? I asked. Oh, God knows. Turned out to be a right loser, he did. Liked his beer too much. Ain't seen him in years. She gestured towards my own wedding ring. How long have you been wed, then? Every now and again, normally in the presence of a female, I let my mouth run away with itself. I'm widowed, I blurted. There was a look of genuine sadness on the woman's face, quickly replaced by one of pity. The reason I rarely say those words and why I kick myself for doing so again. It was some time ago, I lied, hoping that she would consider time had eased my burden and I would be asked about it no more. She gave me another, what a shame, look. Her eyes were a lovely shade and her hair had a trace of copper. I gave her my best smile and told the truth. I've been a single man for a good while now. She let her head fall and raised her brows, pretty as a picture. Really? I nodded. Well, that's nice to know. Um, Des, I said. Maggie, she offered. And then, oh my, I must get on, I've got the sandwiches to make yet. 
With that, she disappeared into a small kitchen at the back of the bar. I wasn't the only sinner. There were half a dozen other midday imbibers dotted about the lounge. I nodded towards one old boy who must have been eighty if he was a day. He sat bolt upright nursing half a dark mild. He appeared to be spending equal amounts of time between two tasks, the first probing his racing post, running a knurled finger down the lists of runners and riders, and the second examining me. "'Where you say you're from, lad?' he shouted. "'I'm a bit on the deaf side, and I didn't quite catch what you told Maggie.' I moved two stools closer to his table. "'Scotland, Glasgow.' The old boy pulled his face. Ah, you're a jock then, eh? Never took to him myself. I just stopped myself from laughing. Ah, right. I've known a few of us Scots then, have you? Aye, lad. Fought alongside him in the war. I did my maths. The second? Aye. And you didn't make any pals with them lads, I take it. One or two were all right, I suppose. Aye, some of us are. The old boy pushed his empty glass across the table. You tend to like folk a bit better once they get the ale in. Maggie was out of the kitchen in a short. She stood alongside me, hands on hips, looking straight at the old boy. Now, George, what have I told you about catching drinks off the customers? We ain't got enough as it is without you frightening them off. I smiled at her. I don't frighten too easy, Maggie. Get the old boy a pint on me. I only drink halves. "'shouted George before muttering something about foreigners "'and turning the page of his paper. "'I shook my head at the cantankerous old git. "'Half then, please, Maggie.' "'She blew out her cheeks and poured the drink. "'I picked it from the bar and slipped off my stool "'and sat opposite the old-timer. "'There you are.' "'The old boy took a drink, wiped his mouth with the back of his hand "'and then offered it. "'George White.' "'I shook.' Des Corgan. Pleased to make your acquaintance, Corgan. George looked at his palm and then at me. I forget sometimes just how calloused my hands are. You don't get hands like that working in an office, lad. I'm the outdoor type, I offered. He looked at me with watery eyes that still had plenty of life in them. Military, he asked, suddenly able to lower his voice when required. I nodded. Retired. Ah, managed George Weasley. You'd be a career soldier then. I was a conscript, see. 1942. 18 I was. I worked here. George tapped the table with a finger. And calls in the mill. I remember coming home from work and my mother crying into her apron. Met her opened on the mantel. I took a drink of my paint. You see much, George? The old boy drifted for a moment. Too much, son. I saw way too much. But you're here to tell the tale, eh? I offered. I am, lad, yeah. That is true. But let me tell you this. There was eleven of us from the same mill. Eleven lads all similar age, all still teenagers, as a fact. It was only me and Billy Higgins came back. Now... George reached over the table and shakily grabbed my wrist. Tell me this, young man. Was it worth it, eh? For what we have now. These bastards going around threatening old folk in their homes. Is that what they died for? I noticed he'd already drunk up. He fell. Bah! Spat the old boy. He pushed his glass across the table. Go on, then. I'll have another. And George raised his voice towards the kitchen. First bit of interesting conversation I've had in here in years. Maggie brought the drinks over and gave me a wink as she did so. The pub wasn't exactly filling for the lunchtime rush. It was more of a case of two in, two out. The odd sandwich and a pint or two. So, laddie, began George. What got you in the forces? Me? Well, I suppose it was a way of getting out of the gorbals. See, I was the youngest of seven. All boys, George. All my big brothers were scratching about trying to get work down the docks and the like. Then one night my brother Tom, he brought a pal home for supper. 
a boy by the name of James McAfee. He joined the guards. There he was in his uniform. He looked all solid, you know. Good career in front of him. I thought to myself, aye, I could do that when I leave school. And did you? Aye, to para. I did just shy of my twenty-two. And what a James McAfee. Killed at Tumbledown, the Falklands, 1982. George snorted again. Was that worth it? I had no answer to that one. George took some more of his mild. So you've been to the crematorium again by the look of you. Another fallen comrade. I nodded. Why, in a way. But I'm here in Ancourt still up for a flat to rent. Meh. George was on it again. Well, you'll find plenty of them can't move for him. But there's never enough, so it seems. Aye, but now I'm here I can't get to it. The coppers are all over it like a rash. George set down his glass. You mean the place two streets back? Aye. Murder, said George, turning down his mouth. It was murder. Young kid, student. They say it were bad. They? You know, folk, the gossips. And what do they say about it? George leaned over the table, his bottom jaw trembling with age. They say the boy was crucified. Lauren North Story I'd worked for three hours on J.E. Blackman's antecedents. Rick and Mitch got back from Simon's just as I'd finished scanning the reports Willis had given me. Rick sat, instantly perusing them. Anything of use in these? he asked. I've not had time to examine them. I've printed copies for the dossier, but that's about all. Rick picked up the file and leafed through the pictures of the Blackman family. He suddenly realised Mitch was still standing close by. If you're going to wait to be asked to sit down every time, you're going to have very tired legs, son. Mitch pulled up a chair and sat. He gave me a look. I shrugged. Better get used to it, mate. Rick dropped the file on the table. Why don't you talk me through it? He asked. I edged my seat closer. OK, in a nutshell, Blackman is about as politically far right as Genghis Khan. He's anti-everything, except war. He likes war. A lot. He has lots of medals to prove it. Rank? Asked Rick. Major General, US Marine Corps, said Mitch flatly. I gave the American a look that told him maybe he could have saved me some time, but ploughed on. He's anti-abortion, anti-gay rights, particularly same-sex marriage. He's anti-immigration. He campaigned to stop the construction of a large mosque in Louisville. He's pro the death penalty and pro gun ownership. Surprise, surprise. He wants to cut funding to many African and Hispanic schemes that provide social housing in the state and use the money for construction, transport and other major infrastructure projects. This is very popular with the working class whites. It's also very popular with Vineco. Vineco is one of Blackman's many companies that specialise in multi-million dollar construction and regeneration development worldwide. Another jaw-dropping shock is that Vineco and Blackman's other major companies have been the beneficiaries of many of his political schemes and policy changes. All in all, he just falls short of wearing a white pointed hat to his rallies. Mitch pulled a face. Unfair, Mitch? I asked. The American rubbed the top of his head with his palm. A little, maybe. I mean, Senator Blackman does tremendous work for charity. He's a Christian, a God-fearing man, I pointed. Ah, uh, I was coming to that part. Kentucky is part of the infamous Bible Belt, yes? One of half a dozen or so southern states that have large vocal Christian communities. They're predominantly white and Protestant in nature. Lots of evangelicals, Baptists, Methodists and the like banging on about hellfire and damnation every five minutes. It's also a multi-billion dollar industry of which J.E. Blackman has a very nice slice. I pulled a sheet from the printer to refresh my memory. Senator Blackman owns Verity Holdings, an umbrella company. Now Verity have 11 separate other smaller companies under their steerage. All tend to be foreign in nature. Mines in South Africa, shipbuilders in the Far East, tech companies in India. But one is Golden Gate. 
Now, Golden Gate are a fundraising organisation and registered international charity directly associated with Reverend Billy Chapel. And I've heard of him, said Rick. He's been over here in the UK, hasn't he? Massive open-air rallies, healing the sick, feeding the poor. Lying in his pockets too, I said. Golden Gate posted pre-tax profits of $180 million last year. Rick raised his brows. And the percentage going to charity? I shrugged. I can't find that figure anywhere. Maybe Egghead can help with that one. Mitch leaned forward in his seat. Sorry, ma'am, but I don't see how this has got any bearing on the investigation you've been tasked with. You aren't here to assassinate G.E. Blackman's character. You're here to find out who murdered his son. We both turned to Mitch. Did we touch a nerve there? Asked Rick. The American appeared agitated. Look, people like G.E. Blackman and the Reverend Chapel give hope to millions of poor white working class Americans. Guys like me who grew up in a trailer and watched the immigrant communities prosper. Watched them thrive whilst we stood still or went backwards. We saw immigrants get better housing, better jobs. We got left behind. I was taken aback by Mitch's outburst. So Blackman's the Messiah? From what I've seen, Mitch, he's a racist, sexist homophobe who likes money and power in equal amounts. I don't see him paying for better houses or health care. Mitch stood and for the first time that southern drawl grew an edge. J.E. is for the working man. He puts born and bred Americans first. We don't want mosques in our cities. I've seen enough mosques to last me a lifetime in Iraq. He wants stuff built in America by Americans not imported from China or Mexico. And as for his beliefs, the Bible says that homosexuality is a sin, does it not? It says that abortion is a sin, does it not? I read the Bible, I believe in the Lord God, and I believe that J.E. Blackman is a good man. I locked eyes with Mitch Collins. Well, we'll just have to agree to differ there, won't we? Mitch regained some of his composure. That we will, ma'am, he said. That we will. Des Cogan's story. Crucified? Old George didn't seem the type to exaggerate. That's what folk are saying. The kid was nailed to a cross and slit open just the way Jesus Christ was. I finished my paint and ordered another and a half for the old boy. Blimey, I muttered to myself. No wonder they're keeping a lid on it. What you saying there, Cogan? Uh, no, nothing, George. Just a bad way to go for the young laddie. Eh? The old soldier darkened. Aye, I was stupid enough to stay on after the war. Posted to Palestine in 47, I was. I seen our lads hung from trees and lampposts by the air gun. They strung them up, they did, like meat in a butcher's window. And I'll tell you this, one or two were crucified. Blooming heathens. Anyways, you won't be seeing the inside of that flat any time soon, I reckon. You're right there, George. We lapsed into a comfortable silence. George went back to his race in post and I admired Maggie as she served her regulars through what she laughingly called the lunchtime rush. The Guinness started to do its job too, and I steadily taught myself up from yesterday's wake. That said, I couldn't get the image of a young boy hanging from a cross from my mind's eye. This job got stranger hour on hour. Just before three o'clock, two faces sauntered in. From their body language, it was obviously not their first visit. Maggie visibly stiffened. Both men were tall, tanned and well-dressed. One carried a briefcase, the other a laptop. I would have put them down as travelling salesmen from the brewery or food industry had it not been for the obvious hostility in their stance. Briefcase spoke first. He was a southerner, Kent maybe. Afternoon, Maggie, he began. We've come to see if you've reconsidered our more than generous offer for your business. Maggie was obviously an experienced landlady and looked capable of handling most situations, despite her small stature. Well, as I've told you gentlemen before, she said calmly, the prince ain't for sale. I don't want to sell. This is my business and it'll stay that way. 
briefcase guy smiled, revealing good teeth. But I could see he was irritated. He was obviously a man used to get in his own way. This place is finished, Maggie. Don't you see that? People don't want to sit in dark old bars anymore, eating ham sandwiches. They want coffee shops and cocktail bars. Why slave over this place? It's dead. Finished. The guy's last couple of words were almost spat out and full of underlying aggression. But Maggie didn't scare easily, that was for sure. I said no, didn't I? I said no last time and the answer will be the same next time. So why don't you go and scare some more old folk from our homes, eh? You lot are good at that. Old George was in like a flash. Aye, buggers tried it with me the other night. Come banging on me door after ten it was. I'm a pensioner, you know. It was laptops turned to speak. He turned to the old soldier, fixed smile, shark-like eyes. I'm sure our purchasing officers were more than polite, sir, and they made you a good offer. My advice is you should reconsider it. This area is being developed for the young, the upwardly mobile. I hear there are some very nice residential homes just a few miles from here. This tone turned all nasty. Maybe you should look into that possibility, Grandad. I felt my hackles rise. Then I be speaking to George like that, I said. Laptop smile faltered ever so slightly. I didn't think I was addressing you, sir. I shrugged and eyeballed him. You need to treat the elderly with respect, son. Didn't your parents teach you that? It wasn't like me to go looking for it. All my years in the regiment have been about being the grey man. Don't bring attention to yourself. Enter and leave without a soul noticing that you were ever there in the first place. I'd practised that mantra all my service and it had stood me well. However, on this occasion I felt my ever so shiny halo slipping. I thought my head would burst. Everything had just seemed to come on top. Losing Anne to the cancer, losing JJ in Albania, young Kaya's tears, this job and now these self-righteous fuckers. I was just about ready to really upset the bloke when out of the corner of my eye I saw Maggie. Eyes wide, shaking her head. You don't need to do this. Briefcase joined his pal. They stood shoulder to shoulder, matching smiles painted on their smug coupons. I think you're out of your depth, sir, he said quietly. I can hear from your accent you aren't English. And your point is? Laptop buttered in. Maybe you shall go back north to be with your own kind. I stood up, dropped my pint on the table in front of George and took a step back. If it was going to kick off, I wanted to be on my feet and with some room to move. Both men were taller and heavier than me and looked handy enough. Now, I didn't want to make a mess in Maggie's lounge. Anyone who's ever witnessed a brawl in a pub will tell you stuff gets broken and quite often innocent folk get a slap for the trouble. But my dander was up. I pointed... See, you won't understand this as you will have been too busy having your teeth whitened, lying on fucking sunbeds and eating jelly deals. But us kilt wearers have been invaded more times and by more races than you could shake a stick at. I get called everything from a jock to a porridge wog, so I happen to understand a bit about persecution. I have a thick skin. Metal upsets me. But I will nay have some bar faced prick in a shiny suit tell me where I can live. Now Maggie has told you this place ain't for sale. Old George here is happy in his home. So why don't you boys just fuck off? I set myself, expecting them to come at me all guns blazing. But they didn't. Briefcase nodded at me knowingly. "'turned to his pal and gestured for them to leave. "'Both gave Maggie the hard stare as they went. "'I finished my pint and wandered outside for a smoke. "'As I passed the barn, Maggie gave me a smile and mouth. "'Thank you.' "'That cheered me up, "'as did the fact I still had all my very expensive teeth in my gob. "'Rick Fuller's Story' Mitch seemed to have climbed down from his horse and sat quietly in the corner. 
I come through the 30 days of agents' reports that had been cleaned by Carver. It appeared the boy Todd did what most 20-year-olds would have done in the same circumstances. He'd partied some, he'd worked some. He seemed to like a particular girl, and she in turn appeared to like Todd. Each report followed the same theme for the first ten days. Then it became obvious that Todd had clocked the team, and the reports came close to shambolic. The only tiny item of interest came on day six, when an unidentified male visited Todd at his key's apartment. The man arrived in a large black Mercedes, staying 15 minutes and left in the same vehicle. He was described as of Arabic appearance and in his late twenties. There didn't appear to have been any follow-up inquiries made by the team and certainly no attempt to identify the male. I made a note to do just that. Turning to Lauren, I pulled the memory stick we'd obtained from Egghead from my pocket. Okay, now for Detective Chief Inspector Simpson. This here is your bait. Lauren took the stick, looked at it, dropped it in her pocket and raised her eyebrows. I tapped the reports on my knee. I want you to load these 30 reports minus day six where the unidentified guy visits Todd on that stick. Offer them to Larry, there and then... But make sure you bring the stick back with you. Don't leave it with him under any circumstances. She nodded. Now, I suggest that you tell him what he's on there just to whet his appetite. Then in return, ask for some information on Todd. Nothing major that would put him off. Maybe some crime scene pictures, the name of some college friend, that kind of thing. Make it seem like you want to do a deal. The moment Larry inserts the device into his computer, Simon will be able to see everything he has on there. So the longer the stick is in, the better. Keep him talking, whatever, yeah? Lauren sat on her hands. Okay, I get it, but what if he says he isn't interested? I mean, the moment I tell him we're working on the case, he'll clam up. What then? I gave her a look she understood all too well. Her mood changed in an instant, and face like thunder. And just how far do you expect me to go to get Larry to play ball, Rick? I shrugged, doing my best to keep my own emotions out of the equation. When the Soku were investigating us and Larry was playing fast and loose with your feelings, how far would he have gone? Did you ask him that? As a matter of fact, yes, I did. And? And I'm not prepared to go that far. I stood up. Fair one, but you need to find a way, Lauren, and sooner rather than later. I turned to Mitch. Now, if you finish praying to the Lord Almighty that the whole world turns white and straight and that J.E. Blackman makes it all the way to the White House, we need to go and see your boss, Carver. Lauren North Story I found Willis, and Willis found me clothes from her wardrobe, saving me a visit home and precious time. She was an American size 8, an English 10, meaning I could fit straight into anything below the waist, although I struggled with her tops. Whatever Rick had in mind for me, I was determined not to fall into the femme fatale role for the hell of it. I opted for a pair of Sergeant Willis's Levi's and some heeled cowboy boots. No bare legs and short skirt today. On top, however, I went for a plain black lycra number with tiny straps that showed off my Corfu tan to the max, and the fact that I'd been working hard on my abs. Willis helped me with my hair and a little too much make-up for my liking. She stood behind me as I checked myself in the mirror. You need to be careful you don't fall out of that top, ma'am. Hell yeah, I'll be reckoning any red-blooded man would do most of anything you'd ask when you show up looking like that. I hope you're right, Caitlin. I turned to her. Thanks for the help. No problem, she said. Then as I was making to leave, she stopped me. You know y'all were talking before and you said you had two men in your life? I didn't answer. She eyed me. Well, I'd say one was in with Carver right now and the other is just this one car ride away. I opened the door. Thanks again, Willis, I said. I was given an army vehicle, a plain-looking dark green Hyundai. It was clean and tidy and smelled of peppermint. Checking myself one last time in the rear view, I could see my facial bruises from our Albania encounter were still evident, despite Caitlin's best efforts. It is what it is. 
Negotiating the country roads from Menwith Hill towards the M62, I pictured Larry as I knew he'd be, all rugged, good looks and full of promises. Each time I walked myself through the scenario of our meeting, a whole army of various flying insects instantly did cartwheels in my stomach. I did my best to put him from my mind and concentrated on the road ahead. The waiting room of Levin's Nick smelled just as it had on my last visit. On that occasion, I'd asked for Larry's help on another matter, the address of a prison officer from Strangeways. After a heated discussion, followed by a rather pleasant drink in the Monkey, a quaint little pub in town, Larry had succumbed to my request. That innocent drink also led to Larry visiting my flat just before the team had left for our last mission. As I'd stood there, bags packed, looking up into his handsome face, he'd kissed me and I'd kissed him back. He'd made an offer and asked me to call him on my return. No promises, that's what I'd said. Now I'd made that call and here I was dressed to turn his head and armed with a plant of steel everything he knew about Todd Blackman's murder. As I pondered what a dirty business we were in, the counter queue cleared and I found myself next in line. The assistant eyed me suspiciously. She was in her fifties with a lined smoker's mouth, turned into a permanent sneer. I ignored her obvious distaste and announced, Lauren North, to see Detective Chief Inspector Simpson. He's expecting me. The woman looked me up and down for a third time as she dialed. She spoke quietly, but I heard her say, Yes, sir, a couple of times before the handset was replaced. Finally, she managed a weak smile and offered, The chief will be just a moment, Miss North. My stomach was off again. Moments later, a door opened and there he stood. He'd had his hair trimmed, which accentuated his chiselled features even further. His eyes sparkled and he gave me a beaming smile. Lauren, he said, wrapping his strong arms around me. It's so good to see you. He released me, then held my shoulders and straightened his arms to get a good look. You look great. I mean, really good. You too, I said, meaning every word. Larry was tall, dark and classically handsome. He wore his usual crisp white shirt, tie pulled down away from the collar, sleeves rolled. I felt my nerves start to slip. Look, Larry, you must be busy right now, and, well, I can always come back. He cocked his head and gave me another beaming smile. Nonsense, Lauren. Come on up. I'll get some coffee. So, feeling like the longest snake in the grass, I walked those same corridors to his office, forcing myself to get my shit together. Once through his door, Larry opted to leave his desk behind and we sat opposite each other at a low coffee table. He looked genuinely pleased to see me. You have a great time, he offered. Then, noticing my ill-concealed facial damage, I leaned over, took my chin in his hand and turned my left cheek to his solitary window. His face was full of concern as he inspected me. Ouch! That must have hurt. I took his hand away with mine and held it for a fraction too long. The glancing blow I'd taken from the massive brute in Albania had indeed caused deep bruising to my cheek and eye socket. I considered the truth for a second, then lied. The moral is don't ride a scooter and drink ouzo at the same time. He sat back in his chair and eyed me. Yeah, right, and you're the drink driver type if ever I saw one. I smiled and moved on. You look good yourself? A little tired, maybe? The powers that be working you too hard? Before he could answer, coffee was delivered by Larry's usual flat-nosed sidekick. The burly detective acknowledged me with a nod but left without speaking. I got the impression I wasn't the flavour of his month. Larry poured. He did have darker shades under his eyes than I'd seen before. Too many late nights, maybe? You could say I was overworked and underpaid, he said, pushing my cup across the table. But then again, I think you know about most of it. Really? Larry caught my eye and gave me a knowing look. We had quite a bit of gang activity just after I saw you last. First a guy called Paddy Devlin, bodyguard. Lots of form for violence executed on the Hanson Pub car park in Longsight. 
Two girls from inside the pub reported a new female face in the place that night. Tall, dark-haired, attractive, expensive shoes. Fought like a ninja, they said. I shrugged and drank my coffee. It was awful. Minutes later, Jimmy London, another pillar of the Longsight community, is cut to pieces by automatic gunfire right there in the street, close to his house. Must have been hit over a dozen times. Yet not one shell casing was left at the scene. Neighbours reported that a second set of guys got out of a dark saloon just after the perpetrators departed and went about picking things up from the floor. Or day. Very, I offered. Then, next morning, Jimmy's cousin Kevin was found with his balls in his top pocket on a canal towpath. Nasty. Rapist. Never convicted. No need now, huh? Very funny. And no arrests? Larry shook his head. Let's just say witnesses aren't easy to come by on that estate, and the Londons were not the most popular residents. Sounds like a good night's work to me. Is that a confession? I was at home, knitting. I didn't tell you the date of the incidents. My answer would be the same anyway, so I spend my evenings. I gave him a cheeky wink. I'm a single girl, you see. He smiled a knowing smile and changed tack. So, where do you get the tan? Corfu? Oh, yeah. How oh, silly of me. Who's Owen Scooters? Spot on. Good time. My mind suddenly played horrible tricks with me and I was dragged back to Albania. Pictures flickered in front of my eyes like a magician thumbing a set of playing cards. Me hunched behind a half-destroyed Mercedes taking fire from all directions, me praying for God to take me rather than be captured again, me in the back of a van in the searing heat holding JJ's head as he begged Des to look out for his son and his body booked its last. From somewhere I found a smile. Yeah, very relaxing. Been back long? Long enough. Well, said Larry, leaning closer, it's great to see you, and I'm... Glad you came, but... But? But I get the impression you aren't here to take me up on my last offer. He took my hand. It does still stand, by the way. It was my turn to lean in close. I could smell his aftershave and the slightest hint of musk. He had the most expressive eyes. Larry had visited my flat just before Albania and asked me to leave my life behind to start a relationship with him. Yet I'd been desperate to hang on to the finest thread of hope that Rick and I could make it. That seemed as far away as ever. I steeled myself and pulled the memory stick from my pocket. I come bearing gifts. What's that? I was about to burst Larry's very fragile bubble. Todd Blackman. Larry instantly threw himself back into his seat. Oh, Jesus, Lauren, don't tell me the bloody firm have got you involved in the Blackman murder. I shook my head. Nothing to do with the firm, Larry, or acting on behalf of the family. Senator Blackman? Indirectly, the fucking CIA? I shrugged. Larry ran his hand through his hair. A look of incredulity spread across his face. You're here because I wouldn't play ball with the Secret Service guys that Blackman has in his pocket, aren't you? In a way. Larry let out a mocking laugh. Oh, and what exactly is your role in this little job? Find the killer and what? What nice little word would you like me to use, Lauren? Dispose of them? Eliminate them? Larry was on a roll. Fuck the judicial system, eh? Fuck the law of the land. Fuck innocent until proven guilty. What will you do if you find them, Lauren? Shoot them in cold blood as they lie on the concrete in a pub car park? I kept my nerve at my poker face, caught his eye and held out the stick. My heart pounded in my chest, but I had to play this with a straight bat, making believe every word. Larry... 
Our role is to move this investigation along as quickly and as quietly as possible. You guys work under a great deal of constraint, whereas we don't. Once the perpetrators are identified, our role is to hand that information over to the authorities. That's you, Chief Inspector. Now on this memory stick are 30 days' worth of CIA surveillance reports, the subject being Todd Blackman. That got Larry's attention. They were watching him. I nodded. J.E. Blackman was concerned his son may... How should I put it? Embarrass him politically by his student antics. However, Todd discovered his tale and eventually the surveillance was suspended. Larry examined me suspiciously. And what do you want in return? Not much. Just something for us to be working on. A few crime scene photographs, maybe... uh, No chance, blurted Larry, shaking his head vigorously. The scene is most peculiar and I don't want any information leaked to the press. We're not the leaking kind, Larry. No, no, definitely not. I leaned over and offered the stick again. OK, the report's for the name of Todd's best friend at Salford Uni. How about that? Larry eyed me, then the stick. I could almost hear his mind working overtime. I don't know. I found my smile again. The name of his best buddy, Larry. I give you the stick and I take you to dinner. Tonight. Dinner. I nodded. Larry took the stick. Rick Fuller's story. I'd left Mitch in Carver's office with a typical British flea in his ear. I don't like bigotry in any form. I'd fought the Irish, Africans, Arabs, Croats and Colombians. Black, white, gay, straight, Catholic, Protestant, Sunni, Shia. They all bled the same colour and most cry for their mother in the end. If Mitch wanted to work alongside us, he had to rein in the redneck act. All the Yanks needed to find another cowboy. No one seemed to mind that I'd kept hold of the Range Rover, so I used it to drive home to change and then to our lock-up to collect some cash. Whilst there, I slipped my Sig Sauer 1911 fastback into the back of my suit trousers, which made me feel much better. As I closed the shutter on the unit, my mobile buzzed. It was a text from Lauren. Bait taken. Won't be home till late. I didn't care for the sound of the second bit. I drove straight to Egghead's, regretting the fact that I'd been unable to resist wearing my new Hugo Boss brogues. As usual, I stood on the doorstep for a lifetime before finally making it to his room with a quarter of a million cat hairs on my trousers. Stepping inside, I found Simon working on a computer tower, clipping in circuit boards. When he looked up, I noticed he was considerably paler than on my earlier visit. The lad boasted a look that I recognised only too well. It was the same facial expression I'd seen on new recruits after their first real action, after their first sight of what munitions do to a human body. He stopped what he was doing, wiped his hands on his jeans and stood. Hello, Mr Fuller, he offered quietly, his usual bouncing little hidden behind a wall of concern. You OK, Simon? I asked, genuinely anxious for the lad. He nodded. Ah, oh, Mr Fuller, I'm OK, like. He walked over to a nearby table, picked up an external hard drive and dropped it in my hand. That's what you wanted, Mr Fuller. Everything on the Todd Blackman murder. I'll take me five large now, if you don't mind. I handed him an envelope. It's all there, Simon. He nodded. I'd prefer it if you went elsewhere to examine the content, Mr Fuller. No offence, like, but it made me sick to my stomach, it did. Couldn't even look at the old girl's cottage pie after watching that lot. That bad, eh? Simon nodded. You'll get mixed up in some very nasty stuff, Mr Fuller. I'll say that to you for sure. I held up the drive. You didn't make a copy, did you? Simon shook his head so vigorously I thought his head might fall off. God no, Mr Fuller. Be honest, I can't wait for you to take it out of the house. As I drove back to the lock-up to begin the ghastly task of reviewing the murder of Todd Blackman, I considered Simon's words. Nasty stuff indeed. Des Cogan's story. 
It took a while for the atmosphere and the prince to return to normal after I stepped back inside. Maggie quietly got on with the task of serving what was left of her customers. Strangers and the threat of violence around pubs does little for trade, no matter why it's served up. I felt a mixture of pleasure and concern at my actions. Pleased that I'd pissed off the pair of fake tan bullies, but slightly concerned that I'd been unable to control my temper. That said, George was delighted, and I had the feeling the old soldier would be regaling the incident to anyone who would listen and buy him a half for some time to come. The clock turned to five. I'd had enough, and feeling ever so slightly guilty at my lack of detective work, peered at my mobile with the intention of ringing a taxi home. I figured I'd collect the Yanks' motor in the morning and have another snoop about then. As I fumbled for the right number, Maggie came and sat by me. Thanks for that, before I mean. I shrugged. No bother, then. Maggie rested a hand on my shoulder. No, I mean it, Des. Those guys have been a thorn in my side for months. They were nasty pieces of work, for sure. Well, you dealt with them. She looked concerned. They weren't waiting for you outside, were they? I shook my head and smiled. No, hen, they'd be long gone, eh? Anyway, didn't worry about me. I've had a few bumps and bruises in my time. Too many, I'd say. As I caught her beautiful eyes, I thought I saw something approaching affection in there, but quickly dismissed it as me being over-hopeful. So long as you're okay, that's all that matters, I said. She tucked her hair behind her ears and lay her palms on her knees. I sensed an announcement. Yes, of course I am, of course, but... Maggie seemed to stumble over her next words. Are you... um, Are you... Are you you hungry, Des? As usual, I didn't read the signs. I think I've missed out on some fine women over the years as a direct result of my inability to see things in front of my thick coupon. I rubbed my stomach... As a matter of fact, Maggie, I reckon there's a don of kebab, large chips and side of onion rings with my name on it somewhere nearby. Undaunted, she wrinkled her nose and tried again. Sounds good, but I've made pork belly and honey and mustard with onion mash and green beans on the side. Maggie raised her brows and waited. When she realised that this stupid Scottish lump still hadn't got the message, she added... I'll have Julie here in half an hour. She's doing the evening shift. I've got the night off. She bit her bottom lip, an impish expression etched on her face. Is it enough for two? A light came on in this dumb Scotsman's head. You're inviting me to supper? I am. I couldn't hide my shiny posh teeth at that one. She was as bonny a wee thing as I'd seen in many a year, and a home-cooked meal was a rare thing in the Cogan household. Well, I'd love to, Maggie, that's mighty kind of you. She lived above the pub. Her quarters as well kept as the business downstairs. A wee comfy lounge, kitchen, come diner, one bedroom, one bathroom. I sat at the small round dining table as she finished serving up the supper and poured two glasses of wine. So how long have you had this place then, Maggie? I asked. She dropped two plates full of delicious-looking grub on the table, sat and took a sip from her glass. Just two years now. Seemed like a good idea at the time. I cut into my pork, my stomach grumbling in anticipation. But no now. Oh, all this stuff with the developers, their strong-arm tactics, it wears me down, Des. I mean, just like them, I saw the opportunity here. And Courts is on the up, just like the Northern Quarter. I figured I could get in early and reap the benefits, but they've been at me to sell to them for months now. It was all friendly at first, but as time goes by, they get more and more threatening. I reckon those boys are just trying it on. They see an easy target... Woman on her own, lean on her a bit and she'll give in. Like you say, the place is on the up. They'll more likely move on soon. Well, I'm not so sure, Des. Those guys, well, ones they work for anyway, are buying up swathes of property, all streets, shops, land, you name it. The big time. 
Maggie chewed on a piece of delicious pork. She held her hand over her mouth as she spoke. Lucas Estates, they called. That pricked my ears up. Don't they own that place where the young lad was killed? Maggie frowned. Oh, yes, did you hear about that? Terrible, so they say. I've heard some dreadful rumours. Some say the young lad was nailed to the wall in there. They'll have some trouble renting that place, I reckon. She shook her head angrily. But it won't bother them, buggers. I mean, they own most of the new and renovated property around here. There's going to be two huge tower blocks built, too. Apartments for the rich, though. Not the likes of me or old George. About like the gaff on Deansgate, then, the place where all the footballers have flats. A lot like it from what I can gather. I mean, we're talking in the hundreds of millions. Jeez, oh, I figured those two were just small-time muscle. I mean, it's a bit of an unusual tactic for such a big firm. I tell you, though, if you went to the papers, it would ruin their reputation. Maybe even drop them in it with a local council. Some of this land must be public property. It is. The big projects are all based on publicly owned or reclaimed land. But Lucas want the small stuff too, and the older residents are in no position to fight back. Leaning on pensioners that have lived here for years, or small shops and businesses like mine, it's a pushover for them. We're easy, mate, and to be honest, we're too scared to say anything. There's rumours of another lot following the boys in suits who aren't so polite. I've heard of one fella getting a right hiding when he wouldn't sell his shop. I didn't like the sound of that. So this Lucas Estates not only want the big infrastructure projects, they're desperate to control all of the surrounding properties too, eh? I'm used for a moment as I polished off my onion mash. Makes sense. I mean, if all the houses around these two main towers are renovated and the old-fashioned boozers like the Prince are turned into cafes or eateries, they can charge more for the flats, eh? Maggie raised her eyebrows. There are still people who like the old-fashioned boozers, you know. I smiled. Aye, me included, if you hadn't noticed. Maggie smiled back, reached across the table and touched my hand. I just need you around more often and I'll be okay, eh? We finished our meal. I offered to help with the pots, but Maggie was having none of it and sat me in a comfy armchair in the lounge. I was all cosy, the drink blurring my senses. As I kicked off my shoes, I recalled being in JJ's front room watching Grace stitch his hands. I'd felt the same warmth then. Nothing to do with the temperature, just that feeling of being safe, comfortable and wanted. I thought about we Kyer and made a note in my head to visit soon. Well, as soon as this job was finished anyway. Maggie stepped into the room and broke my spell. She opened the cupboard beneath a small hi-fi. What kind of music do you like, this? She asked as she flipped through her CD collection. Oh, hen, I'm not bothered. I was never one for dancing or concerts. I didn't mind a wee bit of Pavy like, if you have him. Pavarotti? I asked the fella, eh? Sang at the football. Up the three tenors. That'll be fine, hen, but hey, I don't want to outstay my welcome. Maggie pushed the CD into the unit and adjusted the volume. She stood, stepped over to my chair and sat on the arm. It felt good to have her so close. She looked into my eyes and smiled. You don't have to go anywhere tonight. Is. Rick Fuller's Story I had two reasons for heading straight for the lock-up. One, it was safe and secure, and two, I could change out of my cat-hair-infested trousers. I'd invested in the building some years earlier when I worked for a guy by the name of Joel Davis, a rather unpleasant character who made as much money from drug dealing as he did from his international antiques business. I collected his debts and settled his scores. Nothing to be proud of, but most got what they deserved. The lock-up housed a few vehicles that I'd acquired over the years, some useful workhorses, some nice toys. Although my Aston and my MV Augusta were parked at my penthouse apartment in Bowden, the interior also boasted basic living accommodation, a small kitchen, bathroom and some cots to get your head down. Here we safely stored weapons, ammunition, medical supplies and emergency cash. 
There was no way I was about to invite Mitch along. The last thing we needed was the CIA rocking up at the front door uninvited. Besides, from what I could see, Mitch was Carver's boy, and as likeable as he had first seemed, there was little doubt where his political affiliations lay. He was firmly ensconced in the Bible Belt culture that J.E. Blackman was so fond of, and the somewhat extreme beliefs that went along with it. I needed to get a look at the file Simon had obtained in private before deciding what, if anything, we would share with the CIA. After parking the Range Rover a block away from our base, I paid for overnight parking and walked through the balmy Manchester streets, my mind a whirl of questions. By the time I opened the shutters on the lock-up, it was just before 20 hundred hours. I checked my phone for messages, but the screen was blank. Lauren was obviously still with Larry. Dropping my phone on the table, I stripped and stepped straight into the shower, hoping the hot water would wash away my nagging jealousy, founded or not. By 2015 hours, I parked myself at our large dining table and plugged Simon's external hard drive into my laptop. Any murder inquiry has an all-encompassing file of its own within a police system called Homes, a Home Office Major Inquiry System. This was developed back in the day after vital clues were missing during the Yorkshire Ripper inquiry. Even Simon would have trouble accessing that baby. The documents we had access to were Larry's own reference materials and so not the whole picture, but would hopefully be good enough. The Chief Inspector had laid out all the relevant files the way you might expect, in chronological order. Statements from the witness who had found the body, the first responders, the uniforms, the medics, first detectives, then forensics, medical examiner, the beginnings of the first inquiries, house to house, any sightings of suspicious persons or vehicles. Separate to these reports were Larry's own musings and notes. I bypassed them all and went straight to a video file. I opened it and pressed play. It was the forensics team entry video, complete with commentary. The guy holding the camera and delivering the running commentary was joined by a second who acted as exhibits officer. His role was to mark or collect obvious items of evidence. A third person who remained unseen and unheard other than the flashing of their camera took dozens of stills. The video began with the two filmmakers identifying themselves by name and stating the time, date and address of the crime. Could have saved Des a job. And where is the Scottish twat? The team entered via the ground floor, describing it as the front entrance to one of the three flats. The door looked new. There was an electronic entry system fitted to the left-hand side with three call buttons. All had nameplates next to them, but all were blank. Either the flats were empty or the residents hadn't yet filled them in. The guy commentating was monotone but professional. He described the overall dwelling as they stepped inside. Newly renovated house, separated into three apartments, two on the ground floor, one larger first floor, all currently unoccupied, no sign of forced entry. Someone had a key or knew the code. The victim is reported to be present in apartment two, entrance door at the end of the hall to our left. However, the camera first swung right to a newly painted banister rail. White paint, red bloodstain. Accidental? Looked like a glove smear. The crew marked it, described it, and there was lots of flash photography. Left turn, narrow hall, door at the end ajar. Again, lots of new white paint except for the right-hand wall. An arrow, maybe three feet long, halfway up, painted in what had to be blood. Dark red dried drips chasing the imperfections in the plaster. A crudely manufactured tip pointing towards the door. Above the makeshift arrow was daubed a short Arabic script. I opened the second file. Larry had already had the cursive translated. In English it deciphered as fornicator. There was more marking, more droning descriptive, more flashes from the unseen cameraman. There were bloody glove marks on the door and frame. The perpetrators appeared to have made a hurried exit. Disturbed? Panicked? The forensics team carefully filmed the whole frame and took dozens of stills before stepping into the flat. Small hallway, right turn, another makeshift arrow painted in blood. This time the numbers, 
780-84, daubed above. I paused the video, opened Google in another window and searched. The numbers related to verses in the Quran. For ye practice your lusts on men in preference to women. Ye are indeed a people transgressing beyond bounds, and we rain down on them a shower of stones. I hit play again, and the team found Todd Blackman. The killers had daubed more claret on the far wall of what would have been a lounge come diner. Despite the primitiveness, despite the drips, there was no doubt. Picked out in Todd Blackman's blood, floor to ceiling, was a full-sized crucifix. Todd had been stripped naked and nailed to the makeshift cross by his wrists and feet. At some point, before they'd nailed him to the wall, they'd cut him in the groin. No doubt to use his blood for their artwork. Inserted into that wound was what appeared to be a stick or stave. God only knew how far into his abdomen it went. A dark pool of what had remained of his bodily fluids formed at his feet. There was no crown or thorns, no loincloth. Written across the boy's naked chest by what appeared to be a blood-stained gloved finger was more Arabic. I checked Larry's file again. The script translated as homosexual. When Carver had said the murder may have been religiously or sexually motivated... He was on the money. All that nonsense about mistaken identity was just for our benefit. This put their cat right amongst the pigeons. Lauren North Story Larry couldn't make my proposed dinner date as he was meeting J.E. Blackman and driving him to Salford General to formally identify his son. However, he did make drinks in town. We sat in the moon over the water, a big chain-owned pub that was busy enough to hide anyone's conversations. If Rick was in any way worried about our date, he needn't have been. Larry was totally preoccupied with the case and nursed a half-pint of London pride, looking drawn and tired. I'm not much company, am I? he said wearily. It's okay, Larry, I understand. He took a gulp. Blackman is a real piece of work. Are you due to meet with him? Feeling ever so slightly guilty, I'll press for more info. It hasn't been mentioned. What do you mean, a piece of work? He took another long drink and looked at his almost empty glass. Should have bought a pint, I reckon. I'll get another, I offered. You're not driving, are you? Cab, he said, handing me his empty. Pint it is, then. I returned with Larry's brew, a gin and slimline for myself, and sat beside him. You do look a bit knackered, mate. You need a day off. Larry snorted. Fat chance. It's the PM tomorrow and we have a full murder incident team briefing first thing in the morning. And you were heading? He shook his head. Was. But not now. The boys in the big house have decided that it is too high profile for a DCI... And they're shipping in a guy from HQ. And DCS Williams. You pissed about that? Larry shrugged resignedly. It was always going to happen. I mean, a US senator's son. Well, you could say a prospective US president's son. Doesn't get any bigger, eh? Once the press get a hold of it tomorrow, well, it'll be fucking chaos. There's a conference? Three o'clock. I took a sip and went with a subject I figured we could both share. Did you get a chance to have a look at those surveillance reports? He nodded. Quick look, yeah. And? And in a way they confirm what we already knew. I raised my brows, surprised that they had given Larry anything. He shrugged as if it was obvious. The area the team lost Todd in. Every time he came to town, I gave him a blank stare. It was Larry's turn to give me the eyebrows. The village? He was gay? Larry shrugged again. But the report said he was popular with girls. He had a girlfriend. Yeah, Tom Blackman had lots of girls who were friends. Just not girlfriends. Oh, my. Oh, yes. 
I took a bigger drink at that news. Well, J.E. the Mighty is going to be well pleased with that little snippet, given his political and moral stance on homosexuality. Larry turned. J.E. Blackman is adamant his son isn't gay. He would be. Larry shook his head and let out a small laugh. No, Lauren, you don't understand. J.E. admits his son had been confused about his sexuality as a teenager. But... But he had him cured. I nearly spat out my gin. What? Oh, yes. J.E. has told me in no uncertain terms that Todd had undergone treatment in the U.S. for his confused state. Apparently he underwent a mixture of both psychological and religious counselling before leaving for the U.K. and had been completely cured of his homosexual leanings. I scratched my head. Well, he was arrested for curb crawling in Louisville last year. It was in the press. No charges, of course, so I suppose he may have been batting for both sides at that point. Larry took a long drink of his beer. Todd Blackman was arrested for impertuning in a public toilet, a la George Michael. The only woman involved in that matter was the arresting officer. He took another swill and waved his near-empty glass. Another... I gulped my gin. Oh, yes. As Larry bought the drinks, I made a note that should I ever see her again, never to trust anything that came out of Caitlin Willis's mouth. Minutes later, he was back. Larry sat. He looked less tired. Maybe the beer or maybe my gin, but he looked good, no doubt. I turned in my seat. So you believe Todd was definitely gay. Larry pulled a small notebook from his pocket and wrote on it. He tore off the top sheet and handed it to me. Here's my part of the deal. This was Todd's best friend at college, Henrietta Duval. She's 19 from Oxfordshire and what is referred to locally as a fag hag. I took the paper and pushed it in my jeans. Not very complimentary. I don't make up these terms, Lauren. The street does. It simply means a woman who prefers the company of gay men. Well, that answers a lot of questions. Larry cocked his head, a movement that made him look incredibly sexy. Really? he asked. I felt the old stomach doing somersaults again, but pressed on. In a way, yes. I mean, look, you don't need to give anything away, but I'm supposing that there is evidence of Todd's leaning at the scene? Definitely. And once the press gets a hold of this information, J.E. Blackman's chances of running for president take a major nosedive? Larry shrugged, unconcerned. It will just be a basic conference tomorrow afternoon with very little detail from us. An appeal for witnesses to Todd's last movements, that kind of thing. He smiled and pointed. Unless there's a leak. Fuck no, Larry, this is a very dangerous game. I took his hand and looked into those tired eyes that seemed all so inviting. I like you, Larry, I really do. And you're a good cop, a good man. But, but don't get involved in this one. You don't know what you're dealing with here. Blackman would hunt you down and have you slaughtered before breakfast. He's rich and powerful enough to make the CIA dance to his tune. Leave this one be, Larry, please. He sat back and blew out his cheeks. Look, I'm pulling your leg about leaks. Anyway, it won't be my call, Lauren. It'll be down to this DCS Williams. The guy the suit's just brought in from HQ. He nodded. Experienced murder detective, is he? Fraud expert, actually. Keen to advance his career? Larry raised those brows again. What are you saying, Lauren? Christian, is he? Regular churchgoer? I... I think so, but... I figured Larry needed a wake-up call. Look, Chief Inspector, our team were loaned out to the Americans by the firm. MI5, the secret fucking service. Our government, Larry. The people that pay your wages. 
He was rubber stamped in Whitehall, the corridors of power. They gave the go ahead for the Yanks to employ us to bury this job to protect Blackman's reputation. Sinking in yet? Maybe. There's no maybe about it. I'll bet your man Williams is a fine, upstanding, Bible wielding member of the community, and I'll wager he's a great deal richer today than yesterday. Are you suggesting Williams would have taken a bribe? I turned down the corners of my mouth. Possibly cash. Maybe he just got a call from on high suggesting he take the case as it may help his future career development. Who knows? Maybe he has a skeleton of his own in the closet that he would rather remain hidden. I don't know, but I would guess one or more of those scenarios is playing out right now as we speak. Larry ran his hands through his hair. My God, Lauren, this is just what I was talking about when I came to your flat. All this cloak and dagger stuff. You don't need it. Why not just drop all this shit and live a normal life again? With me. I looked at him. Strong, reliable, honest, hard-working, handsome. What more could a girl ask for? I think it's time I went home, I said. We walked to Dean's Gate towards the taxi rank. The air was thick and heavy with summer humidity. Girls teetered by in the highest of heels and tiny dresses, whilst guys in shorts and T-shirts guzzled cold cans as they strode noisily by, doing their best to hide their booze from the patrolling cops. We reached the line of waiting cabs, stopped at the curb and faced each other. Larry took me in his arms and looked deep into my eyes. You have my number. You know where I am. I smiled and nodded. I do. He dipped his head and kissed my cheek. I still want that dinner you promised me. I took a step back, not trusting myself to stay so close to him any longer. I keep my promises, I said. Come on, your cab's waiting. Des Kogan's story it was those seven hundred hours when Maggie's alarm shattered what had been a deep and dreamless sleep. She rolled in my arms and stretched, revealing her nakedness. No rest for the wicked, she yawned. I pulled her to me and we kissed deeply. I really did not want to let her go. Another few minutes won't hurt. She smiled. Yes, it will, Mr. Corgan. The Draymond will be here in a quarter of an hour with me Boddington's. I looked her in the face, still creased from sleep, still lovely. Well, let me get the breakfast, then, eh? You get a shower and I'll find my way round your kitchen. She stroked my cheek. How could a girl resist? No plat pudding for me. She giggled, rolling from the bed. The dray was on time and I had to warm Maggie's breakfast in the oven until the delivery was done and the order was signed for Finally, we sat together and ate. There was that hint of an atmosphere, the kind that only rears its head after two people have slept together for the first time, especially the age of us two. I mean, let's face it, you get to a stage where you don't expect a great deal. It would have been no surprise if Maggie had politely explained over breakfast that our night of passion had been a one-off, a mistake, a... yeah, whatever... That, or there'd be no phone numbers exchanged, no second chances. I said I didn't know a lot of Maggie's history, but I got the impression, just like myself, there hadn't been too many one-night stands in her life. You okay? I asked, feeling the old nerves jangle. Maggie nodded, chewing. Sure. More nods, a hint of a smile. Are you asking about the sex, Desmond? She said without looking up from her plate. The good Catholic boy in me reared its head and I felt myself flush. Well, not exactly that. I mean, it was just a general sort of how you doing, like? Ah, I see. Well, I'm doing just fine, thank you. And the sex was wonderful, just in case that's what you were asking. Well, if you wanted to make a fella feel good at eight in the morning, that's the way... I tucked into my sausage and couldn't stop myself grinning. I was halfway through my poached egg when I became aware that Maggie was staring. You seem like a really good bloke, Des, 
She offered all matter of fact, you know, sorted, good looking, look after yourself. I mean, there can't be many men your age out there with a body like yours. She stifled another wonderful giggle. I reckon a girl could be forgiven for thinking she'd spent the night with a twenty-year-old. I hadn't felt so good in years. For the first time in an age, I'd fallen on my feet. I patted my stomach. I joined the gym recently. I mean, I have to shake off the Guinness somehow, eh? Anyway, you're not too shabby yourself, hen. There's a good few younger women out there would kill for a figure like yours. Maggie shook her head. Oh, Des, good of you to say, considering I've never seen the inside of a health club in my life. I'm lucky. I can eat and drink what I like. I've been this way since I was a teenager. One of the positives of never having kids, I suppose. You and your husband never wanted bairns? Maggie shrugged, and somewhere deep in those eyes of hers an old wound was open. Just didn't happen for us. She stared into space for a moment, then broke the spell. What about you, Des? You got any strapping lads or lasses? No, Anne and me never had children. I reckon it was one of the reasons we split. Maggie's eyes widened. Oh, I thought you said you were a widower. I am, well, kind of. She passed not long back, actually. Cancer. But we'd been divorced a while. I suppose I never really accepted it, you know. Not until she'd actually gone. Maggie gave me that pitying look again. It must have been awful finding out she'd died. I felt my own demons tap me on the shoulder. I was with her in the end. Really? Aye, she knew she was going and asked that I go up to Scotland to be there. It was kind of her last request. And you went? I loved her, Maggie. I touched my ring finger absently. "'recalling the horrendous choice I made. "'Still do, I suppose. "'Maggie reached across the table and took my hand. "'She looked directly into my eyes, purposeful, telling. "'And there ain't nothing wrong in that, Des Cogan, "'and don't let any man say different. "'She gave me a beaming smile and stood. "'Well, as much as I'd love to take my handsome Scotsman back to bed, "'I have a pub to run.' I stood. Oh, I sorry there, Maggie. I must be getting on myself, eh? I don't want to get in your way like... Nonsense, I just have things to do. After all, if Lucas Estates have their way, I'll be out of business soon anyway. I darkened some. You let me deal with them boys, hen. I found a pen and paper and wrote my mobile down. Here, give me a call if you get any bother with those boys. She allowed her head to fall to one side, her hair falling over one shoulder. She looked so beautiful. Don't you want me to call you otherwise? How fucking dumb can you be? Oh, Maggie, don't take no heed of me and my stupid mouth. Of course I'd love to see you again. I'm not going anywhere. Well, not yet a while anyway. She locked me with those eyes again. Okay, Mr. Cogan. You know where I am, and if I need rescuing, I'll call. You do that, I said, and took her in my arms. Stepping out into the morning sunshine with the same stupid grin on my face I'd worn at breakfast, I was met by an old boy with a long broom. He was sweeping the pavement outside, collecting last night's cigarette butts and the odd bit of litter. He wore a striped apron with the pub's logo on it. Morning, he offered with a knowing look. And a fine one it is too, I replied, striding off in the direction of my car. I fumbled for my mobile and switched it on. It buzzed instantly. Lock up ASAP. Rick never was one for long messages. I pushed my phone back in my pocket, pulled out my wee pipe, filled it, lit the bowl and took a good deep drag. As I exhaled, I saw something to change my good temper. Leaning on my car, face to the sunshine, was none other than Mitch Collins. You and your team are not easy to locate, Mr. Cogan, he said, without looking away from the sky. Mr. Carver is a little upset that there hasn't been an update. Of course, Mitch would have known exactly where the U.S. Army pool car was located. 
As with most government vehicles, it was fitted with a GPS tracker. Finding yours truly, however, would have been a completely different matter. I tapped my pipe out on my heel and refilled it. Well, your Mr. Carver is going to stay upset there, Mitch, as I am bereft of the slightest bit of useful information, including the whereabouts of the remainder of our little group. At that, Mitch stopped his sun-worshipping, pulled off his ray-bands and eyed me. So you didn't locate the murder site? I lit up. Come on, Mitch, you probably drove past it yourself this morning. Stop playing games. What's this about? Ms. North was dispatched to meet with DCI Simpson yesterday, was she not? I shrugged. Mitch continued regardless. Do we know what she discovered from that meeting? Did we obtain the files we sought? I held out my palms. I have no clues to what went on after I left men with pal. I got down here and finally found the murder site. I popped in the nearest bar, asked a few questions and decided to stay the night. End of. And what did your inquiries reveal, Mr. Cogan? Not a lot. Mitch's easy drawl was showing signs of irritation. Mr. Cogan, we are not paying you this great deal of money to socialise with the residents of Manchester. We are going close. You... I pointed, are paying us to find Todd Blackman's killers. As yet we haven't found them, and as a result you haven't parted with one red cent. So I reckon we are even. When we have something to tell you or we need something from you, we'll be in touch. Mitch was ruffled. My orders are to work alongside. I was having none of it. Whoa there, cowboy. I know what you and Carver said yesterday, but Rick appears to have left you behind for some reason, and this is his party, understand? I pulled the cart keys from my pocket and dropped them on the roof of the Chevy. In the meantime, son, take that back to men with hell. We'll be in touch when we have something. Rick Fuller's Story Lauren had received my 0600 hours text, whereas the bed-hopping Scott had not. Finally, at ten hundred hours, the three of us sat around the table in the lock-up with a large pot of tea and an even larger headache in the form of the murder of Todd Blackman. OK, Lauren, I began. Good job obtaining the files yesterday. Well done. She nodded her acknowledgement, but offered no further details of her evening out with the detective. I gave Des a sarcastic smile. Nice of you to join us, Desmond. Had I known it was going to take you so long to find one address, I could have saved you a job. I had the information from the forensics team whilst you were still taking your pants off. Now, if we are all concentrating on the job at hand, we'll start with the time frame in the scene and what we know about the cop's initial findings. Nods all round. Good. Okay. Todd Blackman's body was found by a decorator who works for Devlin Paint, one of the contractors renovating the properties in the street. He was there to complete what is known as the snagging. Any small issues, drips of paint, mist sections, that kind of thing. And that was just after our 800 hours, the day before yesterday. The first cops arrived along with ambulance crews eight minutes later. Todd's body was informally identified by officers at the scene at 11.09 hours, using his driving licence photograph. The perpetrator's not bothering to remove his wallet from his discarded clothing. Ten hours later, we were being bundled into the back of a Range Rover by the CIA, and Daddy was in the air. That's the logistics. No fucking about, eh? said Des. None at all. I'll be speaking to Cartwright later today. Then hopefully we can get to grips with exactly why we are involved in this pissing contest. Anyway, as you can see from the crime scene photographs, the boy was to all intents and purposes crucified. Cause of death is presumed shock from loss of blood, but we won't know the full script until we get the PM results. Lauren picked up some of the shots I printed and examined them one by one, a look of disgust on her face. Who could do such a thing? Well, I offered, who is one thing, why is quite another. Crucifixion was always intended to provide a death that was particularly slow and painful, hence the term excruciating, literally out of crucifying. It wasn't only gruesome, but humiliating, and I think humiliation plays a big part here. 
humiliation and revenge. I placed more photographs on the table. This is a very personal crime. The body stripped naked, the makeshift cross, the painting of the walls to indicate the placement of the boy, the religious references and the proclamation of Todd's crime, homosexuality. They are all designed to shame J.E. Blackman and ruin him as a political force. I sat back in my seat and stretched my back. I realised that the murderer's religious overtones, but this is a sensationalist crime rather than a religious one. I believe the driving force behind it is more political and personal than anything pious. Agreed, muttered Lauren. So, I asked, what kind of people are still nailing poor sods to trees, posts, road signs, and in this case, walls? The Saudis, offered Des. I nodded. Yes, true, they do, as do the Yemenis and some Arab Emirates. Even those you may think are moderate. Lauren dropped the photograph on the table. The script may be Arabic, and the quote is definitely from the Quran, but I'm not seeing Al-Qaeda here or some terror group. I'm with Rick. This is personal. It's meant to embarrass Blackman and enrage his so-called Christian followers enough to change the voting decision. I tap my temple with my index finger. Certainly makes you think, eh? Now, in the forensic reports, it appears that Todd had been bound with a thick rope before being cut in the groin with a sharp instrument. Looking at the blood patterns on the floor, this was done in the lounge and Todd's claret was then used to paint the cross on the wall and the various other doorbins. He was probably made to watch this process. The kid must have been terrified, said Des. I nodded. Not a good way to go. It then appears that one perpetrator held Todd roughly in position, while the second nailed his arms to the wall. This was done through the wrists between the radius and ulna, exactly the way the Romans would have nailed Jesus Christ. His feet were also nailed, but these were later removed by the perps. Why? asked Lauren. So far as I can find out, historically, items used in the act of crucifixion, such as rope, there's no trace of that, by the way, and nails were often taken as amulets. What the fuck is an amulet, then? asked Des. A lucky charm, said Lauren. No lucky for you, Todd, eh? He muttered, picking up the pictures Lauren had dropped. I ploughed on. Not at all, but it points to our perps being not only religious, but superstitious. The tech boys seem to think a traditional hammer was used rather than a nail gun, and the nails had traces of purple-coloured cloth on them, similar to velvet. Like something a priest would wear, asked Des. Maybe, but it could just have been a bag or such like, used to carry the items they used. That said, there is no doubt in my mind that the killers want the world to see that this was a ritual killing, a ceremony. Des looked at one picture and examined it. What's with the stick pushed into the wind? Again, traditional crucifixion ritual. The only thing they haven't followed is a smashing of the kneecaps. Des grimaced. I remember being told that at school. I used to smash them even if the poor sods were dead already. I checked some text I'd printed. Crucifragium, it's called. It's normally done to hasten death, but also to dissuade any onlookers from committing a similar heinous offence. In Todd's case being gay, said Lauren flatly. I shrugged. Well, that's what they want us to believe. Also, there's a possibility the killers were disturbed or were forced to make an early exit, hence Todd's knees being in one piece and the blood smears on the door casing and banister. I've combed all the police reports and, as yet, there are no witnesses. No one saw or heard anything suspicious or unusual. So who or what disturbed our killers isn't in Larry's files. That's because a lot of the flats are still empty, said Des. I nodded. Maybe. OK, Des, what do you have, other than a stupid grin on your face? Des turned down the corners of his mouth and shot me a look. Not a great deal, but the chances of keeping the crucifixion from the press for much longer is slim. I was told about it by a local yesterday, so some old hack is going to get hold of the story and this will go ballistic then. Des finished his brew. The flat where the murder took place, in fact most of the rental properties in the area are all owned by a firm called Lucas Estates. 
Now, this company are big time and have a group of so-called purchasing officers going around Ancote strong-arming all the existing residents, pushing them into selling up. Apparently there's a massive building project on offer and they want all the surrounding properties to go alongside the big high-rise developments. I ended up having a run-in with a couple of their employees. They were leaning on the landlady in the pub I was in. All smart suits and million-dollar smiles they were. But underneath it all, mean fuckers. I opened Google and typed in Lucas Estates. You are right there, big company. Operations worldwide, owned by one Khalid Kilinovich. Very rich guy. Anything else, Des? Only that Big Mitch was waiting for me as I left the pub this morning. They obviously have GPS trackers on their vehicles. Apparently, Cover is disappointed at our lack of intelligence sharing. Lauren turned. You need to read the rest of the file, Des. Catch up with what we already know about J.E. Blackman. He's a real good old boy, and Mitch is right there alongside him. Hence we left him at home to stew for the time being. Aye, I will. I'll, I'll read it the new, said Des sheepishly. I turned to Lauren and asked her the question that had been burning in my gut all morning. Want to talk us through last night with Larry? Late drinks, was it? She pushed her hair from her face and blew out her cheeks. I wasn't sure if it was embarrassment, guilt or my own paranoia. She locked eyes with me. Actually, Larry was very helpful, if you must know. Des rolled his eyes but sensibly stayed out of it. So, she began, Todd Blackman's arrest back in Louisville. When I pushed our Sergeant Willis for more information on that matter, she told me that Todd had been lifted for curb crawling. Not true. Turns out he was arrested for waving his willy at an undercover cop in a gent's urinal. Oops, said Des, pouring us all out more tea. Oops indeed, said Lauren. Well, the UK cops know about this incident back in the States and Larry put it to J.E. Blackman. Now, get this. J.E. says that although Todd had been somewhat confused sexually as a teen, by the time he came to the UK he'd been cured of any homosexual leanings. I couldn't stop myself laughing out loud. Cured? Lauren took a deep breath. Oh, yes. Cured was the word he used. J.E. sent Todd off to some religious retreat or whatever, where he was officially freed of his gayness. And, as Des says, if this shit hits the fan and Fleet Street do get a sniff of what is written on the walls in Ancourts, that will be the American's official stance on the matter. Head in the sand. Miracles happen. Todd Blackman was straight as a die. She cricked her neck and laid her hands flat on the table. There is no doubt in my mind that we have been employed in the hope that we sort out this job before J.E. has to start answering awkward questions about his son's sexuality. It's simple as far as the Americans are concerned. No arrests and no trials equals no publicity. Happy days. Wave the stars and stripes. J.E. is the president. I agreed. Yeah, I got that feeling from Carver when he was going on about sexual overtones and mistaken identity. It will be flat denials all round, and they'll be prepared for a damage limitation exercise if we aren't quick enough. Anything else? Yes, she said. Larry is being stood down from the lead detective role and replaced by a detective chief superintendent, Williams. He found out within an hour of his meeting with J.E., a patsy then, said Des, leafing through Lauren's file dutifully. Blackman or Carver must have influence with GMP. Obviously Larry wasn't helpful enough. Lauren nodded. Looks that way, but Williams has no murder squad experience. More likely just a friendly face who will feed information to the CIA and keep the fine detail from the press until we can do our job. I pointed at Lauren. Make this Williams bloke your priority for today. Find out about his background, what's his connection to black men, if any, that kind of thing. Will do, she said. When exactly are you meeting Cartwright? This afternoon, at the Crown Plaza by the airport. She managed a thin smile. Maybe the old sod can shine a light on who's behind this horror. I rubbed my face with my hands. Maybe. Des picked up the file again. I didn't get this at all. If all this crew wanted to do was out the wee boy Todd as being gay and discredit his dad, 
I'm sure there are easier ways than nailing them to a fucking wall. And another thing. He held up a crime scene shot. Why not just plaster their own version of these all over the internet and make Jay's life awkward from day one? Des had a good point. Lauren examined me. Rick, do you think the Americans already know who these guys are? Anything's possible. Do you trust any of them? We sat in silence for a moment before Lauren broke it. She held out a piece of notepaper. Larry gave me the name of Todd's best friend from college as part of the so-called deal we made. She's called Henrietta Duval. She's 19 and was on the same course as Todd. Poor little rich girl, I believe. Lives in the same block as our Todd did on the Keys. She's what the local kids refer to as a fag hag. Larry's term, not mine. She was also the last person to see Todd alive. Well, it's a start, I said. The cops will already have interviewed her, but you never know. Des, you get into her, will you? And I don't mean the way you got into the local landlady last night. Very funny, he snorted and snatched the note from Lauren's hand. For your information, she's called Maggie and she's very nice. Lauren gave Des a warm smile that told him everything was fine and he grinned like a naughty schoolboy. Something I'd not seen in many years and something that told me he was very keen on this Maggie. Despite the slight bruising to her face, Lauren looked beautiful. She seemed as in control as I'd ever seen her. No signs of the jittery shell of a girl that was airlifted from Ireland. Yet despite her confidence and prowess, there was something going on deep inside her. Something troubling, and I knew it was all to do with Larry. There was no doubt he was offering her that regular life. A life that I couldn't. Was she already tired of the violence and killing that was our world? Was losing JJ the final nail in the coffin? Larry could offer normality, a home, marriage, maybe even kids if it wasn't too late for her. Not yet. It was her choice and I felt helpless. I mentally shook myself and got on with a job in hand. Make sure you're both armed at all times from now on, I said. We go on lockdown mode from today. We know the Americans haven't been telling us the full tale and that their internal security is about as reliable as their cars. So we may not need to go searching for these boys. They may come knocking and I want us to be ready if they do. I tap my finger on one gruesome photograph. Also, I have no intention of being nailed to a fucking wall. Des Kogan's story before I left the lock-up, I took a shower, changed into jeans and a sweatshirt, pulled a Glock 19 from our stash, together with a spare mag, and found the keys to the BMW I'd bought to run us about during the Irish job. As Rick had now dropped into full-on stealth mode, we were off our own phones and back to the cheap pairs you go jobs with the GPS disabled. Henrietta Duval lived in a penthouse-style apartment that overlooked the water, it wasn't unlike Rick's old gaff. The one he'd had before Goldsmith and Co. sold it from under him, presuming him dead. Half a mill if you want one. The keys were no more than a fifteen-minute drive away, and despite the security clamp down, I drove with the windows down and the radio on. I'll be honest, meeting Maggie had given me a real spring in my step. Henrietta's gaff had underground parking and lots of security. Cameras were visible all around the exterior, and what appeared to be an ANPR system opened and closed the garage doors. I presumed that there would be cops guarding Todd's flat, but hoped Henrietta's would be easier to get access to, and I wouldn't have to answer any awkward questions from nosy policemen. The door entry system was similar to Rick's old place too, with a camera fitted at the top of the chrome plate full of buttons to show the resident who was doing the pressing. I pushed number 9 of 12... It took three goes before a sleepy voice answered. Who are you? Hello, Henrietta, I said in my poshest Glaswegian. My name is Cogan, Desmond Cogan. I'm from the university's pastoral care department. I just called for a quick chat. There was a pause as if the girl was considering the validity of my tale. That or she was thinking if she needed counselling in the first place. 
hoping the camera system wouldn't be good enough to pick out the fine detail. I held up an old ID I'd been issued with back in my time at Hereford. It dangled in a lanyard around my neck. Finally, there was a buzz and the entrance door clicked open. I knew Todd's flat had been number six, so avoided his landing. Just in case the cops were monitoring the elevator, I used the stairs rather than the lift to access the third floor. As I reached Henrietta's door, she opened it lazily and peered out. She wasn't just pretty, she was stunning, with long, fine, straight, white blonde hair that fell past her elbow as she cocked her head around the frame. "'You're not from a uni?' she announced in a cultured, confident southern accent. "'You're a villain!' I stood in the hallway, sinking into the plush carpet, assessing my options. I went for honesty as the best policy. No, Henrietta, I'm not from Salford University, but I'm not a villain either. I've been asked to assist the family in the investigation into Todd Blackman's murder. You're no cop either, she said, eyeing me suspiciously. And anyway, I've told them all I know, and the bloody Americans. I'm sure you've been very helpful, Henrietta, but... She looked me up and down. It's Henry. Everyone calls me Henry. And you still look dodgy to me. I smiled. I didn't suppose I'd let me in either, to be fair. You're Scottish, she pronounced, as if I wasn't aware of the fact myself. I am. She opened the door and turned. She wore nothing but the tiniest bra and pants and sashayed down her hall, beckoning me in with a crooked finger wagging behind her. I like Scottish people, she said. They're honest, in my opinion. They tend to be poor but reliable. I followed her swaying hips into a very nice minimalist lounge. Takeaway food cartons littered a coffee table alongside empty premixed cans of vodka and cola. Henry flopped onto a very expensive-looking sofa and tucked her legs underneath herself. "'Sorry about the mess,' she said, waving at the food cartons. "'Had a friend round last night for drinks. Didn't much feel like going out, what with Todd and everything.' "'Nasty business,' I offered. "'Hmm. He was a nice boy. I liked him.' She gave me a knowing look, and he didn't stare at my tits all the time. "'Maybe if you put some clothes on I could control myself,' I said flatly. Henry stood. Touché, Mr. Cogan. I'll just be a moment. A moment she was, and then she returned from an unseen room wearing a silk dressing gown that looked as expensive as a sofa. She resumed her position. Better? she asked. Conservative enough to stop your Scottish juices flowing? I knew her game. I reckon I can resist you, I said, smiling. You always so forthright, Miss Duval. She smiled back. I do try. So much better than pretense, don't you think, Mr. Cogan? Des, I said. Des, she repeated. So, Des, as you are most definitely not a policeman, does that make you a private detective? I suppose so, yeah. My colleagues and I have been asked to assist the family and the authorities in finding the culprits who muttered poor Todd. Henry rested her head on her shoulder and narrowed her eyes. I always find that kind of speak uncomfortable, Des. I mean, J.E. Blackman already has the full might of the Greater Manchester Force at his disposal, not to mention those rather creepy Americans in suits that call you ma'am all the time. She twirled a blonde lock with a solitary finger. I presume they belong to the Secret Service, the CIA, or FBI, maybe. They're a very knowledgeable young lady for one so young. Daddy is, well, was a diplomat. He's a civil servant these days. Advises the government on foreign policy, I believe. How long did you know, Todd? I asked, moving the conversation in the direction I wanted. Henry smiled. It was a genuine act, and I saw her eyes unfocus as her brain took her to another place for a second. I met Todd in this very building. We were both on our way to the registration event before the term even started. Serendipitous, really. He was beautiful, charming, intelligent, and talented. We became friends in an instant. Had he been straight, he would have been in my bed right now. So you knew he was gay right from the start? You would have needed to be deaf, dumb, and blind, Des. He was camp. 
He listened to Shirley Bassey, dressed like her on occasions. I see. Did I get it myself, like? It's just that J. Blackman... Had him cured, yes, Todd told me. We both had a good laugh at that one. You think Jay really believes his son was today? Daddy still believes I'm a virgin. I had to smile at that. They'd just spent a lot of time together. I mean, out at university. Oh, yes, we both had similar musical interests, apart from the bassy. I mean, seriously, we both loved the classics, opera and the West End musical scene. Todd was a genius in finding just the right pieces to slot into modern dance loops. I nodded, knowing the areas of their musical taste were well beyond me. I ploughed on. Did Todd ever confide in you about being, how can I say, smothered by his father? Oh, yes. I was aware that J.E. had him followed for a while. In fact, I helped him give them the slip on a few occasions. It was all very Tinker Taylor. Rather a turn on, actually. Ever any suspicious characters knocking about? Any creepy visitors? She shook her head. Not that I recall. And he never complained of being frightened or worried for his safety. Only back home, Todd came here to feel safe, Des. He couldn't be himself in the States. I mean, come on, the son of a southern state senator who cost dresses? I get your point, but he would have had to go home eventually. Another shake of the head? He was a genius in the studio. Just because he came from money didn't mean he wasn't talented. The money helped, obviously, but he'd planned to go to Paris as soon as he'd finished his degree. Todd never intended to return to Kentucky. She couldn't hide him away forever. She shrugged. Look at the Thatcher kids. Maggie kept their antics quiet most of the time. You are a shrewd young woman, I'll say that. I leaned forward. So I... When did you last see Todd alive? For the first time I saw Henry's facade fall. Her bottom lip trembled as silent tears fell and her voice broke. Three or four nights ago, she began to sob. Oh, my God, I don't even know what day this is. Sorry. It was the night he was killed, I suppose. We, well, we'd done a tour of the village as usual and ended up in a little fried chicken shop. It was late on, maybe 3.30. We bought burgers and were standing outside eating, talking, laughing the way we always were. Then Todd got a call. Not unusual at that time of the morning, to be fair. He seemed delighted with whoever had rung him, gave me a quick peck on the cheek and was off back towards the canal. A boyfriend. Todd had lots of those. He was a naughty boy. Promiscuous. He invented it. And you have no idea who called him? Henry shook her head and wiped away her tears. Think about that call, Henry. What did Todd say to the caller? I don't remember. I mean, we were both a bit tipsy. Um, maybe something about a flat? I don't know. Was Todd moving? Uh, yes, he had to be out of his place next month anyway. The owner's back in the country. The lease is up. Anything else, Henry? Please, thank. I waited. Look, she said, I'm not 100% here. Go on. Well, I got the impression the guy was older than Todd. He called him an old-fashioned name, you know, like uh, Alf or Bert. And did you tell this to the cops or the Americans? She shook her head again. I wrote my number on the top of a fast-food carton. You've been a big help, Henry. Thank you. If you think of anything else, give me a call, eh? I let myself out and wandered back down the stairs one floor. Gingerly, I stuck my head into the corridor. Todd's front door was crisscrossed with crime scene tip, but there was no sign of police activity. Forty-eight hours into the vicious murder of an American senator's son and no forensic team in place at his home address. The whole job stank worse than a Fleetwood whore's handbag. I trod the last two floors, my head full of questions, hit the electronic exit button to the left of the front door and marched into the sunshine. I'd taken two short steps when I heard the unmistakable sound of a pistol being cocked behind me. Split second later, the cold metal barrel of a handgun was resting against the back of my neck. Now, Mr. Cogan, 
His asking nicely doesn't appear to work. I figured that y'all need some gentle persuasion to play nice. We're going for a drive. I recognized the lazy drawl instantly. I didn't turn. Listen, Mitch, when I come from, you never point a gun at a man unless you intend to kill him. Oh, I will do that, sir, if I've a mind. Well, I suggest you put that piece shooter to yours away before I take it off you and beat some sense into you with it. This is a custom-made 4-4 Magnum, Mr. Cogan, and I have you at a disadvantage, sir. No, you don't. I don't. As I tripped down the stairs, I'd moved my own Glock 19 from the back of my waistband to the front. After all, you couldn't be too careful, eh? As I'd stepped into the open, my right hand rested on the grip covered by my sweatshirt. It had been a simple move to draw and push it between my skin and the garment pointing backward, directly into Mitch's gut. I waggled the gun to make my point. No, cowboy, this baby is cocked and ready, same as yours. So, what you want to do? Count to three, or maybe a quick draw contest out on the street over there. Gunfight at the OK Corral. I heard Mitch make his weapon safe. I did the same and turned. We need to talk, he said. Lauren North story. Rick had gone home to change for his meeting with Cartwright. Apparently he couldn't wear the suit he had at the lock-up as he'd worn it for the meeting with the old spy at Claridge's. That was bad form. Whatever Rick said about the ageing MI5 handler, I knew he held a grudging respect for him. I also knew that something had happened during their last meeting in London that had affected Rick badly. He'd returned very drunk and disappeared for a day or so afterward. Add to that, he'd never mentioned the matter again, so I just knew it was something major. It was just the way Mr Fuller worked. I sat at my laptop and trolled Greater Manchester's official website for any information on our sparkly new officer in charge of the Blackman murder, Detective Chief Superintendent Williams. Other than his smiling portrait picture, name and rank, I came up with a big fat zero. Certainly no rising star. Then I hit the usual search engines. There were two entries. The first was a picture of Williams from 2002. It had been lifted from a local paper. He was shaking the hand of a deputy chief constable who was presenting him with his long service and good conduct medal. I did the maths. Williams was due to retire this year. The second entry was a short piece from the Daily Mail. It read, A senior Greater Manchester police detective, DCS Alan Edward Williams, was injured yesterday after an argument with a neighbour turned violent. Williams, 49 years of Cheadle, had to be taken to a hospital by ambulance where he was treated for cuts and bruises to his face. Mr Williams had erected a wooden sign in his front garden depicting the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and his neighbour, Nazir Khan, had taken offence to it. Alan puts the sign in the garden every Easter, said Williams's dress designer wife, Fiona, 42 years, and I don't see why we should stop now just because we have a Muslim person for a neighbour. It was awful. Mr Khan came into our garden and started to pull down the sign. When Alan challenged him, he punched my husband in the face. Of course, Alan, being a good Christian, he did not retaliate. Alongside the article was a picture of Williams with a fat lip and his dutiful wife, arm in arm, holding the offending sign. Khan had been charged with assault. The mail, being the mail, made a big thing of the storm in a teacup and followed up the piece on its comments page. It towed the right-wing scaremongers line of how England was now overrun by violent immigrants determined to destroy British Christian values. The article only confirmed my suspicions. Williams was God Squad, type that knocked you out of bed on a Sunday morning to tell you what Jesus had done that week. Returning to the fat lip picture, I zoomed in on the offending placard. In the bottom left corner were three letters, surrounded by a halo motif. They read, SBA. I searched the usual engines and instantly found what I was looking for. SBA stood for the Southern Baptist Association, a Christian fellowship boasting 10 million members and the largest Christian denomination in the southern United States after the Catholic Church. 
A quick glance told me all I needed to know. The group was formed in Georgia by Baptists in the Deep South who split with Northern Baptists over the issue of slavery. Apparently, they didn't see why it was a problem. Five minutes more surfing and I discovered that SBA's website had a Donate To link. This took you straight to the totally wacko Golden Gate Ministry and the Reverend Billy Chapel's Heal the Sick Online page. Within five minutes, I had worked out how to self-diagnose my almost definitely fatal condition and discovered exactly what size donation it would take for the good reverend to heal me via the power of prayer. Via Microsoft, of course. The Reverend Chapel was, of course, the purveyor of $180 million in revenue for J.E. Blackman's Golden Gate charity last fiscal year. Bingo! We had a match. I printed out what I had, slipped the copies into our ever-thickening file and sat flicking through the pages. Information, lots and lots of it. Sleaze, maybe. Tax evasion, maybe. Weirdness, definitely. But nothing that took us any closer to finding Todd's killers. Des Cogan's story. I was kind of annoyed that Mitch had found me again. And again, it wouldn't take a genius to realise that one of us might turn up at Todd's building. On the other hand, I had a few questions of my own for the young Yank. I followed him to a coffee shop a block away and we sat outside in the sunshine. Me with a Fanta, mixed with a Dr Pepper. I nodded towards the American's bottle. Never could stand that stuff. He shrugged his shoulders. They had coming from a guy who drinks iron brew. I smiled and took a drink. Mitch did seem a nice fella, but from what Rick and Lauren had told me, he was firmly in the J. Blackman camp. You know why Rick has frozen you out, eh? I have a notion, yes, sir. You see, Mitch, when you get a wee job like this, you have to see the big picture. I mean, if you're gonna slaughter the guys that murdered the young boy Todd, you have to be sure you have the right folk in the first place. You can't have your personal beliefs clouding your judgment. I could see he was fighting with himself inside. I am kind of angry with myself for the things I said to your folks yesterday. I just lost my ways all. Let my mouth run. See, I was brought up with the church, Mr. Cogan, just like thousands of other poor white kids in the South. We had nothing, and there was nothing coming our way either. The only way out of that trailer was the core. I poured more orange over the ice in my glass. You're preaching to the converted here, Mitch. You think life was any different for me, eh? Two adults and seven kids in a house made for four with damp up the wall and rats in the yard. Oh, hey, we had religion, all right. All good Catholics we were. Couldn't afford meat for the table, but there was always money for the collection plate in the chapel on a Sunday, eh? The army was my escape too, pal. Couldn't wait to get away. Three square meals a day, my own bed to sleep in, wages every month. But I'm not like you, Mr. Cogan. I've not lost my religion. I still have the Lord in my heart, and I don't see the church as a bad thing. I see it as a blessing. I've not lost my religion, son. You don't lose Catholicism like spit change down the sofa. You may misplace it every now and again, but it's always there to throw you a big slice of guilt once in a while. I leaned forward and fixed on the boy's face. Tell me this much. Just like the Vatican in Rome. Do you never wonder where all the money goes, son? Do you never think what Golden Gay and the Reverend Billy Chapel do with that $180 million a year they take from the poor saps living in mobile homes in Shetsville, Tennessee? The boy raised his hands in frustration. Of course I do, Mr. Cogan. I'm a religious man. I read my Bible, but that don't make me no fool. I know there's some wrongdoing, but there's a lot of good work going on, too. He scratched his head, more from frustration than need. And I know I upset Mr. Fuller and Ms. North when I said about the mosques and all, but I stand by that. I fought in Iraq, Mr. Cogan. I saw what the Arabs think of us and what they do to us, given the chance. 
so I don't think it unreasonable that I hold the opinion I do on not encouraging them on American soil. He pointed. You'll fight under any flag, Mr. Kogan, for anyone, so long as they pay the price. Me, I can only ever fight for the Lord and the United States of America. If that makes me a racist or a bigot, then that's what I am. I shook my head. Listen, Matt, having a belief is all well and good. You can believe what you want. You can tell me you consider homosexuality a sin, abortion is murder. There is only one true Lord Jesus Christ. You can tell me all those things. It didn't even make you wrong, pal. But, but if you treat people different because they don't believe what you do, then you have an issue. And you'll have a major one with our weak team unless you learn to keep your mouth shut. He looked at me for the longest time. Finally, he nodded. Ah, take your point, sir. I shall keep my opinions to myself in future. I drain my glass. In that case, I think we should adjourn to the Prince of Wales Tavern, get a proper drink, and you can explain why your boys didn't tell us you'd already spoken to the very delightful Henrietta Duval. We sat at a corner table. Maggie acknowledged me, but no more than you'd expect as a returning customer. I got the impression that she was a lady who didn't like to advertise her private life. That suited me fine. Old George was in his usual spot and I sent him a half over. He waved his gratitude and went back to his racing post. Mitch refused all alcohol, so I dropped a bottle of Budweiser in front of him just to loosen him up a tad. Never trust a man who doesn't drink, I said. He shook his head and eventually took a sip. You guys don't care for rules, do you? Some rules are there to be broken, I said. You don't care much for me either, do you, Mr. Cogan? I sat back in my seat and took in Mitch Collins. He was indeed a big man, not classically handsome, but you could see why the girls would favour him. It was obvious to me he'd been there and done it. He didn't need to talk about it and didn't need to brag. I like that, but he had issues, and I needed to know which side of the fence he'd fall when the shit hit the fan. Does Jay Blackman pay you money? I asked. Eyes locked on the boy. He does not. Do the FBI pay you money? Not directly, sir, no. So who does pick up your check? He shrugged. Okay, so why are you here? Why did you get drafted in for this one? Mitch took a long drink from his bottle, considered keeping up his pretense, and decided against it. I was working on another matter in Germany, Hamburg, to be precise. The boys in Quantico had received information about an Al-Qaeda cell working in the city. They believed the group may have been planning to attack U.S. interests still present on German soil. When the news of Todd's murder broke, the guys in D.C. figured that as I had mostly completed my task, and as I was already in close proximity, they may as well utilize my talents. And what exactly are your talents, Mitch? He put down his bud. Basically, I'm here in case you guys fuck up. Meaning? He shrugged those big shoulders again. Meaning if your team ID the culprits, but you don't, don't finish the job. Well, I do the rest. You slaughter the killers? It's what I do, sir. I nodded. Turned to Maggie and waved us in another round. I could grow to like you, pal, I said. Rick Fuller's story. Cartwright was on the 12.45pm British Airways flight from London City. It was late. I stood in the arrivals hall along with a plethora of unwashed taxi drivers and gushing relatives. I swear if any of them had spilled their fucking Mac shakes or whatever fast food they were consuming on my new suit, I would joyfully have slotted them. I ain't waiting, Rooms. No, I ain't waiting. Finally, Cartwright appeared carrying his solitary briefcase. He shuffled more than strode, but it would be a foolish man to think him weak. As always, he wore a handmade suit, Savile Row, 
A tailored shirt and superb shoes that I suspected were Italian, but never had the opportunity or nerve to ask. He walked by me as if I didn't exist. Get me out of this hellhole, he said from the corner of his mouth. The Crown Plaza provided a shuttle service to and from the terminal, but it consisted of three Ford Transit minibuses. Therefore, even though it was barely five minutes away, I'd booked as a limo. A Jaguar. Cartwright sat and rubbed the leather seats with his palm. Owned by foreigners these days, you know. Aren't we all? The old spy turned to me, his eyes as sharp as knives. Don't believe all you hear, Fuller. Heaven forbid, I offered. Heaven indeed, he countered. The plaza was a typical airport hotel, modern, big and close to all the terminals. It was popular with the travelling business person, offering convenience and relative comfort at a sensible price. It was one of the better establishments scattered around Manchester's ringway either way. Cartwright was instantly unimpressed. As we stepped through the revolving glass doors in a reception, he pulled his face. Hardly the Ritz, is it, Richard? He said. You picked it. Only because I couldn't bear the thought of travelling to the Midland in this heat. He gestured towards the queuing would-be residents waiting to be booked into their accommodation. The usual mix of holiday makers, business travellers and cabin crew on stopovers stood patiently in line as the reception staff took their details and allocated their rooms. However, I'm beginning to think I've made a grave error of judgment, Richard. I suspected he had other reasons for not booking his preferred hotel in town, but kept my counsel. Surprisingly, we turned left, and I followed him into a corridor and through a heavy door which led us into a sprawling Irish steam pub. Rough sawn timber tables and chairs and a wooden floor greeted us. I didn't have you down as a Guinness drinker, Cartwright, I said as we made the bar. The old spy dropped his briefcase at his immaculately clad feet and rubbed the back of his neck with a liver-spotted hand. Richard, he said, his voice full of weariness. One of the things you learn when you travel extensively, particularly on the meagre budget that Her Majesty provides, is that all these, he waved an arm, places are the same. Your food comes out of a bag, and the so-called chef that empties it onto your plate is fucking Romanian. However, he gestured towards a tall, thin guy with a bold head behind the bar. Joseph here is a genuine Dubliner. He's held the reins of this establishment since the place opened, and behind this facade of a bar is the only decent working kitchen in the hotel. Joseph strode over and offered his hand. He'd obviously decided to make up for his lack of hair by nurturing an unruly full set that was wider than the top of his narrow head. Birds could have nested in the fucking thing. He managed to smile, not that he could see his teeth. Mr Cartwright, sir, very good to see you again. Will you be having some lunch with us? We will, said Cartwright, taking his hand and shaking vigorously. That's marvellous, sir, gushed the furry-faced barman. I'll bring your menu over. Minutes later, we sat in a quiet corner, sipping stout and waiting for two portions of Irish stew and soda bread. As it was pushing 28 degrees outside, I questioned the old spy's decision. Oddly, some affair, I mused. Cartwright placed his glass carefully on the table. Summer, spring, autumn or winter, this is the best Irish stew you will eat this side of the water, Richard. You see, the dish is made the night before serving. Joseph buys the ingredients from the local market early morning and brings them into work himself. The chef then prepares them and they are cooked very slowly, all day until the bar closes. Then, and this is the secret... It is left to cool overnight on the stove before being warmed again the next day for service. Wonderful. I took a drink. Thanks for the cookery tip. And I'd rather know why you loaned us to the CIA. Cartwright pulled his face again. Don't be so naive, Richard. Why on earth would we do that? So you didn't sanction us being lifted from outside the thirsty scholar, spoiled J.A.'s wake and have us imprisoned at Menwith Hill? I prodded the table to make my point. Where, I might add, we had to deal with John Wayne and his posse of evangelical zealots. 
Even though Cartwright could hear the irritation in my voice, he ignored it. The old git almost smiled, but managed to hide his mirth. Well, of course we did. I mean, we can't have the Yanks running about the country kidnapping our operatives without permission, can we? So, you did loan us? No, Richard, you are most definitely working for us. But the Americans are paying us. Cartwright actually broke into a beam. Why spend our budget when we can spend theirs? Anyway, you wouldn't have taken the job otherwise, would you? No. I told them as much. I even suggested the fee. A a cool million, isn't it? But we're working for you. Of course. And the Yanks know this? You're being naive again. I threw myself back in my seat in frustration. You are infuriating Cartwright. Stew's here, he said. I had to admit the food was excellent. We ate in silence until both plates were clean and a second stout ordered. Cartwright wiped his mouth with a napkin and sat back in his chair, a satisfied look on his face. This murder is a terrible business, I know. It's all about money and power, Richard. I'll try to keep things simple for you, and hopefully you can leave here with a clear picture of what you need to do next. I waited. Cartwright watched the waiter deliver the two dark pints, turn and leave us. We have recently become aware, he began, that a criminal gang has been working in the UK calling themselves Young Fack. Never heard of them. And that is just how they and their leader like it. Young Fack have worked almost exclusively in the Middle East for many years. Most recently they have kept their operations firmly across the Atlantic in the States. He waved a dismissive hand. With the odd venture into Eastern Europe... Anyway, now, unfortunately, they are here. Who's their leader? We'll come to that, Richard. First, let's talk about Khalid Kulinovich, as he employs the gang almost exclusively. I sat up at that. I've heard of him. He owns Lucas Estates. Well done, Richard. I see you've been doing your homework. Kulinovich was born in Croatia. He owns several large conglomerates. Last time I looked, he was number 17 in the Forbes rich list. So why does he need a criminal gang? Why do we need you, Richard? To do your dirty work. So you answer your own question. But Tom Blackman was found in a flat owned by Lucas Estates, so this gang aren't too clever, are they? That was unsurprising, Richard. Young Fack are as ruthless as any organised crime gang we have come across since the Sicilian... Both the venue and method of Todd's death are simply intended to send J.E. Blackman a very stark message. They want to scare him. You don't scare a man like J.E. Blackman. He's a bully and a warmonger. No, Kulinovich wants him ruined, personally, politically and financially, and he is using young fact to do it. The horrific murder scene and the sensationalist method are all designed to tell Blackman his days are numbered. Why does he hate Blackman so much? It's the story of Cain and Abel, Richard. Rich man, poor man. You see, Kulinovich is a Muslim Croat. In 1997, at age 19, he was granted refugee status by the USA. His parents had been the victims of the ethnic cleansing in the former Yugoslavia. He had nothing and no one. Rags to riches, the American dream, eh? Indeed, Richard. He is infamous amongst the immigrant population in the States. Particularly the South Asians, Arabs, African Americans, and Muslims in general. He is a poster boy, a self made multimillionaire before his thirtieth birthday, a fortune that he has made in a variety of ways, some legal, some not, and for the last three years or so, with the help of Young Fack. Tartrite leans in. With their support, Kulonovich is both powerful and extremely dangerous. I had an operative stationed in Kabul up until late last year. He believed that one of Kulonovich's subsidiaries were supplying the Taliban with weapons via Pakistan in return for heroin to be shipped to the U.S. We lost contact with our chap in December, even sent a team of your pals out to find him, but they came back empty-handed. I see. Now, J.E. Blackman is the polar opposite. Born into wealth, anti-Muslim, anti-immigration, commanded troops in Iraq and the Sudan— 
a racist bigot without question, a religious fanatic with the morals of a heathen and an annual income of six million dollars. If Kulinovich is popular with the immigrants, J. E. Blackman is equally admired by rich and poor whites alike. Add together the swathe of evangelicals and the rest of the Bible Belt who believe that Johnny Foreign has taken their jobs and their welfare checks, and his popularity makes him a presidential favourite. For some ungodly reason, they believe that J.E. is their saviour. Oh, I know. I've already had the speech from Mitch Collins, our friendly FBI guy. Cartwright smiled again and shook his head. Collins isn't FBI, Richard. His ex-Marine Corps with twenty-seven kills to his name, nine of those in unarmed combat. The Americans dust him off now and again, put him in a nice suit and give him a title. Very handy young chap to have around, actually. What are they calling him this time? Drugs and alcohol agency, I think. He's neither. He's insurance. You mean if we miss? Exactly. I shrugged. I had bigger things to worry about than Mitch. So, why is Todd Blackman dead? The Louisville Mosque Project. The one that Blackman campaigned to block. One and the same, Richard. J.E. fought his nomination campaign on the issue and won. The mosque will not be built with him as senator, and if he becomes president, well... All right, Kulanovich is Muslim, but it seems a Bit of a stretch to believe he's had Todd Blackman crucified because one mosque didn't get plenty permission. Cartwright finished his stout. Time for a cheeky gin tea, he said, waving over the waiter. Not for me, Cartwright. The last time we started that game, I had to leave my car in London for a week. As you wish, just for me, then. Anyway, you are correct. Kodanovic is a Muslim, but not fanatical. Even the weapons to the Taliban business had nothing to do with his politics or religion. He wanted the heroin and the money it brought him, simple as that. For him, this whole business is about being on top, besting Blackman. Cartwright rested his elbows on the table and linked his fingers. You see, the Louisville Mosque was no small affair. Just as here in the UK, Kentucky has seen many of its churches and religious buildings fall empty and some turned into mosques. This was becoming a political hot potato for Blackman. Demands from the Bible Belt faithful to halt the progress of Islam were growing louder by the day. Louisville development was huge and would have dominated the skyline in the district. It was to be built by Lucas Estates at a cost of $250 million. Had it been constructed, Kulinovich would have been a hero amongst the minority groups in the state. But Blackman blocked that deal and his success in hindering the project gave him the nomination and lost the Croatian all those dollars and the hero status. Ah. Oh, yes. Big bucks. But just as important to these folk with monopoly money, it was one nil to Blackman. Cartwright sipped his gin and licked his lips approvingly. Since then, Kulinovic has done everything in his power to thwart Blackman at every juncture. His biggest battle has been the Ancoats development. The regeneration of that area is going to be worth a billion dollars when completed, with an ongoing rental income of twenty million per annum. It was Blackman's construction company, Vineco, who first bid for the contract to build the two huge towers there. But for the last year or so, Lucas Estates have been buying every brick around the development site and fully intend to beat Vineco to the punch this time. As I understand it, the council will make a decision on the tenders within the month. The spy spun ice around his near-empty drink. When Kulinovich found out that Todd Blackman was to travel to Manchester, the opportunity to embarrass and hurt J.E. was too good to miss. So he sent a number of young frack operatives to the U.K. to find the boy and murder him. You can imagine what the U.S. press will do to Blackman once Todd's sexual preferences come out. And J.E. won't get any favours from Manchester's rather left-leaning council once he starts talking of having his son cured of homosexuality, either. I finish my style. So, why have we not heard of this young fat crew before, then? 
probably because they have avoided the UK until now, but also because of the way the organisation is run. You see, their operatives are pulled from all corners of the disgruntled Muslim world, and each recruit must hail from an extremely poor background. Why? Because young Vac are what you would probably call old school. Their operatives are forbidden from using computers or mobile phones. They've never had a bank account, passport or driving licence, never been fingerprinted or had dental work. They are allowed just one tattoo, that of a single mast with a billowed sail. You see, Yungfak is the Arabic word for wind. Cartwright drained his gin. They employ a similar system to the one our spies used during the Cold War. A new operative will be given a place to visit at a set time each day. It may be a week or a month, but one day his handler will be there and brief him face to face, and he will be brought into the fold. They use dead letter boxes to move weapons, ammunition, and cash around. The name each are known by will have been given to them by the gang. As the gang's name suggests, they are as easy to identify and catch as the wind itself. So... How do they move about without passports? Richard, the chap who polishes my Bentley every Sunday doesn't have a genuine fucking passport. Fair enough. How come our American chums didn't come up with this information when they took us on our little jaunt to Yorkshire? Cartwright looks suddenly sheepish. The Americans rightly believe that Todd has been killed by an organised criminal gang, and that gang is opposed to J. Blackman becoming president. Surely Blackman must suspect that Kulanovich is behind this? Most definitely. But not Jungfak? No. I sat back and examined our MI5 handler. The Yanks don't know anything about this crew, do they? The old spy shrugged his shoulders and waved for another gin. I lay my hands on the table. OK, so why do we know and they don't? Cartwright locked eyes with me. Eyes that had seen spies come and go, wars won and lost, presidents inaugurated and assassinated. Goldsmith, he said, knocking the wind from my own sails. I sat speechless. I'd had the feeling that Goldsmith would rear his ugly head eventually. Cartwright couldn't hide his irritation. I told you he was important to us, didn't I? I told you about big pictures, but you wouldn't listen. Goldsmith informed us of the existence of the gang, its formation, its leader and rank structure. He even gave us a young fac operative to interrogate. Cartwright curled his lip in disdain. That was about a month before you visited him in Albania and blew him to bits. Why would he do that? Because he was mine, Richard. I had him where I wanted him. Until he started slotting innocent people and dropping you in the shit. Until you stuck your nose in. Well, he won't be giving you anything else, will he? Quite. We sat in silence for a moment until both our tempers subsided. And just how did Goldsmith know of this young fact, then? I asked. Cartwright waited for the guy who delivered his drink to move out of earshot. As you know, Goldsmith was in bed with the Albanian Mafia, who were fast becoming the most powerful criminal enterprise in the United States. Goldsmith and his father had dozens of contacts across the Atlantic, and that information was gold dust to the Albanians. They not only trusted Goldsmith, but held him up as some kind of godfather. It was the USA's arm of the Albanian Mafia that first discovered the existence of young Fack. As direct competition in the drugs and arms business, this new Middle Eastern gang instantly became their enemy. They shared that information with Goldsmith. Now, as you must have gleaned from your recent visit, the north of Albania is both poor and boasts a large Muslim population, a ripe breeding ground for young fac. The operative in question had been selected by the gang's recruiters and taken to a training camp in the Ukraine. Alas, when he returned to his homeland, he fell foul of the human condition. Meaning he opened his mouth. Indeed, and as his destination was to join young Vac in the UK, Goldsmith tipped us the wink, so to speak. We picked the chap up ten days later right here in Manchester. And where is he now? He died during interrogation. It happens. 
It does, but not before he gave us precious information about an upcoming plan to kill an American student. Of course, he couldn't give details, the who, the when, the where, the how. But when Todd Blackman was murdered in the manner he was, well, there was only ever one suspect. Of course, both the Americans and J. Blackman were convinced Skulanovich had sent some kind of Muslim hit squad to the UK to do the job. Not far off the mark. True, but as we were never going to admit to the CIA that Goldsmith had risen from the grave and passed on the information about young Fack, we could hardly share the fact of their existence, could we? So I suggested you chaps for the task. He took a long drink and tipped his glass in my direction. Besides, Richard, you and I have other vested interests in the gang and its leader. Cartwright shuffled uncomfortably in his seat. Now, a word of warning. Once you start sniffing around this lot, once you rattle their cage, they won't sit back or go to ground. They will come out fighting. So you will need all your team, including Mitch Collins. Bring him into the fold, so to speak. He may be a little on the pious side, but out of all that lot you can trust him. And as I said, he is a useful chap. Once Mitch finds out about young Fack, he'll inform Carver. Maybe, maybe not. Meaning? The old boy just shrugged and necked his gin. I shook my head. Nothing is ever straightforward with you, Cartwright. No wonder you told the Yanks this job would cost a million dollars. He smoothed down his tie. The fee merely tripped off my tongue, Richard. It's a nice round number, I admit. But what did you mean by other vested interests? Ah, he said somewhat wearily. Now we come to the crux of the matter. The real reason we are both sitting here together again. The elderly spy rummaged in his briefcase and pulled out a thin file. He had a ten-by-eight black-and-white picture stapled to the front. Without taking his eyes from mine, he slid it across the table towards me. I looked down at the image and thought my head would explode. It was a picture of three people. Abdullah al-Mufti was standing next to his nine-year-old son, the boy our patrol had seen on his doorstep in Tiji all those years ago. Both held AK-47s. They stood proudly next to a telegraph pole. Nailed to that pole by his wrists, crossed above his head, was Frankie Green. His gut slit open, his entrails grotesquely dangling from his torso. Cartwright was matter-of-fact. That picture came through on Reuters a few days after you returned from Tiji. My hand shook. Why well, show me this, after all this time? Would showing it to you back then have made you feel better? I shook my head, unable to take my eyes from Frankie's disfigured body. I show it to you now because Al Mufti is the leader of Young Fack. He let that snippet sink in, then tapped the table with a manicured nail. After you destroyed his weapons dump and killed more than two thirds of his men, he left Libya and moved to the Lebanon, the birthplace of his wife. Over the next ten years, he regrew his arms business, showing his lack of respect for any religion or boundary, and sold weapons to the highest bidder across the Middle East. In 1999, the Americans located him due to his daughter, Aida, sending pictures across the Internet. The U.S. ordered an airstrike on his house. His wife and daughter were killed. Abdullah and his son, Sadiq, the boy in that picture, survived. As a result of Goldsmith's information, we now know that two years later, Al-Mufti formed the bare bones of young Fak in the mountains of Afghanistan. He swore he and his men would never use digital devices of any kind ever again. Hence the way young Fak operate today. Al-Mufti underwent reconstructive surgery and entered the USA via Mexico in 2003. Young Fack have been the weapon of choice for Khalid Kulinovich and his business empire since 2004. They are his black market. Drugs, arms, and murder are their business. When Kulinovich discovered that Todd Blackman was destined for the UK, 
Al-Mufti sent his only son, Siddiq, to form a cell of young Fakir, murder the boy and ensure that Lucas' estates got that contract in Ancoats. Of course, it would be too much to hope for that when those tasks are completed they would go home. But no, now young Fak have arrived, Al-Mufti will grow his criminal empire in the UK, starting right here in Manchester. I would suggest you have a chat with some of your old contacts and see if a new large-scale supplier has reared its head. Cartwright took back the file, placed it in his case and handed me a memory stick. The transcripts of the interrogation before the chap had expired. They may be of some help. Oh, and a copy of that picture. I thought that Mr. Cogan may want to see what our Mufti did to your colleague for himself. It seems the crucifixion ritual still runs in the family. Cartwright bared his teeth, unable to conceal his own anger. Look, Fuller, I didn't want the Americans to have our Mufti, and I certainly didn't think you would either. Knowing you as I do, I considered you might like to finish the job you started back in 1987. Starting with the boy, Siddiq. I couldn't disguise my venom. Oh, you are right there, Cartwright. The spy regained his composure and stood. Now, Fuller, can you call me a limo that is made in England? If I spend too much time north of Watford, I get dizzy. He tapped my arm. Be a good chap. Get on with the job. But don't forget our people in Whitehall need J.E. Blackman nominated. He's our man, so keep the publicity to a minimum. I was flabbergasted. But he's a buffoon. You said as much yourself. He's a bigger, a racist. Eh? Exactly, Richard. And no one will vote for him north of Texas. He hasn't a hope. Something suddenly dawned on me. Meaning our real man is actually a woman. The Democrat. Cartwright nodded and smiled again. I'll make a spy of you yet, he said. Des Cogan's story. I spent a good hour talking with Mitch Collins about his life, his upbringing, his family, the core. He seemed a good bloke to me. You see, I understood what it was like to be brought up in a religious household, being dragged along to chapel every weekend, living in a street where everyone was the same faith and supported the same football team. Eventually it forms part of you, and even though you may become disillusioned with it, he will never completely let it go. My dad's view on homosexuality, abortion and the like were no different from Big Mitch's. I would have loved to have seen his or any of my brother's faces if I'd turned up wearing a Shirley Bassey frock, I'll tell you. Mitch had refused a second bud and sat with a coke. I met his eyes. So, pal, cards on the table. How come you lot didn't tell us about Henrietta Duval? Why not tell us you'd already spoken to her? You could have saved us some time. We're really on the clock on this wee job, you know. Mitch looked down into his glass. I realised that all too well, Mr. Cogan. But Henrietta believed Todd to be gay. Our instructions were to secrete any testimony that suggested Todd still suffered that condition. Who says? The DC. You mean Jay Blackman? Mitch shrugged. I made an executive decision. Todd was crucified because of his condition, I said flatly. Mitch's eyes widened. I nodded. Oh, aye, nailed to a makeshift cross in that flat we passed earlier. All the hallmarks of a historical ritual slit to the groin, staff pushed inside the wound. They used his blood to paint the cross on the wall and write other messages. My lord in heaven... Aye, they wrote the word homosexual across his chest in Arabic and quoted the Koran. I reckon those boys thought Todd may be a wee bit on the gay side too, eh? Mitch was incredulous. I could see the venom rise inside him. I had no idea what had happened to the young Marine during his tours of the Middle East, but it was obvious there was no love lost between the American and the Muslims. He had the same look about him that my eldest brother had every time he saw a fella wearing a ranger's top. We'd figure it may be a goddamn Muslim group involved. He spat. 
And as we are laying cards on tables, Mr. Kogan, we also considered it may have something to do with a guy called Kulinovich. He owns Lucas Estates. I turned down the corners of my mouth. Aye, and that wee snippet would have been good to know yesterday too, pal. Anyway, whoever killed Todd intends to ruin J. Blackman politically, and as I heard the rumour about Todd's crucifixion yesterday in this very boozer, he won't be long before the press get hold of it. Mitch shook his head. And that can't happen. I pointed. What can't happen is you guys keeping any more information back from our team. If you want us to slot these fuckers, we're going to need all the help we can get. Mitch nodded sheepishly. Ah, I think we're on the same page there, sir. Aye, well, we'll see about that, eh? Right, as we finally seem to be telling each other the truth, I'm going to take you to our wee lock-up. You got to carry on. In my car. Okay, jump in with me and we'll go get it. Just one thing, though, Mitch. Well, I'm listening. If Carver's boys ever rock up at the front of this place I'm about to take you, I'll know where it came from and I'll slot you myself. Mitch just gave me a look and followed me to the door. I acknowledged Maggie with a nod as I left and wondered when I may see her next. This was going to get very messy very quickly. My phone buzzed in my pocket. Where are you? asked Rick curtly. Please don't say the fucking pub. I stood on the footpath outside the prince next to Mitch and told the truth. No, I'm not. Good. We'll get hold of our American Bible basher and fetch him to the lockup. We've orders to bring him into the fold. We're going to need all the hired hands we can get. I didn't care for the sound of that, but was pleased that great minds thought alike. We jumped into the beamer and drove around to the keys where Mitch had left his motor. He picked up a day sack from the boot, rummaged around a little more and then pulled out a long, heavy-looking case. He strode back to my car and dropped both on the back seat. I looked at him questioningly. What's in there? My buddy. Buddy? Well, that's what the Japs call it. A Howard Type 89. I don't know it. Japanese assault rifle, used by the JGSDF. Mine has a target and laser fitted. It's pretty cool, really light. So why is the case so heavy? That will be the grenade, sir. I checked my rear mirror and we were away. I'm not sure what bothers me more, Mitch. The fact that you call me fucking sir all the time or that you have grenades in your case. He turned in his seat. Mr. Cogan, I've fought in some pretty shitty places and I've done some pretty shitty jobs. Now, I know I'm younger than you and all, but in my limited experience, it's always better to be safe than sorry. So, the Type 89 there launches 06s, and I happen to have a number with me, just in case. The Type 06 is a heat-seeking anti-tank weapon, Mitch. That is correct, sir. I don't see any tanks at home, Mitch. The American checked his door mirror. But I do see a big black sedan on our tail. That will be a saloon, Mitch. Isn't that a place to buy a drink? I floored the beamer. We'll discuss this later, Polly. Let's see how serious this boy is. We passed the travel lodge and did a hard right into Oldfield Road. The BMW stick into the road like shite to a blanket. Mitch pulled on his seatbelt. Did the army teach you to drive, Mr. Cogan? I shook my head and threw the car left into Old Soul Lane, a wee road that would lead us towards the A-57 and open roads. No, son, the cops, they teach all the regiment boys. Well, the guys behind are struggling to keep up, so they did a good job. I checked the mirror and the big black mark was a little further back, but by the time we reached the slip road, he'd got his shit together and was right up my ass. We got caught on the near side of two HGVs as we entered the A-57, and I had to anchor on, the ABS on the beamer rattling away under my foot, tire smoke pouring from all four wheels. The Merc driver behind either didn't quite react quickly enough or he intentionally slammed into our rear, slewing us sideways. Mitch seemed to have had enough, undid his belt, drew his 4-4 and swivelled in his seat. 
whilst we were obscured from the rest of the traffic by the two forty tonners, and I fought to straighten the car, which took his opportunity and put a couple of rounds into the screen of our tail. You hit them, I shouted over the roar of the two wagons. No, sir, still two up. The American just got his last word out when our rear screen shattered and we began to take small calibre automatic fire. We both ducked instinctively and I swung the BMW out in front of the lead HGV, finding cover but chopping the wagon up badly. The driver leaned on his horn in protest and I saw plumes of blue pour from his trailer wheels as he locked up. At least we had some clear road ahead and once again I floored that car. The beamer responding as it should, howling like a cat on heat as the rev counter hit the red line. I looked behind again. The Merc was a couple of hundred yards behind, but still there. We needed to get into the city proper, find some of the quiet back streets around the university, where we could either lose our tail or take the fuckers on away from the public eye. I pulled off the motorway onto Cambridge Street, then took another sharp turn into Booth Street, only to find the road blocked by a delivery van. The Merc was only seconds behind and we had nowhere to go. Mitch leaned over his seat, opened his case and lifted out the Hauer Type 89. I'd never even seen the Jap weapon before. It was some piece of kit, I'll tell you. It doesn't even need a launching attachment to deliver a grenade, because it was designed specifically for riflemen. The O6 just slipped straight onto the muzzle in a split second. The Yank slotted one into place and stepped into the street, calm as you like. I couldn't believe my eyes. Mitch, don't tell me you're going to... As the Merc turned the corner, the driver saw what was coming and hit the brakes. I heard a whooshing sound and Mitch sent the O6 on its way. The front passenger rolled out of his door and hit the deck hard, scrambling clear just as a heat-seeking grenade found its target. The driver wasn't so lucky. The Merc went up like a Roman candle. I reckon the good folk of Manchester must have thought the PIRA were back in the fucking Arndale. Mitch, the epitome of cool, slipped the assault rifle back in his case, lifted it from the seat along with his day sack and slammed the door shut. The passenger was off and running. The American looked at me quizzically. Well, I can't chase him carrying these things, Mr. Colgan. I shook my head and set off after our one remaining pursuer. Fire that beamer, I shouted as Mitch sprinted off. You are fucking nuts, pal. The guy I was chasing looked to be in his thirties, fair-haired, well over six feet, and belt with it. However, being we has its advantages in a chase. I have a lot less to carry. That and my man had obviously hurt himself debunking the murk and was favouring his right leg. I was within twenty yards of him when he darted left down a narrow alleyway. I powered around the corner after him. I should have had a look-see first. He was leaning back against the wall, just out of sight, and caught me with a chopping blow grazing my cheek. I'd seen it coming at the last second and managed to lean away so that my shoulder took most of the impact. It was a good job I'd had my wits about me too, as I felt like I'd been hit with a lump hammer rather than a bare fist. My nerve ending sent enough pain signals down my arm to make me think I was having a heart attack. He was fast for such a big bloke, and instantly swung a second low punch towards my guts. Despite the pain, I pushed both my arms downwards, crossing them at the wrists to block the blow. I made contact, pushing his fist away from its intended target. I grabbed hold of his wrist, stepped to my left and twisted his arm in the direction it wasn't meant to go. I hadn't the bulk to drag him down, but it gave me a split second to lift my right leg and rake my heel down his shin. He cried out as my foot landed on top of his with a nasty crunch, and I made his day by smashing my forehead into his nose in typical Glasgow fashion. He staggered, but was far from beaten. As he wiped blood from his face, I got my first good look at him. He was Russian, or at least from the former state. Kazakh, maybe. He came at me again. I parried one, two, three short, sharp blows aimed at my head, stepping away each time. The speed and the ferocity of his attack confirmed he was no ordinary slugger. I knew that I needed to sort this guy, or he was going to put me in hospital at best. And now, either side of your neck is a main artery that feeds the brain. 
When you've been to the pictures to watch your favourite wee hero smash the baddies to bits, you'll have seen folks rendered unconscious by what is known as a sleeper hold, where the assailant squeezes his opponent around the neck, temporarily cutting off the flow of blood to the old grey matter. No good here, like. If I'd tried to squeeze this fucker's neck, he would have thrown me around the alley like a terrier with a rat. However, what you probably don't know is that any short, sharp loss of feed causes all kinds of issues to your bones. It puts you on your ass for a start, and it doesn't matter if you're 5-2 or, as in our Russian pal's case, 6-2. I've always found the blow best delivered by the forearm. Step forward, lock the elbow, and in one swift sweep, aim to connect your radius and ulna an inch or two just below your target's ear. As he came at me for the fourth time... I caught him just peachy. His legs gave way instantly, and there was a rather nasty crack as he hit the cobbles. The boy was on his hands and knees, trying to get his shit together, blood dripping from a cut somewhere on his scalp. I smashed the heel of my boot into his temple, and he was really struggling. Scarily, he shook his head and roared like a fucking lion. I couldn't believe he was going to get up and start again. Well, he was... He wasn't going to play fair. His hand went inside his jacket and I saw the glint of an SLP. Fuck that. I drew my Glock, steady myself and put a round in his forehead. The boy fell back, eyes open. Stepping in close, I checked his clothes for any ID but found nothing. He carried a small amount of cash, no phone, no cards. His only identifying mark was a small tattoo on his neck that looked like the mast of a boat. I confiscated his SLP, a Russian-made P96, and stepped out of the alley. Wiping the sweat from my face, I felt my eye socket and cheek swelling. I was going to have another shiner. Sirens wailed in the distance, and I presumed they'd be heading for the decimated Mercedes. Obviously, Mitch Collins hadn't read any terms of engagement recently. We would need a little chat with the American about our mantra of keeping a low profile. My phone buzzed. It was the big daft yank. Starbucks, Oxford Road, sugar. Fuck that. The thirsty scholar was just across the road. Lauren North story. All four of us sat around the table in the lockup. Rick, Des and I drinking tea, Mitch with a coffee. Rick was not a happy bunny. You are telling me you destroyed a car with an anti-tank grenade on a public street? Des was nursing what was quickly becoming a black eye. He scratched his head and gave Mitch a telling look. Mitch himself just shrugged those broad shoulders of his, as if what he'd done was the most natural thing in the world. Rick was fuming. It's not fucking Chicago in Prohibition, Mitch. You can't go blowing shit up in the middle of Manchester on a school day. Mitch sipped his coffee. They had us at a disadvantage, sir. We were blocked in. Rick threw his arms in the air. So do one. Run away, get yourselves lost in the sea, live to fight another day. The American pursed his lips. That wasn't an option, Mr. Fuller. In order to do that, I would have had to leave my buddy behind. Buddy? Des shook his head. That's what he calls that fucking big gun he has in that case over there. The one that fires the old sexes. Mitch finished his drink. Actually, that is what the Japanese soldiers nicknamed the weapon, Mr. Colgan. I simply copied that tradition. You could have killed innocent civilians, barked Rick. Mitch shook his head. I was sure the street was clear, sir. I was in. This is getting us nowhere, boys. What's done is done. Mitch, what can you tell us about the guys who were chasing you? Rick snorted down his nose, venting his irritation. Not much from a few incinerated body parts and another guy with a nine mil round in his fucking skull. It was Desi's turn to snap. Oh, hey, and I was supposed to let the big fucker slope me then? Or maybe you'd have preferred he beat me to death on the cobbles? I gave them all a stern look. I felt like a headmistress with three naughty boys sitting in my office. Come on, lad, stop squabbling. This is childish. Rick, what do we have from Cartwright? Rick sat back in his seat. He gave Des a look I'd never seen before. 
Remember TG 1987? Aye, how could I forget that one? TG, that's Libya, right? Asked Mitch. Rick nodded. Des and I were part of a patrol that went out there to eliminate a guy who was supplying weapons and explosives to the PIRA. A guy called Abdullah al-Mufti. The plan was to blow his house, but when we got on plot, he had his wife and two kids inside. So instead we decided to take him out in his car, along with his security detail. Things went wrong. We were compromised and we lost one of our patrol. A guy by the name of Frankie Green. Top bloke, muttered Des. Well, said Rick, after my meeting with Cartwright, I'll find out more about what happened to our mufti once we got home. And how that job from twenty years ago relates to Todd Blackman's murder. Rick rested his elbows on the table. Apparently, during that firefight back in 1987, we destroyed most of Al Mufti's operation, so he fled to the Lebanon with his wife and kids. Once there, he built up his business again. Some years later, as a result of his daughter using the internet, the Americans discovered his whereabouts and conducted an airstrike on his house. His wife and daughter were killed. Abdullah and his son Sadiq survived. They fled to Afghanistan, where they went on to form the bones of a criminal gang called Yunkfak. That means the wind in Arabic, said Mitch. Correct, said Rick. Now, just like the band of fighters Al Mufti had in Tiji, this gang are made up of many nationalities from around the world. Black, white, Asian, Arab, yet all Muslim. Also, Al Mufti ensures they have no searchable background and they never, ever use digital devices or mobile phones. They don't have credit cards, a dentist, a passport, nothing. All they have to distinguish each other is a single small tattoo. Of a mast and a seal, said Des. The big block had one on his neck. Rick slapped the table with his palm. Correct again. Confirmation of who we're dealing with right there. Yun Fakir here in Manchester. Des nodded. Aye, and if they don't use computers, that's the reason the gang haven't posted crime scene-style photos on the internet. Mitch screwed up his face. Well, I've spent a long time in the Middle East, and I ain't never heard of no young fact, and I don't see how they're connected to our murder case. Rick pointed. Khalid Kalinovich. That stopped Mitch dead in his tracks. Des turned to the American and gave him a nudge in the ribs. The CIA's number one suspect, pal. The guy who owns Lucas Estates and the flat where our body was topped, eh? Rick suddenly found his edge again. He pointed at Mitch. You knew about Kulanovich and you didn't think to brief us. Mitch raised his eyebrows. We knew that J. E. Blackman and Khalid Kuvanovich had some history is all. Rick blew out his cheeks. History? Fuck me, you could call it that, or blind hatred. This is all about two unbelievably rich men behaving like a pair of rutting stags. But before we go any further, Mitch, I need to know I can trust you to keep your mouth shut. Are we on the same page here? I can't have you run into Carver every five minutes with the odd snipper to keep him quiet. We are, sir. I just want to get the guys that did this and head home. Rick looked around the table and... Got nods of agreement from Des and me. Okay, here's the story. Rick Fuller's story. It took me an hour to brief the team on most that Cartwright had told me. I did my best to answer their questions. I kept any mention of Stephen Goldsmith, the transcripts of the interrogation of the dead player and the awful picture of poor Frankie Green to myself for a while. The Americans could never know that Goldsmith had survived his strange ways incarceration, or that he went on to be Cartwright's informant, and I wanted to sit Des down one-on-one -on -one before I showed him what the fuckers did to Frankie. Lauren gave us the lowdown on the new head of the police investigation, DCS Alan Williams. I wasn't surprised that he was an advocate of the Baptist religion, but I'd never heard of the SBA and didn't realise that their tentacles stretched across the Atlantic. Obviously, J.E. Blackman had got his own way with the GMP, but I was determined that he wouldn't interfere with our team. Des filled us in with what he gleaned from Henrietta Duval and Todd Blackman's last movements, and 
By the time we'd finished, we all felt like we needed some air. You like English grub, Mitch? I asked. Where I come from, sir, you eat what's in front of you. I could eat a scabby donkey, chipped Des, rooting in his pocket for his lung cancer-inducing device. OK, I offered. Well, I had a large lunch with our pet spy, but I could do with a change of scenery. Examining Desi's and Mitch's casual attire, I shook my head ruefully. As usual, Lawrence is fine, but you two appear to shop from the same catalogue. That means we can't go anywhere decent. Lawrence stood. Rick, you are such a food snob. I like that place we went to just before we left for Puerto Banus. You can eat in the bar there, remember? Hey, the chop house, agreed Des. That's traditional English, although I think you might find that the fish is all from the far superior country of Scotland. I actually liked the old Manchester establishment, despite its informality. The chop house it is, then, I said. I thought it unlikely that any of the young fact crew would have been able to follow our movements since Des and Mitch had dispatched their Mercedes saloon in the middle of the afternoon, but we made a few twists and turns en route just to feel better. After being shown to our table by a stick-thin Irish girl with fiery ginger hair, we tucked ourselves in and perused the menu. Our waitress was obliging and witty and seemed very keen to help Mitch with what ingredients were contained in some of the local fare. I suspect that she had another agenda, but it seemed wasted on the big yank. Des ordered his usual Guinness and Laura and a glass of Mamacou Sauvignon Blanc. Mitch and I opted for water. As the evening wore on, the team enjoyed their food, Mitch even trying Thomas's signature corned beef ash and finishing every scrap. We did our best not to talk shop, and the American turned out to be a knowledgeable and polite young man with a dry sense of humour. It also became obvious to us why he had little interest in our Irish waitress. He'd taken quite a shine to Armour's North. It was just before 22 hours when Des took a call on his mobile. He excused himself from the table and went outside, both to hear the caller and to have a smoke. When he came back in, he seemed excited. We all hunkered around our table, getting in close so Des could lower his voice. That was we Henrietta. Todd's pal from the Coys Lake. Now you remember on the last night she saw him. She said he'd taken a call from this mystery guy and he'd seemed all excited and went off to meet him. We all nodded. The Scot continued. Well, that has been bothering me some, as in I checked the property sheets from Larry's files and there's no mention of a mobile phone either on the body, the murder scene or in Todd's flat. So the perp stole it, offered Mitch. Or disposed of it, added Lauren. I nodded. Lauren's right. They left his wallet and cash and cards, and as young fact never used mobiles, they must have dumped it. Des pursed his lips. Aye, I think you're right, pal. And if that's the case, I reckon we've already missed a trick in not accessing Todd's phone records. But listen, here's the thing. When I asked Henry Etter who it was that had called that night, she said she thought it was someone older than Todd because he had an old-fashioned name like Bert or Alf. Well, she now says she is positive that Todd called the guy Sid. My stomach flipped. You're thinking Sidek, aren't you? How muffed his son. The Scot sat back in his seat and finished his beer. Makes sense to me. Shorten your name to make it more westernized. Loads of young Muslim guys do it. I nodded. And Todd's phone number? Des pushed a slip of paper across the table. She just gave it to me, and his email. I reckon he would have been belled paperless. I pulled out my own phone. Simon should be able to get access to Todd's phone records. We know our Mufti won't have used a mobile to ring Todd. It must have been a public telephone box, and I reckon the caller would have been close by. Walking distance, maybe even somewhere in the village. The area is full of CCTV cameras. It's probably the safest place in the city. I turned to Lauren. As soon as we have the exact location, I want you to get hold of Larry again and see if he can pull the strings with the council CCTV operators in the area. I want a picture of the fucker that made that call by tomorrow lunchtime.
Deskogan's story. Vet called Egghead and got him on the case. The kid hardly ever slept at night, so staying up trying to hack into Todd Blackman's email and then beat his men for him would be child's play for the lad. Even so, Simon had developed a case of seriously cold feet since viewing Todd's crime scene videos, and it took Rick a further five grand to persuade him to take the job. I really wanted to leave the lock-up and visit Maggie, but Rick had put the mockers on that, pointing out that me and Mitch had been picked up by Al Mufti's crew pretty easily, and we were all safer where we were. He was right, of course, but I still wanted to be elsewhere. It was past midnight and Lauren and Mitch had got their heads down. When I stepped back into the lock-up after my smoke, Rick was sitting in front of his laptop, poring over the transcripts of an interrogation conducted by the firm on one of the young fac recruits. He looked up from the screen. Fancy putting the kettle on, pal? Aye, I'll have one with you before I turn in. I dropped a mug of tea in front of him and he stopped scrolling the massive text. My old pal sat back, stretched his arms over his head and took a deep breath. I knew something big was coming, and I was right. Listen, pal, he began. You ain't gonna believe this, but the only reason we know about the existence of Jungfak and their connection to Khalid Kulinovich is because of Stephen Goldsmith. I nearly choked on my boo. Jesus says, Christ, pal, will that fucker never die? Rick managed a grim smile. The firm always said he was useful. Turns out on this occasion they were right. Apparently young Fack were muscling in on the Albanians' drug territories in the States. They told Goldsmith all about his new gang, who was leading it, how it worked, so on and so forth, and in true fashion Goldsmith dropped the dime to old Cartwright. Rick tapped some keys on his laptop. Now MI5 believe young Fack will be doing the same here. They reckon they'll be dealing big quantities of cocaine and heroin within months. They may even be at it already. I felt sick to my stomach. Every time I heard that bastard Goldsmith's name, I couldn't help but think of J.J., Grace and little Kaya. Never mind what he'd done to Rick. So Goldsmith was playing both sides as usual, I said, feeding the firm some scraps and keeping his gangster mates happy at the same time. The evil fucker deserved everything he got, pal. You're right on the money there, mate. Rick hit another key and slowly turned the laptop towards me. But Frankie didn't deserve this, eh? I was dumbfounded. I pulled the computer towards me, unable to take my eyes away from the grotesque image. Away from Frankie Green's horribly mutilated body. So he was alive after the battle, then? Rick nodded. He looks that way, doesn't he? You can see from that picture he's taken a hell of a beating too, before the bastards nailed him to that fucking pole. I shook my head. There's no cross there, but the result is the same. The fuckers crucified him, eh? And slit him open. It's like young Todd. I turned my attention to the images of Abdallah and Sadiq al-Mufti. The older man wore his hair in the same ponytail we'd seen that day in Tiji. Although his trendy suit had been replaced by traditional Arabic fighting clothes, those piercing blue eyes looked directly into the camera, mocking, proud. Then there was the boy. I examined him. He didn't have the same blue eyes as his father. He'd taken after his Lebanese mother and dark pools flashed like wet stones under black brows. Even at nine or ten years old, he looked a serious child and held his AK-47 across his chest, striking the identical pose to his father, like a pair of hunters displaying their prey. I turned to Rick. So Sadiq will be what? Twenty-nine, thirty, maybe? I reckon. And he's here now, running this young fac crew. That's what Cartwright says. And if we are right, and said this Sadiq, then we are right on the money. Rick hit a key on the laptop and it flicked back to the transcripts. He tapped the screen. But this won't be easy, pal. This guy, the one the firm interrogated, he says that all Sadiq's men are terrified of him. They call him Tannin, Arabic for dragon. Rick drained his brew. 
Another thing Cartwright told me was that this prisoner died under interrogation. That isn't exactly true either. He bit off his own tongue and choked to death rather than face the consequences of his capture. I couldn't feel anything for the dead gang member. All I could see in my mind's eye was Frankie nailed to that post with his guts spilled out on the floor. My anger began to boil up inside, and I noticed that I'd been gripping my fists so tight that my nails were close to breaking the skin on my palms. I knew I didn't need to see the picture again. I knew it wasn't good for me to look at it. Yet I took back the laptop once more and, like a ghoulish driver slowing to see the victims of a road traffic accident, I hit the key to display the picture of our pal Frankie once more. My hands were shaking. Don't you worry, my son, I said to the screen. We'll slay this dragon for you. It was the last thing we'd do. Lauren North Story Simon rang Rick just before 0600 hours. As we suspected, in keeping with young Fack's mantra of not using digital devices, the call to Todd Blackman's mobile was made from a public telephone box located in Sackville Gardens, close to the infamous Canal Street in the heart of Manchester's gay village. The box was walking distance from where Todd and Henrietta Duval had been enjoying their chicken burgers. I'd called Larry, made up a woolly enough story about how we thought our man in the phone box may have witnessed some of Todd's movements on the night he was killed, and although he'd seemed reluctant at first, he finally agreed to try and obtain the relevant CCTV footage and meet me in Starbucks just a short cab ride away. After what had happened to Des and Mitch the previous day, Rick insisted we pair up. Something I hadn't mentioned to Larry. I vented my concern that the presence of another team member might spook the detective, but Rick wouldn't budge. I don't want you out there alone, he said as he scrambled eggs on the stove. I teased him. You mean you don't want me alone with Larry? He set his pan aside, slipped his arms around my waist and examined me with those wonderful chocolate eyes. I trust you, Lauren. Always will. He frowned for a moment and pursed his lips as if the words he sought were difficult to form in his mouth. He struck my face as he spoke. We both have time to work this out, you know, me and you. It's been crazy, I know, job after job, but this is our world, your world now. Just give me a little time, please. I slowly shook my head, feeling a big smile come to my face. It was like a complex puzzle that you would never quite know the answer to. Wow, that came out of the blue. He released me and scraped his eggs onto a plate. Some things need saying. He waved the pan at me. You want some? I looked up at him. I want you, I said. He smiled too. It was Mitch and I that kitted ourselves up ready to leave the lock-up for the meet with our pet detective. Des and Rick were going to visit some drug dealer type from back in the day. Apparently he could be a handful. I did my best to put Rick's sudden romantic interest to the back of my mind, but once again the merest hint of affection from him saw me as loved up as a silly teenager. The American checked over his Smith & Wesson 44 Magnum 629 Deluxe Tallow handgun. It was a big stainless steel beast of a weapon. I gave him a girly grin. Do you feel lucky, punk? I asked in my best Clint Eastwood voice. I think you'll find, ma'am, that way back in 1971, long before this cowboy was born, dirty Harry Callahan used a Model 2-9 with a 5-inch barrel. Then the most powerful handgun in the world. However, this model is shorter and easier to conceal. It must make a hell of a noise. I like revolvers opposed to SLPs, ma'am. They tend to go bang when you need them to. But you are leaving that rocket thing of yours at home today? It was Mitch's turn to smile. It was a very pleasant occurrence, and his old face appeared to light up when he did so. Yes, ma'am. I think Mr. Fuller is of a mind that my buddy should stay where it is for the time being. I selected the little Colt six-shot SLP that I'd used on the Anton Estate job, along with my now-favoured ASP. Both slipped nicely into my bag. I didn't want Larry giving me a hug only for him to find some great big pistol sticking in his ribs. 
He was paranoid enough already. We left the lock up to a warm drizzle. The heat wave had finally broken, and the good folk of Manchester scuttled about their business in damp, humid conditions that made shirts stick to backs and hair freeze uncontrollably. No sooner had we hailed our cab and dropped onto our seat, my phone vibrated. Hi, Larry, I said. Everything okay? He sounded breathless. I've been followed. Two men, both black, Africans. I noticed that when I parked my car in town. Then again, after I left the CCTV station at the council offices. Where are they now? I think I lost them. I mean, I've done enough surveillance courses to know the script, but I'm going to do another couple of moves before we meet. To be certain, I mean. What's going on, Lauren? It wasn't the time for explanations. I kept with the programme. Okay, Larry, just stay calm, mate. Let's change our venue, too. Let's say the old monkey in an hour, okay? Larry still sounded shaken. Yes, okay. I, um, I have pictures of your guy. I felt my stomach flip. And for the first time when talking to Larry, it wasn't due to nerves. Okay, I said. Be careful. I asked the driver to drop us at Piccadilly Station, where Mitch and I split up and carried out our own set of anti-surveillance drills, before meeting up again on Portland Street with five minutes to spare. As I walked into the popular Manchester pub, I immediately saw Larry nursing a pint of dark ale in a quiet corner. He smiled weakly. When he saw Mitch, as I'd suspected, his face fell. I sat whilst Mitch ordered coffee. "'Who's the big fella?' he asked, a real edge to his tone. I would have thought that as I've just put my career on the line and lied to obtain this footage, you might have thought it prudent to come alone. I ran my tongue over the front of my teeth, desperate not to snap back at him. After all, he was the one taking the risks with his job. You can trust Mitch, Larry. He's part of our team. Right on cue, the Americans sat and offered a huge hand. Mitch Collins, pleased to make your acquaintance, sir. Larry reluctantly took and shook. Mitch did his best to calm Larry's nerves. Mr. Simpson, sir, the two African guys, they were most probably looking for us, not you. They'll know that you were connected to the case and, and therefore presume we may contact you. Mr. Cogan and I were also followed yesterday. Larry threw back his head and mimicked Mitch's accent as best he could. Ha! And did you shake off your tail, sir? I mean, you being the CIA and all. Just like your pal Mason Carver, huh? The guy who threatened to have me taken off the case if I didn't smell the beans on the crime scene. He kept that promise on that one, all right. Mitch kept his tone level. The American's long fuse apparent for all to see. You're correct, Mr. Simpson. I do represent the interests of the United States government here in the UK. And yes, Mr. Cogan and I dealt with yesterday's threat appropriately. But I had no hand in having you removed. By appropriately? Spat Larry, not waiting for Mitch to finish. You mean you murdered them both? He got straight in the American's face, hands on the table for support. I may be on guard in leave, but I read the fucking papers. That stopped me in my tracks. What do you mean, gardening leave, Larry? He looked at us both in turn and snorted his derision. Oh, yeah, did I not say? Not content with dropping me from the lead role in the Blackwing case, your boss Carver has seen to it that I'm put out to grass. DCS Williams, praise the Lord, is now all controlling. I'm suspending an all but name. Larry turned his attentions and increasing fury on me. Bringing Mitch along had been a bigger mistake than I'd imagined. And now you, he hissed, expect me to help you murder the guy on these CCTV pictures, don't you? I mean, come on, that's what you're going to do, isn't it? Find him and kill him? All this shit about him being a witness, well, it's just bollocks, isn't it? He's your fucking suspect. Our coffee arrived and Larry threw himself back in his seat and sulked. I'd heard enough. Listen, detective, we don't just go around killing people for the sake of it. I told you we think this guy may have met with Todd just hours before he was murdered, that's all. 
He may be of major importance to us. He may not. And anyway, I thought we'd gone over this. You said you'd help me. He shook his head and moped some more. I ploughed on. There's no point in getting all wound up about those two guys yesterday. Mitch and Des had no choice but to take the action they did. They were under fire. And they returned that fire. End of. Have you even considered who those people were? Or the identity of your tale today? Who they might be working for? I pointed. You can't get it in your head, can you, Larry? You don't listen to what I say. There are people in very high places, the same people who got you suspended, that want this case closed, done, dusted, understand. And on the other hand, there are another set of equally dangerous folks who are on the streets of Manchester right now waving fucking AK-47s around. This is a power play far and beyond anything you've ever dealt with, Larry. To be honest, I think you're best out of it, for your own good. Mitch's phone buzzed. He checked the screen and excused himself. The moment the American left his seat, the atmosphere changed. Larry reached across the table and took my hand, his voice instantly soft, consoling. Can't you see now? This is what I've been saying. Can't you see what is happening? You don't need this. We don't need this. I dropped my own hand onto his. You're a Good man, Larry, a truthful man. You uphold the law of the land the only way you know. But I can't play by your rules, neither can Mitch or Des or Rick. I'll be honest with you, we're against the clock on this one, and I can't stress enough how dangerous this game is. If you don't feel comfortable sharing those pictures with us, Larry, that's fine. I stood. I'll just have to find another way. He looked into my eyes his hand resting firmly on the envelope he'd brought with him. I could see him fighting his demons, wrestling with his own particular sense of right and wrong. Finally he came to his decision. I could see the sorrow in his eyes. No, no, Lauren, I I can't do it. I just don't believe you. And I can't be a party to what you have in mind, to murder. I just can't. I bit my lip and nodded my acceptance. If that's what you think, Larry, there's nothing more to say. He held my gaze for a moment. Lauren, look, I mean, can't we... Can't we sort this out between us? I turned down the corners of my mouth and shrugged. Let's just say, like you, Larry, I changed my mind. We stood in the drizzle of Portland Street. Mitch was really pissed. So he won't give up the photographs. I shook my head. Well, I say I go in there, bust his head and take them from him. Great idea, cowboy. What then? Ride out of town and hide in the hills till the posse is gone. Come on, he's a cop. This ain't the Wild West. Anyway, I have another idea. We walked steadily to the end of Canal Street and eyed the phone box where the call had been placed. I placed my hand on one of the American's impressive biceps and gave him my best smile. He read my thoughts and he wasn't a happy bunny. You have to be joking, ma'am. Oh, I never joke about these things, Mitch. Look, there are at least six bars on the strip here that have CCTV outside, three looking out towards Sackville Gardens. They must have a shot of our guy. Not only that, but after making the call, he may have walked down Canal Street to meet Todd, and we could get even better footage than Larry obtained from the council system. But that means I'll have to go inside a... a... a gay bar, yes, Mitch. And I know how you feel about homosexuality, but the Bible also has a little section in it about thou shalt not kill, and that did not appear to stop you and your buddy thing yesterday. Come on, Mitch, I need you to take one for the team. I thought he was going to cry. Aw, oh, ma'am, I mean, that is so not fair. I turned him to me, gripped him by both arms and looked him up and down. Now come on, Maureen, give me a smile. The boys in there will love a big strapping lad like you. Twinkle those eyes and flash that pearly white smile of yours and I'll bet they'll give you anything you ask for. 
Mitch pointed at me, genuine fear in his eyes. I will repay you for this, ma'am. As God is my witness, I will get you back. I sat on the wall by the canal. The rain had stopped and the sun was breaking through the clouds. I'll just wait here, shall I? I said, smiling. If you aren't back in an hour, I presume you've pulled. Rick Fuller's Story I'd fled to Manchester to escape myself as much as anything else. I was in a shit state, drinking myself into oblivion every night, hoping to find my wife's killer at the bottom of each bowl. I lost my honour and my integrity. My conscience, if indeed I'd ever had such a thing, was left behind on that blood-soaked path in Hereford. It was during those turbulent times that I met Tanya Richards. We began what some would lovingly call a relationship. That was until she too was shot dead on a deserted road between Amsterdam and Rotterdam. Tanya and her brother Georgie dealt cocaine and cannabis out of their moss-side base. Jamaican by birth, they embraced the yardy culture and ruled their turf with an iron fist. If you crossed them, you ended up dead. As I lay unconscious in Leeds General Hospital, with a bullet wound in my cheek and my legs like cinder toffee, Stephen Goldsmith and his cronies planted a bomb in Moston Cemetery that decimated the Richards family. Tanya's mother, brothers Georgie and Michael, nephew Shelley, Bonnie and William were blown to pieces. Bonnie, at 18 months old, was the youngest to die. The sole surviving member of the Richards household was Tanya's sister, Alina, who was married to the man I wanted to talk to today, Vinnie Pitbull Vasquez. Vinny was a small-time coke dealer, as his name suggested, a big bull of a man with an even bigger mouth. The Richards family tolerated him purely because Alina loved him. There is no accounting for taste. I'd only met him once and found him to be a total twat. I would have slotted him just based on that stupid nickname. Vinny was a nefarious scumbag, but more importantly to us, a lifelong resident of Ancoats, and just the type to know if any glistening new gangster types had moved into his now upwardly mobile area. Since Dares had only succeeded in netting a local landlady on his foraging mission, he'd drawn the short straw, was paired with yours truly, and was about to join me and pay the rather unpleasant pitbull a visit. Vinny lived in a typical Ancoats terrace. However, he stood out slightly as it boasted a raw iron gate bolted to the front door frame the door proper being firmly closed behind it. Nice, said Des, giving the gate a rattle and finding that lock too. He might be in, I mused. These fuckers feel safer behind bars. Do you think he'll recognise you? asked the Scot. I shook my head. The only time I met him was at some party and he was off his face, so no, I don't think so. I only know he lives here because we had to drive the fucker home. So what makes you think he'll tell us anything? I gave Des my best confused face, the one that points out that you just asked me the stupidest question ever. Des held up a finger of recognition. Ah, we're going to hurt him. I banged on the door. We waited. He's not in, said Des. We sat in the van to escape the drizzle that had started again. I'd selected my old trusty escort from the lock-up as I was not going to put Vinny in anything else I owned. The last time he was in my car, he stank like a camel had slept in his underpants. Strangely, we didn't have long to wait. Within five minutes, bouncing along the road in his regulation shiny black tracksuit, was the boy himself, carrying half a pint of semi-skimmed and the Sun newspaper for his daily reading material. The moment we stepped out of the van, Vinnie dropped his purchases, turned on his heels and was off like a scalded cat. The pit bull didn't appear to have done much anaerobic training lately, and Des was all over him like a rash. As the Scot got alongside, he stuck out a well-timed foot and legged him up. Then he hit the deck with a thump, showing far too much of his builder's arse for anyone who'd eaten breakfast. I grabbed him by his hair and lifted him back to his feet. Hello, Vinny! Pitbull screwed up his face. What the fuck do you cunts want? Nice, isn't he? I said. They smiled. Lovely. I tightened my grip. T 
two choices, Vinny. Go for a ride or invite us in. I could see you didn't like the idea of either option. I suppose you'd better come in. Just just fucking let go of me, will you? I released him, wiped the chip fat from my hand, and we strode back down his street. The old curtain was twitching as we passed by, but Vinny's neighbours all had the good sense to stay indoors. The big daft lad opened up his security gate and then his wooden front door with shaky hands. As we stepped inside, we were greeted by the stench of sweaty feet and unwashed armpits. The mail hadn't been cleared from behind the door for a week or two either. Alina not doing her wifely duties, I asked, trying not to breathe through my nose. She's fucked off, ain't she? Done one a few months back. Anyway, old you know the cow. I reluctantly grabbed him by the hair again and marched him into his grubby lounge. Sit the fuck down, dickhead, I barked. She was too good for you in the first place. At least she's come to her senses. I considered that the smell was even worse in the front room than the hall. God only knew how long the various pizza and curry boxes had been scattered on the carpet. Des stepped in. You're a disgusting, horrible fucker, ain't you, big man? No wonder your wee lass is on her toes, eh? You smell like a fucking dead animal. Now, Vinny hadn't got the nickname Pitbull for no reason. He was a handy boy in his way. One of those gone-to-sea types. You know, the I used to go to the gym five years ago kind of bloke. Even so, I could see straight off he didn't fancy it. He sat in his fetid armchair, resigned to whatever fate we were about to dish out, scratching his bollocks and looking uncomfortable. Des looked about the place and turned down his mouth. How's the cocaine business treating you these days, Vinny? The big O found some balls from somewhere and sneered at the Scot. I got no idea what you're talking about, dickhead. And what's it to do with you anyway, jock? Des opened his jacket to reveal his Glock and gave Pitbull his best Glasgow grin. Vinny eyed the weapon and deflated faster than a Chinese remold. For fuck's sake, he muttered. There's no need for shooters, is eh? Look, Ock House, suppose it was all right till just recently. But it's all gone peaked on. I can't deal around here anymore. I'm getting on my tour soon, as. Des cocked his head. What, near customers with all this building going on? Despite the fact Pitbull had an exceedingly grumpy and well-armed Scott in his face, the fool's attention span equaled that of a goldfish. He totally lost concentration on Des and was staring intently at me. A light came on in his head. I fucking know you, don't I? You worked for that big dealer, Joel Davis, didn't you? You're that collecty bloke, he's enforcer. He twisted in his chair and tapped me on the leg. Not his best move. Hey, I hear that Davis mush is dead, yeah? Topped by the same mush as Alina's sister, Tanya. I had been known by the name Stephen Coletti for over ten years. The identity had served me well, but since Des's arrival in Manchester, I'd reverted to my given name. However, Vinny's attitude and the mere mention of Tanya's name ensured my ever-shortening temper got the better of me. I pulled my fast back from my waistband, pointed it at the buffoon's head and clicked off the safety. Keep talking that way and you'll join them. Vinny leaned back in his chair and threw up his hands quicker than the Italians in 1943. Fuck me, more shooters. Come on, boss, no need for that now. Ignoring the fact that I was irritated enough to actually shoot the crane, they sensibly ploughed on. So why are you not dealing, pal? And why are you living like fucking Wazzle Gummidge? Vinny's eyes shot between us, unsure what to say. There was genuine fear in his face. Finally, he looked down at his muddy trainers and muttered, What's that new crew in it? Des frowned. A new gang, from out of town. The boy looked even more uncomfortable than when I pointed my SLP at his bonds. Well, they ain't from round here, that's for sure. I was suddenly all interested. English or what? No, all kinds. Russians, Arabs, Pakistanis. Des gave me a knowing look. I leaned in with my Sig Sauer in 1911. How do we find these fuckers, Vinny? He turned and looked straight down the barrel, obviously more frightened of the new competition than us. You don't find them, mate. They find you. Des kicked the bottom of Vinny's foot to get his attention. 
So how did they discover you, my old son? Then he snorted and shrugged. Oh, just doing me rounds a couple of nights back. It's local, like, you know, grand bags for the party people. Anyway, this mush rocks up, Russian or Polish or something he was, big fucker with a little tattoo on his neck. I was in one of them late-night trendy boozers that have sprung up lately. Must have been two-ish. Anyway, he says he wanted to buy a six gram. Well, I only got four left on me. So I says I'll give him a phone and tell him where to meet me. But get this, he ain't got a mobile, I mean, how fucking stupid is that? I think, fuck me, you got 300 quid to blow on beak, but you can't afford a fucking Nokia. So I say, OK, wait there, and I'll go get it. And, spat Des impatiently, and then it goes tits up, don't it? I step outside and there are three other faces waiting for me, eh? Two black dudes and one other mush. I get thrown in the car and they take me to some old fucking garage somewhere up south and it was horrible, I tell you. They had shooters, fucking machine guns, everything. They put a fucking AK to me head and says that if I keep buying from Tricky Mickey, I'm a dead man. Said they were taking over and if I wanted to deal in handcuffs, I'd have to buy from them more. Vinny made a slashing motion across his throat with his finger and funny clicking noises with his mouth. I put the cig away for a moment. But they obviously let you go, Vinny. I mean, you are here, stinking out this room. He pulled his face. Only because I agreed to buy their beak. And what a fucking palaver that is. If I want it, I have to drop a fucking note under some brick someplace. Then pick up my gear from some bin and leave the dosh somewhere else. Anyway, I only said yes so they'd let me go. I mean, come on, if I start buying from these new dudes, Tricky Mickey's gonna have me balls for breakfast within the week. You know what a horrible bastard he is. I did. I also knew what an unreliable, lying, fat, twat Pitbull was. I got as close to him as my nose would allow. Well, he isn't as horrible as me, Vinny. I promise you that. Now think carefully before you answer. Did they already know about Mickey? Or did you grass him? Did he squirm some more? Oh, I don't know about that, boss. I was shitting myself and all paranoid because of all the weed mixed with the Charlie and stuff. I shook my head. Druggies, they were all as bad as each other. So where was the DLB? I asked. The what? Des raised his voice. The drop, you fucking idiot. Where this new crew were dropping the drugs. Vinny shook his head. I never found out, did I? As we were talking, this other guy turns up. He comes in shouting the odds in some foreign language and they all fuck off and leave me to it. We were getting nowhere fast. Des looked out of a gap in the boys' curtains into the street. So where you going to, Vinny? You'll get a good price for this little place now, eh? Even in this shit state. Pitbull suddenly got all talkative. Oh, well, aye, that's the other thing I ain't mentioned. There's these other dudes, eh? They've been here months and they come knocking on the door all fucking smiles and waving cash, wanting to buy everyone out. And now I know why, eh? I ain't fucking stupid. I doubted that immensely. Vinny had obviously encountered his greatest brainwave ever. He tapped his temple with a fat finger. The smiley dudes want all the old Ancourt's folks gone, so this other crew, the ones with the fucking AKs and shit, can deal the beak, eh? You know? To all the rich guys moving in. Rich guys with cash to spend. The two crews are working together, eh? The old fucking good cop, bad cop. He had a point. We knew Lucas Estates would make millions in rent from the housing project. All genuine bona fide income for Khalid Kulanovich and his company. But just think of the black market trade. Gone to the smoky old pubs, the pensioners and derelict buildings. Say hello to the cafe culture, the trendy bars, the well-heeled professionals, many of whom will want to get high and can afford the best. With Al Mufti and Young Fack running that side of the business... Kolonovich was on double bubble. I pressed the lad further. It's an interesting story, Vinny, but what I want to know is why these guys left you in the garage and ran off. Vinny shrugged his shoulders. Honest, I don't know, man. 
The dude that turned up seemed like he was in charge, yeah. He was talking all foreign-like. Well angry he was. The only words I understood was black man, so I presume it was some black dude they was after. Des spun around. Black man or black man? Vinnie shrugged again. The Scot pressed. What did he look like, this guy? Big tall bloke, only young like. Maybe thirty, dark skin, beard, ponytail, like something off Miami Vice in the eighties, man. My head swam. Then he could have been describing Abdallah Al Mufti twenty years ago. It just had to be Sadiq. Des picked up the same vibe. And what night was this? Then he scratched his disgusting head. Oh, man, like I said, I do a lot of drugs, know what I mean? I don't know, maybe three, four nights ago now. The night Todd was murdered. I tried to be nice. Tell you what, Vinny, show us the garage they took you to and there's 500 in it for you. The boy nearly shook his head off his shoulders. Come on, boss, I can't remember what I had for breakfast half the time. I've no chance of finding that place again. Anyway, what does it matter, eh? Either Tricky Mickey cuts me bollocks off for grassing him or these foreign dudes leave me looking like a tea bag. You might as well shoot me here and now. See? Nice doesn't get you anywhere. I pulled the cig again, pushed the barrel into his eye socket and put my weight behind it. Listen, you piece of shit. I need to find this ponytail fucker. And when I do, I'm going to nail him to a wall, spill his guts out on the floor, take his picture and send it to his daddy. So slotting you right now wouldn't be a big deal to me, would it? So if you can't tell us where the garage is, I'm sure you can help us identify the big box man with the 80s fashion sense, eh? I turned to Des. Go find a pillowcase, pal. Lauren North story. I watched as Mitch appeared at the doorway of the third bar along Canal Street. A guy of about similar height and build to the American was standing with him. But unlike Mitch, he was shaven-headed and sported a full set. He was also dressed like he'd just stepped off a Harley Davidson or taken part in a village people video. They shook hands and Mitch strode over towards me with a big grin on his face. I returned it and gave him the thumbs up. It was difficult not to. His infectious smile and engaging innocence belied his inherent fondness for killing people. He waved a DVD. You got it then? I asked. Oh, yeah. The boys over there were really cool. I told them that my brother's boyfriend had been mugged by the phone booth over there and they gave me the footage straight away. I raised my eyebrows at the fact that the obviously homophobic American could drop into such a tale so easily. Well done. Mitch pursed his lips. I believe that they knew I was straight immediately, ma'am. I didn't once feel that they might think otherwise. I took the disc from him and examined it. So what's this, then? Mitch looked puzzled. Scrawled across the DVD in red pen was 07799655434. Call me. Brent. Kiss. I held in my laughter. Mitch didn't speak all the way back to the lockup. We arrived to find Rick and Des printing out Air Force sized pictures of what appeared to be an ancient Salford pub called the Railway. It had been less than a month ago when I'd watched Rick go through a similar routine, just before the job on the Anton estate in Longsight. Only then it had been JJ Yakim slouched in the seat now occupied by Mitch Collins. I pushed my sorrow to the back of my mind and said a little prayer for all of us. I scanned the pictures of the awful excuse for a public house. What's this about? Tomorrow lunchtime, said Rick. We're going to pay this bloke a visit. He handed me a grainy black and white shot of a rough-looking man with a broken nose. Richard Fenwick, a.k.a. Tricky Mickey, cocaine dealer extraordinaire. It's an old picture, one I took of him when Joel Davis was on his case over another matter. I think young Fack will be paying him a visit very soon, and I want us to be there when they do. Well, I think Mitch and I got what we wanted, I said, holding up the DVD. Des was more interested in the American's long face. What's the matter with your coupon, son? I gave the Scot a look. Larry got cold feet, so 
Mitch had to get the footage from the bars in the village. One guy took a shine to him. I saw Des stifle a smile of his own. Teasing aside, Mitch's previous outbursts about brimstone and hellfire were obviously behind him. I'm fine, Mr. Cogan, he managed, standing at the coffee machine. Honest, I am. Can I get your hot drink? We all nodded and he got on with the task. I found my laptop and booted it up, ready to view the images of the man that called Todd Blackman on the night he died. The man that almost definitely lured him to his shocking end. Mitch dropped my coffee on the table and then walked over to where Rick and Des were busy. He handed them their brews. I had a call, Mr. Fuller, a call from Mason Carver. He, he, um, would like to speak with you, ASAP. He wants you to meet with J.E. Blackman. Apparently the senator requires an immediate update on our progress, sir. I'd noticed an edge to both Rick and Des the last day. Something had got under their skin. Rick was at his most unpleasant. And what did you tell Mr. Carvermitch? I told him that I would pass on that message, sir. And you have, snapped Rick. But, sir, Rick looked up at the young American, his eyes giving no quarter. The first thing we're going to do, Mitch, is look at your footage of the man we believe to be Sid or Sadiq al-Mufti. Right on cue, there was a muffled shout from the back of Rick's old escort van, and it rocked from side to side as someone grew increasingly irritated in the back. I raised my brows as Rick and Des ignored the noise. Mr. Fuller's delightful mood continued. Once Lauren prints a clear picture of our target, and I'm presuming that as you are here annoying me and not still trawling every gay bar in the village that you've acquired one, I'll show it to that evil-smelling creature currently hooded and hogtied in the back of my van. I don't understand, sir. Who? Rick held up a hand. That grunting individual, Mitch, is a low-life drug dealer whose identity doesn't concern you. However, due to his criminal activities, he was unfortunate enough to meet the leader of a new gang that have appeared in Ancoats. From his description of their operatives, their weaponry, and the way in which they operate, we believe this gang to be Yungfak. Now, as you know, the leader of Yungfak is Sadiq al-Mufti, our main suspect in Todd Blackman's murder. Rick pointed towards the rocking van. So, if this fat bastard IDs the man in your pictures as the same man who was barking orders at several heavily armed young fact members on the night Todd was murdered, we may have something of interest to say to your senator, pal. Is that understood, Collins? Mitch looked sheepish. That's understood, sir. Rick gave a fake smile. Good. So, unless you have something else of groundbreaking importance to tell me, can we get on? The footage was tremendous. As we watched it for the third time, Des turned to the rather deflated American and gave him a wink. Good job, Des, pal. Mitch managed a thin smile. The CCTV showed a man in his late twenties, maybe early thirties. Tall, slim, long-limbed. He was of Arabic appearance with either black or the darkest brown hair, scraped back in a ponytail that bounced between his shoulder blades as he walked. He was a handsome guy and sported a close-cropped beard. His suit was a pale pastel blue, and he'd rolled the sleeves up on his jacket, as had been the fashion in the eighties. The film clearly showed him make the call from the box on Sackville Gardens and then walk down Canal Street. As the printer chugged out half a dozen stills from different angles, Rick selected one and walked over to his old van. He pulled the back doors open. There, lying on his back, was a rather large guy in a black tracksuit. He had a pillowcase over his head and was bound by gaffer tape. Rick ripped off the hood and held the picture of our man in front of the guy's face. He blinked a few times and then nodded. Yeah, he said croakily. That's the guy, deaf or 100%. Now will you fucking let me go? Rick reapplied the hood to the hapless man and gestured to Des. Drop this fool in town and slip him a few quid. He then turned to Mitch. Okay, son, make your call. Let's go see what the Oracle has to say for himself. Rick Fuller's Story The Midland Hotel is in the heart of Manchester, 
a place Cartwright said he would have visited had it not been for the heat. Once I discovered that J. E. Blackman was in residence, I doubted the old spy's excuse even more. Boasting over 300 bedrooms, 14 suites, fine dining restaurants and a world-class spa and gym, it's a nice place to stay. It opened in 1903, was built by the Midland Railway at a cost of £1 million and faces on the St Peter's Square. It was where Charles Rolls met Henry Royce and the Beatles were famously refused access for being inappropriately dressed. As Mitch and I parked under the arches on Oxford Road and walked the 200 yards or so to the hotel, I studied the American's clothes and considered he too may not make it past the front door. I needn't have worried. Standing next to the hotel doorman was a tall blonde guy, black suit, earpiece, begun. The Secret Service were in the house. He nodded at Mitch and gestured towards a man standing at reception. That man was Mason Carver. The CIA operative wore a Hugo Boss three-piece pinstripe. He strode over all confident and L.A. tan. He offered his hand. I took it and he shook firmly. Thanks for coming, Mr. Fuller. I take it things are moving on apace and that you have some good news for the senator. I'll let him be the judge of that, I said flatly. Carver managed to practice smile. Oh, of course. Well, Jay, we'll see you now. He nodded towards a private lift where another equally serious-looking guy was stationed. He too was dressed and equipped like the other American on the door. You won't be joining us, Carver? I asked quizzically. That smile remained in place. No, Mr. Fuller, not on this occasion. J.E. has expressed his wish to speak with you in private. I hadn't the time or inclination to concern myself with any internal wranglings within the American camp, so turned on my heels and walked to the lift. The door slid open to reveal Agent Number 3, whose role it seemed was to ride the elevator with whoever was using it. He was a big fella too, and with Mitch and myself in there, it was a real squeeze. He chose not to speak, so we rode in silence. We turned left out of the lift towards Blackman's suite. Two more CP guys stood guard at his door. Strangely, no one was visible on the emergency exit. This worried me some, but I figured that they may well be concealed on the landings out of sight. There was another nod of recognition for Mitch and the door to the suite was opened. They knew exactly who we were. No searches, no questions. That concerned me too. However, it pleased me in equal amounts. On the downside, Carver had shared my photograph with the hired help. On a positive note, I still had my sig. The suite was as luxurious as you might expect. Classic furnishings and beautiful accessories befitting the occupant. Jonathan Eisenhower Blackman was sitting in a winged armchair studying documents the way that all important people seem to be doing when they know you are about to walk into their office. He was 52 years old, looked younger and obviously kept himself in shape. He'd served his country with honour and risen to the rank of Major General. In the States, that meant he would have commanded upwards of 4,000 troops and made big fucking decisions on the battlefield. Despite his far-right leanings, he must have been a good soldier. The senator looked up from his papers and directly into my eyes. Despite his almost jet-black hair, which I suspected had seen the benefit of a hairdresser's loving care to hide the grey, his eyes were bright blue and I was instantly transported back to the picture of Abdallah al-Mufti and his chilly gaze. They were almost identical. Like many men I'd met in my life who wielded power, he had the air about him that instantly commanded your attention. His demeanour demanded your respect, warranted or not. He stood, lifted his head just enough so he could look down his nose at me and extended a hand. Mr Fuller, he said flatly. Mr Blackman, I answered. My condolences to you and your wife. He pulled a pained face, yet my first impression was not one of a grieving man who had just lost his only son. He waved a hand. There'll be time for sorrow when these animals who did this to my boy are dead in the ground, Mr Fuller. Of course, sir, was all I could think to say. He sat back down and gestured for me to do the same. 
He left Pumich standing. So far, what do you have for me? I reached into my jacket pocket, pulled out an A4 colour shot of Sadiq Al Mufti and handed it to Blackman. He unfolded it and studied the image. This our man? We think so. Blackman caught me with those eyes again. Think ain't good enough, boy. Now, I don't know about you, but nothing irritates me more than being called boy. I leaned forward in my seat and kept the senator's gaze. Listen, Blackman, you are paying me one million dollars to kill the man or men that murdered your son. Now, the reason you were so keen for me to do this is because if the truth comes out about Todd's sexual preferences, you will lose the presidential nomination. Wifey won't get to play house in the Oval Office and all these nice men in black suits will fuck off to protect the next guy. So, let me tell you something, just so that we can all play nice. I don't need your money, and I certainly don't need the excitement. So if you call me boy one more time, I will walk from this room and let the fucker on that picture destroy you. Are we clear? I thought I detected the merest hint of distaste in his eyes, but he was soon washed away by a wry smile. Blackman was not a man easily riled. After all, he'd spent many years negotiating multi-million dollar deals in some of the toughest places on the planet. He didn't give a monkey's if anyone liked him or not. He remained silent for a moment before he sat back in his seat and gestured towards Mitch Collins. Leave us, please, he said. Mitch gave me a look and wandered into a side room, closing the door behind him. Blackman waited until he was happy the young American was out of earshot. I like you, Fuller, he said, none too convincingly. You're a straight-talking kind of guy. But you were wrong about my son. He wasn't a homosexual. His mother and I sent him to... I held up my hand. Stop right there, Blackman. I've heard this story about how you had Todd cured. Well, let me tell you this. However much you paid those guys who treated your boy, it's best you ask for your dollars back. Because whilst you were busy electioneering around the Deep South campaigning against same-sex marriage, your son was spending most nights in the gay village dressed as fucking Shirley Bassey. I thought I detected the merest wince from the senator, but kept going. Now, unlike you, Blackman, I don't have a problem with that. What a man does in his bedroom and with whom is none of my business. That said, I'm not a fool and I know what's at stake here. I know how this would affect your campaign and I can tell you that our people in Whitehall are just as keen to see you nominated as you are. Blackman seemed pleased with my last comment and nodded approvingly. I wasn't finished. But to use an American euphemism here, when it comes to the facts in this case, don't blow smoke up my ass. Blackman ran his fingers through his hair, took a deep breath and went into full pulpit mode. When Larry Simpson had described the guy as a piece of work, he was right on the fucking money. You don't understand, Mr. Fuller. Can't understand the shame that this ungodly affliction has brought upon our family. I have prayed so hard and so long that Todd may be cured of this terrible illness. My wife and I truly believe that when he returned from his sabbatical, his disgusting leanings, the awful disease that addled his mind, had been driven from him. Mr. Fuller, the Bible says, if a man also lies with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, and he shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Now look. It has come to pass. I shook my head. The guy may as well have been quoting the verse from the Koran at the murder scene. I felt my temper rise again. I'm not the religious type, Blackman, but I think he also says somewhere, who are you to judge your neighbour? As far as I'm concerned, you and your Bible bashers are no better than the bastards who cut your son open and nailed him to a fucking wall. Don't say that, Fuller. That's a lie. I love my son. He picked up the picture of Sadiq al-Mufti once more. And if this is indeed the man who crucified my boy, I want him dead, Mr. Fuller. I want him...
Blackman didn't get the chance to finish his sentence. The unmistakable sound of big calibre automatic weapons cut through the air in the corridor right side. Rounds were slamming into the plaster by the entrance. I heard one of the two guys guarding the door briefly return fire with his pistol, but it was short-lived. Mitch was out of the side room in seconds, magnum drawn. I grabbed at Blackman and pushed him against the wall away from the windows, unsure where the next threat may come from. As I drew my sig, the hotel room door was torn to shreds by 762. Dozens of rounds cutting through the once beautiful furnishings in the room, blowing feathers and fabric into the air before lodging into the walls. Mitch put six back into the door, the massive report of his magnum rattling my teeth. He calmed the boys down on the other side for a few seconds, but as the American pulled a speed loader from his jacket and dropped the rounds home, they came again. This time our assailants were up close and one smashed at the door lock with his boot. What remained of the wooden structure swung open. The player was a big African. He stepped inside and took aim at Mitch with his AK. I put two in his chest and another in his head as he fell backwards into the hallway. Mitch nodded his appreciation and sprinted over to the open door, slamming himself up against the hotel room wall, giving him a view down the left side of the hallway and some cover into the bargain. I mirrored him, and we now had eyes on both sides of the narrow passage. The two boys in suits who had been guarding the door were dead where they'd stood. Both had been cut to pieces by the high-velocity rounds from the AKs. One even still had his weapon altered. This had been a swift and professional attack. The second guard gripped his glock in his lifeless hand, and I knelt quickly, grabbed it by the barrel and handed it to Blackman, who was crouched beside me. I take it you remember how to use one? I asked. You bet, buddy, said the senator as he expertly checked the weapon was ready to fire. However, I wasn't ready for John fucking Wayne's next move. Blackman edged past me with remarkable speed for a man his age, stepped into the corridor and opened up with the SLP. He also marched straight into the line of fire. I had no choice but to follow Mr. Hollywood Hero out into the hall. Blackman had spun right, so I did the opposite. Ten metres ahead of me was a shooter in the kneel. He was taking cover in the elevator opening. Wedging the lift doors open was the body of the big CP guy we'd rode up with. His throat was cut so badly that he was almost decapitated. The player opened up on full auto, and I felt plaster cut into my face as the bullet smashed into the wall to my left. I was on the move, firing one-handed. It took me four rounds to hit the guy and put him out of action. I threw my left arm backward and grabbed at Blackman's shoulder, dragging him towards the wall, doing my best to keep the fool in cover. Then I heard Mitch firing behind me, that unmistakable sound of the magnum. Two short, sharp double taps and the corridor went silent. As I turned, I saw the third shooter lying on his back with four holes in his chest. Stairs, now! I barked and pushed the hapless Blackman towards one of the stupidly unguarded emergency exits. Mitch grabbed the senator's opposing shoulder and we manhandled him to the top of the gangway. From there, we worked as a two-man team, clearing each landing as we went, leapfrogging each other and dragging a presidential candidate along with us. I knew the lobby would be chaos, probably already teaming with cops, ARV crews pointing G36s at every available exit, and I didn't fancy becoming a victim of friendly fire. I shouted to Mitch as I jumped half a flight of stairs. Get on the blow at a carver. Tell him to meet us around the back of the hotel. The American dialed as we pushed on, along a staff corridor at the side of one of the hotel kitchens. Finally, we reached an exit door and waited, breathing hard, but all in one piece. Mitch's phone vibrated. He checked the text and gingerly had a quick look-see into the yard. Stepping out slowly, Magnum pointed skyward. His empty hand raised, he moved into the open. Even he didn't trust his own guys not to be trigger-happy. Security services, he bellowed. We have the subject. We're coming out now. I saw Mason Carver and three other agents standing next to a limo in the service area. Door open, engine running. We pulled Blackman out into the open and handed him over. Within seconds, the senator was mobile. Carver stood in the steady drizzle. He looked pale. Good work for her. Get me the fuck out of here, I said. While the rest of the world talked about the attempted assassination of an American senator on English soil, Mitch and I drove out of the city. There was no way we were returning to the lock-up. 
Young facts seemed capable of finding any part of our team at will, and I had no intention of leading them to what had become our only safe haven. Mitch struggled with what he called the stick shift on the push. I'd reluctantly chosen to use Joel Davis's old 911 for the short hop to the Midland. It was a vehicle I'd acquired after one of his runners needed to be disposed of, and before I could return it, Joel himself had been murdered. I then tried to use it as collateral in a deal with the recently departed Spiros Macris, but he'd refused it. Now, it wasn't that I believed in bad omens or anything like that, and I'd never considered the car to be unlucky. The reason I disliked the car was purely down to the fact that Joel had been severely lacking in taste when it came to his prestige motor vehicles. The German flagship was finished in Guards Red, the only colour to have a 911 in, but Joel had this fetish for white leather, which turned the car into a mobile whore's handbag. Most of the time I just couldn't bear to drive it. Mitch didn't even notice. He finally found third and the car lurched forward at a rate of knots. It wasn't just the American's lack of prowess with a manual gear change that was getting my goat. I turned in my seat. Just how do you suppose three guys armed with knives and AKs walk straight into a city hotel and come within an inch of slotting an American presidential candidate? Mitch considered my question for a moment, then said... Mr. Blackman's visit hasn't been officially reported to GMP, so there was no out of court in the uniforms. I suppose that explains the ease of access to the hotel. I shook my head. And the lack of cover on the stairwells. Can you explain that? Those three shooters just walked up to Blackman's floor unchecked. Anyway, it doesn't make sense. Why try to assassinate Blackman now? Just when young Fack have him on the ropes. Just when they can humiliate him. Kulanovich wants him hurt, wants him ruined. If he'd wanted him dead, he could have slotted him back in the States. That's just it, sir. I'm of a man that they weren't after, G.E. Blackman. What the fuck are you talking about, Mitch? The American took his eyes from the road for a moment. They were after you, sir. We drove out to Cheshire. I used my mobile to book us into Peckforton Castle, a good quality five-star hotel with a decent restaurant and a good spa. I was in the mood to chill out for a few hours. I gave Mitch's a tyler once over. Now, I hope you have a decent shirt and you carry on. Well, I got a polo, sir. Ralph Loren. Who's he, sir? I shook my head. Look, Mitch, I've booked us a table at the 1851, the castle's fine dining restaurant, and I'm not sitting opposite you if you're wearing a supermarket label. The American looked bemused. Thank God there's a hotel shop, I said. I take it you do have your credit card? I do, sir. Good. I'll come with you. Americans are notorious for poor taste. The Castle's Hotel had an excellent on-site store. I managed to persuade Mitch to part with £120 for a rather nice Thomas Pink fitted cotton shirt, white with a fine blood-red pin. He seemed horrified at the price. I thought it was good value. We were shown to our executive suites by a very pretty blonde who organised swim shorts and robes for us both, as I was determined to use the spa. Once in the privacy of my room, I sat on the sofa and called Lauren. She answered within two rings. She sounded sleepy and a little nasal. I wondered if she'd been crying. Oh, thank God, she said. It's all over the news, six dead. Sorry I didn't call before. I wanted to be discreet around Mitch. Are you okay? You're not hurt at all? I'm fine, honest. And Mitch? Yeah, he's good too. He did well. She lowered her voice and I heard her moving obviously trying to get some privacy of her own in the claustrophobic lock-up. I was so scared, Rick. I, I don't know why, but I'd got myself all worked up. When they said that some of the people guarding Blackman were dead, well, I just... I tried to lighten the mood. I'll take you instead of Mitch next time and we can both get shot at together. Don't tease me. I was really worried. Well, I'm fine. She trailed off and I heard her sob quietly. It was just the kind of chat I used to have with Cathy when I was away on jobs. And with a similar outcome. 
Don't cry, please. Look, I'll be back in the morning, and from now on I'll do my best to keep us all together, okay? Okay. Good night, then. Yeah, she whispered. Good night. Just as I was about to hang up, she told me she loved me. I didn't know what to say. I sat with my thoughts for a while. It had been a long time since I'd made a call like that, and I wondered if I'd done the right thing. Lauren and I were getting closer. Too close. I touched my wedding ring. Do you love her too? I dialed Des. Even though I knew Lauren would give him the heads up, I needed to tell him what kit to pack and the location of where I wanted us all to meet next morning. If he'd thought chatting with Vinny the Pitbull was bad, wait till he got up close and personal with Tricky Mickey. Salford's answer to Joe Pesky. I put love and Lauren to the back of my mind. As I'd booked a late table, it was still an hour to dinner, so I strolled down to the hotel spa and wet rooms to meet the American. The little blonde had done her best with the swim shorts, but I didn't recognise the label on my robe and I was sure it wasn't pure cotton. The spa was deserted and I slipped into one of the two massive hot tubs and set the jets bubbling. Mitch stepped in a couple of minutes later and sat opposite me. He turned down his mouth and nodded appreciatively. You don't get this treatment in the corps, Mr Fuller. I can see that for certain. I didn't get it in the regiment either, mate. That said, you Yanks always had better kit and better rations than us. We used to nick loads of stuff from the boys who came over on secondment. The American slid down into the steaming water until just his head was visible. He rolled his neck. Once it had cracked a couple of times, he seemed satisfied. Then he eyed me. Something was obviously bothering him about the attack on Blackman. What I said earlier, sir, in the car. When J.E. stepped out into that corridor, both those guys had a clear shot at him, but they didn't fire. Then you stepped out and... One instantly opened up at you. Right so far? Go on. Okay. So you took out the guy kneeling at the elevator just as I was exiting the doorway. Now, I'm of mind that if the second shooter hadn't hesitated, he could have killed you both. But he wanted a clear shot at you without hitting Blackman. That gave me the time to fire on him. So what you're saying is that young Fack want us out of the equation more than they want Blackman dead? He struggled with something for a moment. Not exactly, Mr. Fuller. I do believe they want to keep Blackman alive. At least long enough to humiliate him, to ruin him. And I believe that this is a war between our team and theirs. But there's something else. Now, you can call this intuition or a gut feeling or whatever, but those guys wanted you, sir, not Blackman. Not the CP guys, not even me. They wanted you, Mr. Fuller. I let my head fall back against the edge of the tub and allowed the hot bubbles to massage my shoulders. Probably before the action at the Midland, I would have kept my counsel. But the American had now shown his worth on two occasions. He had earned the right to know the full story. Over the next twenty minutes, I told him the tale of T.G., of how the job had been compromised, how only days ago we had learned how Frankie Green met his end, and who had been responsible. Mitch had listened intently and without interruption. Finally, he nodded. Well, sir, I'm of mind to say that some of this makes sense now. It does? Why, yes, sir. I now understand why you and Mr. Colgan are so keen to dispose of this guy, Al Mufti. But... But what, Mitch? Well, I know how you have identified our target. But I think the bigger question is, how has he identified you? He had a point. Des Kogan's story. It had been the first time I'd seen Lauren so worried about Rick. I also knew why. Her feelings towards him were becoming more and more obvious. 
My old pal would need to sort things out with the girl. And soon. We all met a couple of blocks from the railway pub in Salford, then split into pairs and entered separately. Rick and Mitch first. Now, I've been in plenty of rough boozes in my time, and I'm not shy saying I felt like some of them too. However, the railway was up amongst the roughest I've ever had the dubious pleasure of drinking in. It was a small corner public house with a stone floor that didn't look like it had seen a brush or mop in years. As for beer, the place sold Borringtons and nothing else. Now, there were many rum tales about the railway, from gunfights to badger baiting, but the best one I'd heard was about a bloke who'd let his prize chicken loose in the bar for a runabout. Seconds later, some other punter's Jack Russell flew out from under a table and ripped its head off. You gotta love them stories, eh? However, more important to us, the railway was where tricky Mickey Fennick held court at lunchtime each day. Tricky was a mid-ranking cocaine dealer who supplied large parts of Salford and Ancourt. This made him a serious player. He also ran a gang, or crew as he would call them, by the name of the Broughton Bandits. A ragtag mob made up of old hands and skinny teens, eager to make their mark in the criminal world. Now, gangs were nothing new in the working-class areas of Manchester. From as early as the 1870s, Salford and the surrounding townships had wee gangs called scuttlers, what we might call hooligans today, who caused havoc with their criminal activities and organised street fights. Jump forward to the 1960s and it was the quality street gang that were the most feared in the city. In the 20 years that the gang supposedly organised Manchester's crime, none of its alleged members were ever convicted of a serious matter. I'll let you stew on that snippet. Somehow these days, gangsters had got, well, how can I put it, less classy. Maybe it's the fucking hoodies, eh? As Lauren and I walked through the door, Rick and Mitch were at the bar trying to get the landlord to serve them a soft drink. They both came away with halves of Boddington's, shaking their heads. Tricky was in one corner. He was a big lad and looked like he'd done a fair amount of Clen Booterall in his day. He spotted a broken nose and had enough scar tissue around the eyes to keep Chuck Bodak happy for weeks. Perched either side of Tricky were two of his crew. They boasted the regulation number one crews, shiny tracksuits and lots of bling. Just like Vinny Pitbull Vasquez, Tricky knew Rick from back in his dim and distant, and therefore by his pseudonym of Stephen Coletti. Now, what our fine upstanding leader had failed to mention to the rest of the team was that the reason Tricky knew of Mr Coletti was because some years back Rick had slaughtered one of Tricky's runners. Not a good start to the proceedings. Neither Lauren nor my good self acknowledged our partners in crime. We simply grabbed a couple of pints of bodies, excellently kept by the way, sat in the opposing corner and waited for the fireworks to start with a keen interest. The second Rick and Mitch stepped within ten feet of Tricky. Both his crew laid their respective pieces on the table, resting one hand on their weapons while scratching their bollocks with the other. Again, another modern thug habit I can't get my head around. Gangsters tend to like big guns, and this pair were no exception. The lad to the right of his boss had a Ruger Super Red Hawk. That's the ultimate Ruger, chambered to 480 with a box stock horned around. The bullet flies at just under 1,200 feet per second. In the right hand, it stopped just about anything in its tracks. The wee jobby on the left had also gone with the same US maker and posted a P89, largely based on the Browning M1911. It's another big, blocky, powerful gun. I had to admit it was an impressive show of strength. If the other drinkers dotted about the bar had noticed the violence in the air, they weren't showing it. Even the landlord didn't bat an eye at the pissing contest. He just polished his pumps and kept his mouth shut. Mitch knowingly took a step to his right to give me a clear view of all three players. I slid my clock from my jeans and held it under the table out of sight. Lauren stood as if to go to the ladies, but stopped the second she had a full view of our little gang. 
I saw her slip her hand into her bag where her own SLP was concealed. If the two fools sitting either side of her target gangster made a move, it'd be the last. Drake took a step closer. All right, Tricky. What are you doing on my turf, Calais? I've come to do you a favour. The big gangster snorted down his nose. Both his minions laughed along with him just for the fucking sake of it. There was more furious crotch scratching. And why would Joel Davis's lackey want to do a thing like that, eh? I don't work for Joel anymore. Right hand man couldn't keep his mouth shut. That's cause he's fucking dead, isn't it? Tricky shot his boy a look that said shut the fuck up, then turned back to Dick. So, who are you working for then? I'm self employed. An entrepreneur, eh? I do okay. Tricky took a glance at Big Mitch. Who's the big lad? Mitch let his jacket fall open to reveal his magnum in all its glory. The two brave boys with the Rugers went to funny colour. He's my chauffeur, said Rick, unable to hide the sarcasm in his tone. Tricky wasn't so easily scared. So what's this favour you want to do me then? It better be good. I'm not keen on being disturbed by trespassers. They tend to end up back on the other side of the tracks with holes in their head. I'm going to keep you alive, said Rick quietly. Breathing, walking, that kind of stuff. That good enough for you? The guy with the big red hawk cocked the revolver to single action, but left it where it was. Tricky put his hand on the gun and shook his head. He returned his gaze to Rick. This is not your best move, Colletti. I mean, I'm a patient man, but I'm thinking, should I just let my boys chop you right now? I haven't forgotten what you did to my runner. Because of you, the boy had more fucking holes in him than a cheese grater. Rick kept his voice level. That was business and you know it. The runner was a grass and Mr Davis was incensed. I had no choice in the matter. Tricky sat back and cracked his neck. Maybe he was. So maybe that's why you're still breathing, eh? Touché, spat Rick. So do you want to hear what I have to say or do we keep playing my dick is bigger than yours all fucking afternoon? Tricky sat up straight and put his hands on the table. He hadn't survived Manchester's drug trade for twenty years without having some common sense. How about we all put these shooters away and sit down? And that includes him in the corner and the fit burn at the bar. Rick turned and gave me the nod. Lauren sauntered back to her seat and the edginess dropped a notch. Rick sat opposite Tricky. Your boy Vinny, he said. What about him? Have you noticed he hasn't bought any gear recently? Tricky screwed up his face. Fucking hell, Kalei. Runners come and go, you know that. Most of them use too much of their own product. People ain't no exception. He'll be back when he's got some coin. Rex shook his head. He's on his toes. Really? He's grassy, tricky. Big style. The big gangster's face turned thunderous. I think you need to explain yourself a little, Coletti. Saying that kind of thing about a man like Pitbull can get a man in serious trouble. Rick pulled out a picture of Sidi Kalmufti and pushed it across a small circular table. There's a new crew in town, in Ancoats to be precise. Not that they'll stop there. The guy in that picture is running them. They've started hitting all the runners in your areas, roughing them up, putting the frighteners on them big style. I happen to know that Vinny dropped your name as his supplier and where you work out of. Now, call me old-fashioned, but I reckon their next move is to slot you. Rick glanced at each of Trekkie's minders in turn. And your little crew. Clear the decks out uh, with the old, so to speak. Trekkie was shaking with anger. I'd like to see the fuckers try. They don't know who they're dealing with. Rick raised a hand. With all due respect, Tricky, it's you who doesn't know the score. This crew had big money behind them. They're well armed and well organised, like nothing this town has seen since the fucking IRA. You're saying the paramilitaries? Of assault. And how do you know so much about this so-called new crew? 
That's my business. And what's in it for you? I have an interest in seeing them eliminated. Trekker snorted again and gave his boys a nudge. Eliminated, eh? That's a good way of putting it. Ain't it, lads? I think we've got the fucking Terminator sitting opposite. Both Tricky's boys figured that this was hilarious and went about touching knuckles across the table. They looked proper twats. That kept saying, You're going to need some help with this crew. We can... Tricky pointed. His temper, pride and stupidity had got the better of him. We don't need your help, Coletti. Your big-time dealer, Meg Davis, is dead in the ground. Without him behind you, you ain't nothing no more. You're out of touch, pal. Times they're a-changing, yeah? Just like the fucking tune, man. I've got twenty guns I can call on, so if this camel fucker wants to come and take us on, let him try. This is my town, my turf. Surprisingly, Mitch chirped up. He gestured towards the big bay window to the left of the three gangsters. Y'all like sitting in the window? Is that so you can see outside or so the guy with the AK-47 across the street can blow your stupid heads off? All three turned to see the empty footpath opposite. Trickhead didn't find Mitch's humour amusing. He snarled. Yeah, funny guy. He turned to Rick and pointed. Why don't you take your redneck friend home? In fact, why don't you all fuck off before this gets messy? Rex slid a business card across the table and stood. We don't want anything from this arrangement, Tricky. We don't want your turf. We don't want your customers. He tapped Al moved his picture with his finger. Just keep this, eh? Get some copies made. Hand them around to your runners. If the fucker turns up and you change your mind, call me. That's all I'm asking. The pair locked eyes like two heavyweights before the first bell. Finally, Tricky nodded. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. Without the goodwill of Tricky and his gang, we couldn't spring our trap. That said, it was his funeral. If we didn't get to Al Mufti soon, I reckon the Salford Cruise days were numbered. Either way, it was back to the lock-up and back to the drawing board. I flicked through our file, desperate to try and find a hole in young Fax's armour, but to no avail. All I got was sick to my stomach at the shocking crime scene pictures and a rising sense of my own anger at events long past. Lauren made us all a delicious chicken dinner, yet we picked at it and sat around in silence, deflated, brooding. The evening was uncomfortably humid as I stepped out for a smoke. The rain had left the air damp and the rising heat made for a sticky evening. I loaded my pipe and took a deep drag, feeling the nicotine do its job. As I tapped out the bowl, ready to refill, my mobile buzzed. Hello? Hello, Des. It's Henry. Henrietta Duval, Todd's friend. I could hear that she was somewhere noisy, a bard or a club. Oh, hi, Henry. You OK, Hen? I'm fine, Des. It's just, well, it made me nothing. But remember when you asked me if there had been anybody suspicious ever hanging around with Todd? Aye, go on, Hen. Well, I said no, didn't I? You did? Well, I mean, it's just a feeling, and I can't be 100% sure, but ages ago, when I first met Todd, I was in his apartment when a guy came up to see him. He was older than him, maybe 30, dressed like something out of the 80s. They went into the kitchen to talk as... They had some kind of secret. He didn't stay long, but I just got the impression he was a bit dodgy, you know. The description hit me like a brick, and my mind flipped through those old CIA surveillance reports I'd just reread. Day six, the unidentified male stayed fifteen minutes. Henry was the guy Arabic, tall, slim. Yes, that's him. So, why you tell me now, Hen? Well, he's here. In the club now. I felt my heart skip a beat. Where are you? I'm in the village, well, on the edge of it. I'm in the new union on Princess Street. I stepped back inside into the cool of the lock-up, put my hand over the phone and hissed. Get up now, 
We've got Al Mufti in a bar off Canal Street. The team instantly set about their tasks. I got back on the phone. Can you still see him, Henry? Yes, he's watching the show. Are there any other guys with him? I can't really tell this. I mean, it's packed in here. Okay, now listen very carefully, hon. Don't go near this guy or let him catch you watching him. Just ring me if he leaves, yeah? Oh, okay. This is rather exciting, isn't it? Have I solved the case? Henry, don't joke about this guy, darling. Stay out of his way and promise you'll call if he moves or you feel scared. Okay? Okay. Not all the shutters opened on the lock-up and out rumbled Lauren's RS6. Zack was driving. He opened the window and handed me my Glock 19 and a spare mag. Let's go do this, he said. Lauren North Story There was no time to plan. Rick handed out four sets of covert comms from the case. We'd all seen to our individual weapons. Comms check now, please, shouted Rick over the growl of the RS-6's engine. We all pushed in the tiny wireless earpieces and checked the receivers were switched on. I pinned my mic to my jacket, depressed the pressel attached to it, tested my unit and got three thumbs up. Once we had all repeated the process and were all happy, the car fell silent. Rick swung the Audi into Princess Street. OK, listen up. Des, as you can ID Henrietta, I want you and Lauren to get inside the bar, find her and find our target. I want to know the second he leaves. If he comes out the front, I'll get up close and take him out there and then. Mitch, this place is a hotel, so it'll have rear exits and upper fire escapes. Take the back. Same scenario. If you get eyes on, just slot the fucker and get back to the car. Questions? There were none. Good, he said. Let's get this done. I've had enough of this fucker already. We dumped the car and stepped out into the night. Mitch jogged to the rear of the hotel as ordered. Rick perched himself on the low wall separating the waterway from the road. Des and I linked arms and strode to the New Union's Canal Street entrance. Just an ordinary couple looking to enjoy all the glitz and glamour the village had to offer. The tables and chairs outside the bar were packed, the street teeming with people. The air was muggy after the earlier rain, and muscle-bound shirtless men stood guzzling pints from plastic glasses as the bouncers kept a careful eye on them. And that was our first issue. As we approached, I noticed the doorman was searching old bags on entry. As both my Colt and ASP were sitting inside my brand new Alviero Martini number, that was an issue. I let Des walk in front of me as I removed both and pushed them into my Levi's. As we got to the door, I could feel the heat of hundreds of bodies radiating from inside the place. Cheesy pop blasted our senses. I dutifully opened my bag for the monstrously built doorman, and we were both allowed inside. Stay close, said Des. We're looking for a blind, nineteen, very pretty. As we entered, there was a small traditional-style bar to our left, but as we ventured further into the building, it opened up into a large oblong room with a stage at one end. At the dance floor was a riding mass of people of all shapes and sizes. A heady mix of music, heat and flashing lights made it hard to distinguish male from female, let alone gay from straight. The stage was lit by dozens of spotlights. Dancing to thunderously loud Kylie was a troupe of transgender performers, all spinning around in sync, dressed like their heroine. Jeezo! shouted Des. I've never seen anything like this in my life. You wouldn't know what you'd be going home with, eh? I nodded towards a stunningly beautiful blonde girl who was leaning against a pillar, drinking a bottle of blue wicked through a straw and fending off the attentions of two young men. That our girl? He turned. Aye, well spotted, hen. Stay here, see if you can find our boy while you're at it. I don't want him creeping up on me. I knew what he meant. From what Rick had told us, he believed that young Fack had been able to identify him at the Midland Hotel. That meant they may have photographs of Des and me, too. I rested my hand on my coat and kept my eyes peeled. Des Cogan's story. Shoving my way through the crowds towards Henrietta, I wasn't surprised that she was surrounded by young lads. She was a fine-looking girl. That said, I had some bad news for them. 
I was about to dampen their ardour. All right, Hen, I shouted above the din. Henry's eyes widened. I didn't know if her excitement was real or intended to free her of her admirers, but she jumped forward, screamed my name, and to my horror threw her arms around my neck and kissed me full on the mouth. One boy turned and gave me a derisory look. Who's this, Henry, your dad? There was no time for arguments. I grabbed his left elbow and dug my thumb into the joint. That's very painful. Fuck off, I said in my best glass region. The boy fell back against the pillar holding his left hand, which I knew would be totally numb. I gave his pal a manic smile, slipped my arm around Henrietta's waist and moved away. Where is he now? I asked. Who? she said. I looked her in the eyes and for the first time noticed she was stoned. My heart sank. Oh, for fuck's sake, Henry, I shouted. The guy you rang me about, where the fuck is he? She looked at me blankly for a second, before I saw a moment of recollection. Oh, sorry, babe, yes, the creepy guy with the beard. Yeah, that's him. Where is he? She looked about. He's here somewhere. I didn't see him go. Then the light went out again, and she wrapped her arms around my neck for a second time. You're very handsome, Des, she slurred. I've slept with older men before, you know. I prized her away. Henry, please, I need you to help me find him. What was he wearing? She pursed her lips like the petulant child she was. It's not very nice. I gripped her shoulders. Henry! I thought she was going to stamp her fucking foot. Finally, after another pout, she got her memory back. A suit. He was wearing a suit. He looked like John Travolta's silly man. I cast my mind back to the days when I still went to the pictures. You mean like in the old film, the one with all the disco dancing, staying alive? She nodded drunkenly. Yep. My calms crackled. It was Lauren. Two o'clock, near the stage. And there he was, Sadiq al-Mufti, all white suit and shiny hair. If Henry had the attention of the boys in the bar, our Sid was just as popular. The Arab had his arm draped around a fresh-faced teenage lad. Not in the slightest bit hypocritical then, eh, pal? I've got him, I said. Rick was straight on the mic from outside. Confirm positive ID, over. I moved slightly closer, so I had one of the three supporting pillars that loomed either side of the dance floor to stand behind. From my position, I could see both our target and Lauren. I was shocked at how much like his father Al Mufti was. It didn't really come over in the stills or CCTV, but in the flesh, the resemblance was uncanny. What was equally odd was that the boy had chosen to copy his father's hairstyle and clothing almost exactly. It could have been 1987, and Abdallah could have been standing there amongst the revelers. I touched my pretzel. Roger that, I replied. Positive. If he goes to the gents, I'm going to take him in there. Over. I saw Lauren nod her acknowledgement. That's a Roger, said Rick. Two clicks from Mitch. It was my call. I'd weighed up the options. The bog was a safer location than the street. Whether he went to stand up or sit down, it wouldn't alter things. Follow him in, get in super close and put two in his lower back just above the pelvis. Less chance of the rounds exiting that way, and other than the guys ticking a piss in the stalls, no one would hear a thing. I'd be back in the RS6 before you could say Jack Robinson. He'd die slow, but that wasn't my problem. So did Todd Blackman. I waited ten endless minutes, my ears pounded by the seemingly limitless stream of sugar pop. Finally, Al Mufti dropped his arm from around his friend, kissed him lightly on the mouth and began to explain something to him. The younger lad was nodding. I touched my comms again. He's on the move. Three double clicks. He's towards me in the main door. Looks like he's leaving. Three double clicks. The Arab was shoving his way through the mass of bodies on the dance floor. He was twenty feet away when I felt a tug on my sleeve. I turned to see Henrietta Duval even more stoned than before. Not now, Henry, I barked and pushed her gently away and behind me. She staggered sideways and bawled. Don't be a shit, Des. I came to tell you something, something important. 
She lifted a stray arm and pointed directly at our Mufti. See, that's the guy, the creepy one. That's him, the guy you want. There. Whether he'd heard or had just seen Henry's movements, I couldn't be certain. But I watched as his dark eyes were drawn to her, examining her. I could almost see his brain computing, assessing exactly what he had witnessed. Then he followed her gaze, and a split second later, he found me. Lauren North's story I saw the look of recognition. Al Mufti spotted the girl, then looked straight at Des. His face was instantly contorted with hatred. He drew a gun from inside his jacket and opened fire without a second thought. Henrietta was hit in her chest and I saw her legs give way. It was immediate chaos. Al Mufti began hacking his way through the crowd using the barrel of his gun as a club. Then determined to cause the maximum pandemonium to disguise his exit, he fired into the air once, twice. The massive doorman who'd checked my bag on the way in was pushing through the crowd towards the Arab. Al Mufti spotted him, stood stock still, extended his arms and adopted the classic pistol shooter's stance. He opened up, hitting a young black guy to the left of the bouncer with his first effort, but then tearing open the big man's neck with his second round. The security man fell, blood pouring from the wound, and I knew he wouldn't make it. At that, the music was turned off and all I could hear was screaming. My own survival instincts took over. I was in danger of being trampled by the stampeding crowd, so I took shelter behind the pillar opposite Des's position. I could see and hear him relaying the events to Mitch and Rick outside. Rick was desperate to know the area our Mufti would exit. I knew I needed to stay close to our target in order to give him that information, but the sheer numbers of panicking, terrified revellers made progress almost impossible. Ahead of me I saw Al Mufti rip off his white suit jacket and throw it over his head. A split second later, he disappeared from view. Playing the percentages was the best I could hope for. The bar had two exits proper and two rear fire exits, both already pushed open by the crowd desperate to escape the gunfire. People were being trampled underfoot, broken glass was everywhere. Making myself as tall as possible, I scanned the crowd but I couldn't see the Arab. Then the fire alarm went off. Another diversionary tactic. Fire glasses are placed by fire exits. I got on my comms. I think our target may have just set off the fire alarm. Keep eyes on those rear fire exits, Mitch. Roger that, answered the American. Then a split second later... Confirmed. Target confirmed. I have eyes on. Al Mufti is exiting rear of building. Next I heard the unmistakable sound of small arms fire rattling around the enclosed space at the back of the hotel. There were more screams from the crowd. Mitch was back on comms. Target has a hostage. Repeat hostage. White female, dark hair, black dress. Two civilians down. Repeat two casualties. I'm unable to return fire. Over. Finally, I was out in the open. I clocked Mitch, who was desperately pushing his way through terrified partygoers to get out of the back alley. Sirens wailed in the distance, only adding to the sense of panic. Ahead, I could see Al Mufti. He was dragging a young girl by the hair and waving his handgun about wildly. People didn't know where to go and began running back in our direction, away from the obvious threat. We were maybe ten metres behind our target. We may as well have been ten thousand. As he hit the street and clear air, the Arab dropped the girl in a heap and ran off onto Princess Street and out of sight. Rick Fuller's story I spotted him in an instant. Those white flared trousers, black satin shirt, ponytail, even a place as diverse as the village our Mufti would have been easy to see. He sprinted across Princess Street, across the canal and turned immediate right. I was on his tail, arms and legs pumping hard. I figured he was heading towards the Palace Theatre Junction. From there he could lose himself in the after-show crowds, maybe even cross the road and slip into the Ritz or one of the other bars in the area. But he didn't. Al Mufti put on the brakes and skidded to a halt at the entrance to the NCP car park. And as he did so, he turned his head and saw me. The Palace car park is a gated building, but the Arab's luck was in... Just as he reached the pedestrian entrance, a customer was on his way out. He grabbed the guy, pulled him to the floor and sprinted inside. 
I was no more than a second or two behind him and I kicked the closing gate open as I reached it, leaving the poor bloke shouting abuse on the pavement. How muffed he made for the stairs. He shoved at the heavy door leading to the landings, disappeared from view and started his ascent. I followed, breathing hard. Not time for tactics. This was a straight race and chase. I could hear him pounding the stairs above me, my own feet mirroring his, my heart racing, leg muscles burning. I heard him exit the landing above me onto a car level. As I pulled on the door to follow him out, he opened fire. I ducked back into cover and his two bullets flew harmlessly over my head and ricocheted down the stairs behind me. I pulled my own sig, crouched down behind the jam, punched the weapon forward and arced it left to right. In that moment he was gone. I stayed in the crouch and did my best to listen for him but the mixture of police and ambulance sirens arriving at the new union and the blood rushing in my ears made it impossible. Dropping down into a prone position, I scanned the floor for a wayward pair of feet. He had to be close, very close. They are waiting for me to make my move. I took slow, steady breaths, forcing my body to recover from the sprint and stair climb. Sweat poured down my temples and spine as I fought for control of my heart rate. I knew there was only a limited time I could stay in position. Sooner or later, some innocent bystander would be in the lift or climbing the stairs to collect their car and a bastard would have another chance at an hostage. I set myself and sprinted to the first parked car. He didn't make his move and all I could hear as I dropped him behind a big 4x4 were more distant sirens and screams. I had no choice but to methodically check between each row of cars. How Mufti had all the ideal hiding places under or between the myriad of vehicles or behind the dozens of supporting pillars. He had the advantage, but I couldn't give up. As I cleared the third row, I heard a stumble and a grunt off to my right. Seconds later, the repeating blare of a car horn filled all my senses. As the Arab had scurried between a row of vehicles, he must have clipped one, activating the car's alarm in the process. He'd given away his position. Once again, he was off and running... I powered after him, gaining with every stride. Was I close enough? Only one way to find out. I squeezed the trigger twice and the SIG responded, but both rounds went astray of the target. Firing single-handed on the move at a running man was a lottery at best. He hit the stairs again, but rather than go downward as I'd expected, he carried on his climb. I took two stairs at a time, driving my body upward. Our Mufti had almost twenty years on me, but he wasn't going to get away, not in a foot race. He was tiring, I could sense it. He climbed flight after flight until there was nowhere else to go. I heard the door at the very top floor open and swing closed. I reached the landing and leant against the heavy fire door, blowing hard, pulse pounding, weapon at the ready. I wiped the sweat from my eyes and took a cautious look. He'd gone to ground again. As I regained my breath, I did a quick calculation in my head. He'd fired nine rounds, five in the bar, two in the alley and now two at me. I was certain he was using a nine-shot capacity M191145. Unlucky. Unless our Mufti had a spare mag, he was fucked. I checked my SIG and stepped out into the garage. Moving quickly and methodically and confident he was without ammunition, I knew it was just a matter of time before I finished him. Then I heard a car engine fire. There was a squeal of tyres and a black Ford C-Max came hurtling out of a space ten metres in front of me. Now I knew why he'd chosen to climb the stairs. He had to make a U at the end of the road to make the down ramp, so I set myself and raised my weapon. As the car broadsided around the turn, I saw the windows were down our Mufti floored the car and as it straightened he opened up at me with an MP5 on fully automatic. I dove for cover, skinning my knees and elbows as 9 mil rounds clattered around the parked cars and skidded off the concrete floors. As I raised my head, the C-Max and our target were disappearing down the ramp. Dragging myself upwards, I cursed my stupidity and once again sprinted for the door. Could I run down 12 flights of stairs before the Arab could drive 6 ramps? The race was on again, and I negotiated the stairs with a mixture of runs and jumps. As I approached landing four, I lost my footing. Grabbing the handrail slowed me some, but I still hit the floor hard and I felt a sharp pain in my shoulder as I struck the wall. I scrambled to my feet and began again, running four or five steps, then jumping the rest. 
As I made the bottom landing, I could hear the squealing tyres and screaming engine of Al Mufti's car. I tore open the door and brought the SIG up into the aim a split second too late. The C-Max smashed through the exit barrier and I saw the flash of his brake lights as he slewed the car out onto the street. As I stood on the pavement, hands on my head, desperate to get some oxygen in my burning lungs, soaked in sweat, battered and bruised, I cursed my luck. It had been a long time since I'd been so pissed off. I'd lost him. He was gone. And I tore my new fucking D&G trousers. Des Colgan's story. Our glorious leader was not a happy bunny. Rick had demanded we go for a drink and fought the consequences. For once, his grand ideas about the team using constant anti-surveillance techniques had been bent off due to what appeared to be a wardrobe malfunction. We were grouped around a small table in the Thirsty Scholar. The pub was busy with student types and a band were setting up on a race section. Rick sat with a glass of Jameson's, examining a small tear in the knee of his pants. Face like fucking thunder. Now I've been acquainted with the big man long enough to know when to stay out of his way. I know exactly when to let him throw all his toys out of his very expensive pram. Unfortunately, Mitch didn't. Did y'all not consider calling us on our mobiles, Mr. Fuller? That gave Mitch the hard stare and took a swig of his whiskey. And when exactly did you think it opportune for me to make this call, Mitch? As I was sprinting along the street? Maybe as I was running up twelve flights of stairs? No? Okay, how about when I was being shot at? Rex's voice was becoming louder with his suggestion. Finally, he bellowed. Or maybe whilst I was ripping my fucking trousers. Mitch leaned away from Mr. Angry and sipped his Dr. Pepper. I gave him a look that I hoped he'd understand. Moments later, he seemed to grasp the situation and, like the rest of us, fell silent. Two drinks in, Rick had calmed down some. He turned to Lauren. What I sign on the news? He asked. She scrolled the feeds on her phone. The doorman was pronounced dead at the scene. The guy next to him and two kids wounded in the rear yard are described as comfortable. Henrietta Duval is critical but stable. Rick nodded. Anything about our target? She shook her head. Not much. There's a vague description, that's all. Says the cops are treating it as a hate crime. Some long not to who hates gays. As Lauren scrolled some more, her phone rang in her hand. She stood to go outside. I think I should take this, she said. I got another round in. By the time I was back at the table, Lauren had returned from her call. That was Larry, she said. He wants to see me now. Rick cocked his head quizzically. So late. I thought he was off the case anyway. He is, said Lauren. They've essentially suspended him. He's on indefinite gardening leave. So what does he want then? I asked. She shrugged. He won't say on the phone, just that it's important. Rick nodded. Okay, we'll take Mitch with you. She shook her head. He won't talk with Mitch around. We found that out the hard way. Rick blew air down his nose. I could see he wasn't happy. I broke the ice. Look, mate, Lauren's a big girl. She can look after herself. I reckon Al Mufti and his crew will be keeping their heads down for a while, eh? I mean, there must be dozens of pictures of him available to the cops from tonight's debacle. He might even be on his toes. Rick wasn't sure. He's not the type, does he's cocky, confident, he won't run. Aye, I said, but he might hide for a while. Rick was still reluctant. Maybe. All right, you go, Lauren, but don't take any chances, OK? OK, she said, smiling. And to everyone's surprise, leaned over and gave the big man a peck on the cheek as she left. I checked my watch. Well, while well, the going's good, I reckon I'll go and see my pretty wee landlady friend. Rick shook his head in disgust. I suppose that leaves me and Clint Eastwood here to try and figure out our next move. I pulled on my coat, slapped Rick on the back and said, Maybe you can go shopping for new trousers together. See ya.
Lauren North story. I'd driven my Audi the short hop to Piccadilly. Then, just as Rick had insisted, I went through some anti-surveillance drills and caught a tram to Heaton Park. Larry lived nearby, but rather than go to his home, I agreed to meet him at his local, the Ostrich. The pub sat overlooking the historic park. The 600-acre estate was renovated as part of Manchester's Millennium Project and boasted an 18-hole golf course, a boating lake and the only flat green bowling in the city. The ostrich had a lovely polished wood bar with brass fittings and a pool room off to one side. It was busy with locals, some of who took advantage of the fact that the pub was one of the few remaining establishments in the area to be dog-friendly. I guess that these canine owners regularly made the excuse of walking their pooches in the park before nipping in for a pint or two of real ale. I counted three of our four-legged friends as I sat down next to a very harried-looking Larry Simpson. "'You look stressed,' I offered, considering you're on your holidays. "'Very funny.' Larry gulped at his pint and I got the impression he'd had one or two earlier. "'How's the spy business?' he said. I looked at my watch. There was two hours to closing. Whatever Larry had to tell me, he'd need to make it quick. "'Busy,' I said, and it's getting past my bedtime. "'Rick, waiting for you, is he?' I turned in my seat. "'Look, Larry, if you brought me all the way across town to point score, you're barking up the wrong tree. You said you had some important information. That is the only reason I'm here. Are we clear?' He managed a thin smile. "'Okay, okay. Look, I'm sorry about the other day, Lauren. As soon as I saw the yank, I just lost my head, that's all. All this secret service stuff makes me nervous. I wanted to help you, honestly, I did.' I sat back and took a sip of my G&T. True, Larry was a nice guy. However, his conscience, his moralistic stance and his inability to see the bigger picture hadn't helped our cause one bit. And, as he'd brought me out on the premise of new intelligence, I was in no mood to massage his idealistic ego. Yes, you told me that on the day, but you didn't help me, did you? Wanting and doing are two very different things, Larry. I got straight to the crooks. I presume you went straight down to the station with those stills you were supposed to give to us? Give them to the murder inquiry team, did you? No, I didn't. Really, Larry? Why not? Who would have thought they'd get you back in favour with the new chief? What's his name? Williams? Larry looked like he'd just taken the top off a sour milk carton. You must be joking. DCS Williams? He's no intention of moving the case forward. He's in Blackman's pocket. I shook my head ruefully. So you sat on them, did nothing, right? Larry stood and waved his empty. Not exactly. Another, I'm having one. No thanks, I said, laying my palm on the top of my glass. I need my wits about me these days. I gave him a sarcastic smile of my own. What with all the bad guys still out there and all... Larry returned with his beer, sat and took a deep breath. I may not be a spy or an MI5 agent, Lauren, but your tale about the guy in those pictures being just a witness didn't wash with me. I said so at the time, didn't I? You made yourself perfectly clear, Larry. Yes, well, like I said, sorry about that. Anyway... Like you, I was aware that the search teams hadn't recovered Todd's mobile from either the murder scene or his flat on the keys. It was a concern to our lads straight away. So when you came to me with your tale, I instantly presumed that somehow you had been able to obtain Todd's phone records, hence the need for the CCTV of the Sackville Gardens phone box and your interest in the caller. I raised my eyebrows. Well done, Detective. Two points. Larry glared at my irony but ploughed on. We knew Todd had been out in the area of Sackville Gardens on the night he was killed. Henrietta Duval told us as much. I figured that you'd identified the call box from Todd's records, matched the time of the call to the CCTV footage and bingo. You had a picture of the man that called Todd just hours before he was murdered. The man who was just streets away from Todd's last known location. Your number one suspect... I shrugged. This was old news. Again, well done, but you couldn't hand those pictures over, could you, Detective? 
You were so worried about your precious reputation, you kept them to yourself. He shook his head. It had nothing to do with my reputation, and you know it. I couldn't hand them over and watch you just run roughshod over the justice system. I eyed him. People were dying, and I was tired of hearing the same old excuses. Oh, yeah, I know your reasons, all right. It went against your haughty principles. In fact, your little lesson in ethics was so helpful, I went straight home and promised to be a good girl guide in future. No need for cynicism, he muttered. No? Well, let me tell you this, Mr. High and Mighty. Your little delaying tactic, your lecture on morality and playing by the rules ensured we spent several wasted hours obtaining our own pictures of our suspect. I did my best to keep my voice down. And you know what playing by the fucking rules got us, Larry? It got us dead people. Whilst you pontificated about the rights and wrongs of releasing vital clues about the identity of Todd's killer, he and his pals were turning the streets of Manchester red with blood. Have you seen the news tonight, detective? Of course. Of course you have, yeah. The new union, one dead, Henrietta Duval critical, three others wounded. That was our man, your man, Larry, the one in those pictures, and you... I pointed. You slowed us down. He nodded a little too quickly, showing his discomfort. As he took another swig of his beer, I noticed his hands were shaking. Things were all coming on top for our chief inspector. Larry rummaged under the table and pulled out his briefcase. He began to open it, but stopped and rested his hands on the clasp. As he looked into my eyes, I saw turmoil laced with genuine sorrow. I'll have to live with that decision, Lauren. I know that, and I don't need you to remind me. The fact that some of this could have been prevented will play out in my own private nightmares. I know they've already paid me a visit, and I know now I was wrong. So just hear me out, OK? He removed some papers from his case. They appeared full of manic scribbles. After I left you that day, he began... I did go to see DCS Williams. He held up a hand. Don't worry, I didn't mention you. I told him that an informant had given me a tip about a suspect scene with Todd the night he was killed, and that I had some CCTV stills of him. And? And I came away with a flea in my ear and a warning not to interfere in his investigation. Unsurprising? Exactly. Anyway, I went back home, brooded and drank too much. Like all detectives do. He ran his hands through his hair. I was foolish. I should have come straight to you then. I should have realised that the heavyweight politics at work would never allow for a normal investigation. He rummaged in his case and pulled out a sheaf of ten by eight photographs and placed them alongside his notes. Then there was the assassination attempt on J.E. Blackman at the Midland Hotel. What could be spared from my team, Soku, were given the job of investigating the shootings. Of course, they'd already been through the CCTV footage from in and around the hotel. However, as you know, I happen to be good friends with the guy who runs the city's camera unit. And I got these. He pushed a small pile of stills over the table. They clearly show that the man who made the call from the Sackville Gardens call box was also clearly involved in the attack on Senator Blackman. As I dutifully flicked through the shots, I began to think I'd had a wasted journey. After all, we already knew the identity of the gang behind the shootings at the Midland. To see pictures of Sidiq Al Mufti in the area of the hotel was hardly going to be a revelation. The pictures did indeed show the Arabs standing in St. Peter's Square, both alone and in the company of three other men. Larry tapped one picture. These three, standing with our man, are the shooters. Positive IDs from the internal CCTV. Thankfully, my detective sergeant still speaks to me and sent me these. Larry leafed through until he found two other shots taken from the Midland Hotel's own system, showing the same three men walking into what looked like a side or staff entrance. They were openly carrying weapons. I studied the pictures. Very casual, considering the Secret Service were in the lobby. 
Yes, and how slack was their marking. No one at the rear entrance, no one on the emergency exits. I figured the job stank and I was right. I checked all the cameras within half a mile of the hotel in the run-up to the shooting. Finally, I came across this. The reason I called you. Larry handed me another picture from his case. I was going to hand all this over to Soku. That was until I saw this last shot. He turned and looked into my eyes. You were right. I hate to admit it, but this... This picture says it all. The cops are in over their heads. This needs to be dealt with your way. I'm so sorry, Lauren. I studied the picture. You want that drink now? He asked. Make it a double, I said. Rick Fuller's story. I needed a shower and to change my damaged trousers. By the time I sat across from Mitch in the cool of our lock-up, I figured Lauren would be with Larry. Why do you think the cop wants, Mr. Fuller? I raised my brows. I really don't know. I mean, he's out of the loop. It's hard to imagine he knows anything more than we do. Mitch gave me a knowing look and changed the subject. Hey, Mr. Fuller, never mind Larry. What about that kiss, huh? I didn't realise that you and Miss North were romantically inclined. That's because it's none of your business, Mitch. I was just saying as all. I'll rub some life into my face with both palms. Sorry, mate. I get so touchy about it. We are. Then we're not. Mitch just looked at me and waited. What I mean is, we haven't... I mean, you know, we haven't been in the position to... You mean you haven't slept together? I nodded. Mitch scratched his head. With due respect, sir, you have a beautiful woman there. I mean, she's all over you like a swarm of bees, and you seem more interested in the hole in your trousers. I mean, this thing with your clothes, all these cars in here, that place where you live. You are one uptight guy, I'll say that for you. I haven't always been this way. Well, not with the OCD thing. OCD? Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. I have it. I ain't never heard of that, sir. I'm sorry. Is it fatal? I almost burst out laughing. You are a naive guy, Mitch. No, it isn't fucking fatal. It's a disorder of the brain and affects different people in different ways. For me, it began with cleaning... For instance, if you spilled your drink on the table, I would probably have to scrub the whole kitchen. But when you're working, I mean, when you're in the field, I ain't never seen anyone better. You don't stop to mop up the blood you spill, do you, Mr. Fuller? To be honest, it's the only time I ever feel truly normal, Mitch. That's why I don't think I could ever stop. Ever have a normal life, a relationship. With Lauren? With anyone? He mused on that for a while. So, when did this start, this uh, OCD? Oh, I suppose as a young kid. Not that the doctors knew what it was back in the late 60s. I lost my dad when I was small. He was part of 45 Commando. We were involved in the Battle of the Crater in Aden, 1967. He survived that, but was shot dead in an NLF ambush the day after. My mum never recovered from losing him. I came home from school two days before my 13th birthday to find her with her head in the gas oven. Oh, my Lord. I turned down my mouth. It's a long time ago, son. After that, I was passed between a few distant relatives for a while. But my behaviour became too difficult for them to tolerate and I was put into care. The army saved me. It has a way of doing that on occasion, sir. It does... Anyway, my issues got much worse after my wife was killed. They say that trauma can bring the condition on. Certainly did with me. I fell off the perch for a while. If it hadn't been for Des, I would probably have followed him in mother's footsteps and topped myself. And now? Well, I'll let you be the judge of that, son. I stood and found the kettle. And I have no idea why I'm telling you about my dim and distant... 
Mitch smiled. My mama always said I was a good listener. She was right, Mitch. The American stretched his long, powerful arms over his head. Well, for what my humble opinion is worth, Mr. Fuller, I'd say that when this matter is over, you just pick that woman of yours, carry her in your arms to the most beautiful beach you could ever imagine, take her hand in marriage, and glory hallelujah. I smiled. You've got some imagination, Mitch, I'll say that. As I poured our tea, my phone rang. Hi, Lauren. Is Mitch with you? She asked quietly. Yeah. I'll be with you in ten. Des Cogan's story. After much fucking around, playing Avoid the Arab, I derived at the Prince of Wales to find it closed. Not only closed, but with two of the three lovely frosty glass windows boarded up. There was a cop car parked around the corner in the side street. I strolled by it, I placed my hand on the bonnet to find it hot. I knocked on the door of the main bar and waited for an answer. Finally, there was a movement. Maggie opened the heavy door an inch or so and peered out. When she saw it was me, she pulled it in the rest of the way and threw her arms around my neck. I held her tight, but before either of us could speak, she began to sob into my collar. Hey, hey, come on in, come on, it can't be that bad, can it? She pulled away from me, eyes red, no streaming. She wiped her face with her hand. Oh, Des, come in. Please come in. The police are just leaving. It was awful, just awful. I followed her into the bar. The old boy in the striped apron, the same one I'd seen outside after I'd left Maggie's bed, was busy sweeping glass from the floor. A young girl wearing thick gardening gloves was picking shards from the furnishings and hoovering the smaller slivers. What happened here then? I asked. A rather rotund policewoman waddled from behind the bar holding a clipboard. Vandals, she said. Bloody kids. I looked at Maggie. She gave me the slightest shake of her head. Oh, right, I said to the cop playing the game. There's no one hurt, I hope. Old George has a cut to his head, said Maggie. He's gone in an ambulance for it stitched. But he's a tough old bird. I put my arm around her. She was trembling. So he is. You'll be looking for these little buggers then, I asked the plump lord. The woman gave me a practiced smile that couldn't hide her weariness. We'll give it a go. But it was dark. They had the roads up. You know the script, sir. Do I? The cop pulled out a business card and handed it to Maggie. I wondered how long the cops had carried those. Back in the day when I was wee, everyone knew who our local coppers were. We knew them by name. More importantly, they knew us little sods too, and our brothers, and more importantly our parents. Having your hood up back then would not be a means of escaping punishment. Old P.C. McDermott would ensure you got your just desserts, whether he could prove your guilt or not. You can get me on that number, Maggie. Drone the cop. I've written your crime reference number on the back for insurance. I saw Maggie's tears start again. You can't buy windows like those any more. They don't make them. The cop dismissed that with a shrug. I could see her mind working. It's just a couple of windows get a grip. You're a licensee of a Manchester boozer, for fuck's sake. I gave Maggie a squeeze. Come on, I'll help you clear up. She managed a weak smile. Thanks, Des. Once the place was in some semblance of order and the staff had left, we sat in the bar around the copper top table, me with a Guinness, Maggie with a glass of red wine. With only the optic lights illuminated and the windows boarded, the pub was dark and quiet. Maggie reached across the table. You'll stay tonight, won't you, Des? If that's what you want, hen, yeah. I'd just nipped in to see how you're getting on, like. I'd like that. I'd, well, I'd need the company, to be honest. I gave her a smile and held her hand. So, what really happened? Maggie sat up. Pretty much as was said. It was kids. Well, teenagers, anyway. 
We caught them on the cameras, but like the officer told you, they were wearing hoodies. So why the shake of the head, Alia? Why do you think, Des? They've been back, those guys you saw the other day, the ones from Lucas Estates. What? Getting all heavy? She shook her head. No, that isn't their style. It was all veiled threats. The pub's in a bad area. You never know what might happen. You're a woman on your own. You know all that kind of shit. I knew. So you'd think they slipped the local idiots a few bob to put your windows in? I reckon. She drained her glass and checked her watch. Gosh, look at the time. It's getting late and the window guys will be here at seven. You want another before bed? That brought a smile to my face. I followed Maggie behind the bar and wrapped my arms around her waist as she poured my drink. She let her head fall backwards so I could kiss her neck. I could smell her perfume. She felt so good. I missed you, she said. Does that sound stupid? I mean, we've only just met, you know, just that one night together. Am I being a silly middle-aged fool? I held her tight. I figured we can all be a wee bit silly at times, hen. I've been on my own a while now when you sort of get used to being lonesome. I reckon you get to the point where being lonely is the easier option. No one to worry about. I have to say, well, well, if I'm honest, I've missed you too. So maybe we're both being foolish. Maggie gave me a beaming smile at that. There you go, she said, handing me my glass. You want to take it upstairs? I've bought some Pavarotti. Oh, that's fantastic, Maggie. You'd no need to do such a thing. Hey, I'll bring it up. I felt for my pipe. I'll just nip out for a wee smoke first, if you didn't mind. Just bolt the door after you when you come back in. She raised her brows. And don't be long. I stepped out into the warm evening, filled my pipe and inspected the pebbles of glass still glistening on the pavement, and the shavings of wood left by the boarding up service, the position of the CCTV cameras. Was it just feral kids, or was it more serious? Was it connected to Lucas Estates, to Young Fag, to Al Mufti? I lit the bowl, took the smoke into my lungs and blew it into the night sky. It wasn't the time to think about such things. Now it was the time for love, for the opportunity to hold a good, decent woman in my arms, to share a night with someone who just, maybe, could become someone special. I turned and stepped back inside the prince, just as the screaming started. Lauren North's story Larry dropped me at Piccadilly and I'd collected my RS6. I parked almost a mile away from the lockup, worked more drills, checking for tails, doubling back, darting in and out of takeaways and late bars, checking and rechecking again and again. It wasn't paranoia, it was about keeping alive. After punching the entry code into the lockup door, I stepped into the cool air. Rick and Mitch were sitting drinking tea. The TV played silently on the wall. Mitch had his magnum stripped on the tabletop and was busy cleaning it. Both men looked up. You OK? asked Rick. I drew my colt and pointed it at Mitch. I don't quite know how I expected him to react, but he just laid his hands on the table and looked straight into my eyes. Mr. Cogan was of a mind that you guys never point a gun at a man unless you intend to kill him. He said quietly. What's this about? spat Rick, brow furrowed, eyes darting between the American and my drawn weapon. I edged around the table, never taking my eyes from Mitch, and laid down the photograph Flurry had given me. It depicted Sadiq al-Mufti. He was standing in the doorway of the Revolution Bar on Oxford Road and was in deep conversation with another man. That man was none other than Mason Carver. I gestured towards the shot with my chin and eyed the American. Recorded less than an hour after you slipped out of the old monkey to take his call. Mitch was impassive. I pressed on. 
And then, that same evening, you drag Rick along to meet J.E. Blackman at the request of our so-called friend from the CIA. The moment you arrive in the room, young Fack walk into the Midland Hotel through an unguarded back entrance, slip up a stairway similarly bereft of any of your security service colleagues, and make a real mess of the Senator's very posh suite. How conveniently incompetent, don't you think? I don't speak for Mr. Carver, ma'am. I shook my head. Maybe not, but you take orders from him. When I arrived in the UK, I was instructed to report to Mason Carver. He was to be my contact here. In turn, he instructed me to assist you, and that is what I believe I've done. Now, I admit that my orders were to keep Todd Blackman's sexual preferences a secret for as long as possible, and to keep any information to the contrary from you. But at no time did Mason Carver suggest that I hinder your team further. I have had no reason to suspect him of any wrongdoing. Until now, that is. Mitch took a good long look at me. I couldn't tell if it was anger or disappointment in his eyes. What I can say for certain, ma'am, is that Mr. Fuller here saved my life in the middle. For sure, no doubt, one hundred percent. He turned his gaze to Rick. But as the Lord is my witness, Mr. Fuller, if I'd wanted harm to befall you that night, I could have shot you down like a dog in that corridor or let the guy with the AK do it for me. That's the truth, sir, and you know it. Rick nodded his agreement. I felt suddenly tired, as though someone had unplugged me. I sat and dropped the coal on the table. I take it you ain't gonna shoot me now, ma'am, said the American. I managed a weak smile. I just needed to know we could trust you. Mitch began the process of rebuilding his magnum. Well, ma'am, I suggest we go and ask Mr. Carver that same question. Des Kogan's story I'd drawn my Glock and stepped into the darkened bar area. The screaming had stopped, but my blood still ran cold. Easing myself forward, controlling my breathing, I allowed my eyes to readjust to the gloom, listening for movement from upstairs where I knew Maggie would be. As I got closer to the far wall, I could see that the back door of the building was still closed. It seemed secure. There was only one other way anyone could have gained access to the pub, and that was through the cellar doors and then up through the trapdoor behind the bar. I took a quick look-see. The trap was open. There was a bump from above and a muffled cry. I strode to the doorway that led to the stairs. The moment I reached the bottom step, a man appeared on the landing above. He held Maggie in front of him, using her as a human shield. She had tape around her mouth, and her hands were bound with the same material. Her eyes were wild with terror. He searched mine, pleading for help, and I felt my stomach turn. This is all my doing. I brought these men here to your home. The man, a tall, gangly Arab, was holding a large caliber handgun. His eyes were cold, his mouth turned in a permanent sneer. The guy raised his weapon to fire, and I ducked away just as the round splintered the wooden door frame to my left. As I squatted down behind the safety of the door frame, I heard the sound of shuffling feet from above. Maggie was struggling with her attacker, trying to kick out at the bigger, stronger man. Then there was another bump as a heavy weight fell against the wall on the landing. It stumbled. I took my opportunity and spun back into the open doorway. Maggie was twisting her body, desperate to free herself, her lanky, lean attacker gripping her tight and cussing her in his native tongue. I put a round in the guy's left ankle and he let go instantly, screaming in pain. Maggie twisted herself free and the Arab tumbled down the steps towards me head first, hands flailing, looking to grab at anything to stop his descent. I shot him in the back of his head and he slithered to a silent halt. I gestured for Maggie to join me at the bottom, but she was frozen with fear. She shook her head and slid down the wall, trembling uncontrollably, unable to move, transfixed by the dead body at the bottom of her stairs. I had to go and get her. 
I'd reached halfway when an unseen voice came from above me. He was somewhere off to my right, Maggie's left, probably just out of sight up the final two steps that led to the pub's living quarters. That is far enough, Mr. Cogan, said the man in a heavily accented American drawl. One more step and I will shoot the woman. I did as I was told. Maggie was crying, her attention drawn away from the dead man. She seemed unable to tear her eyes away from the direction of the voice. Tears poured down her cheeks, and I heard footsteps. This time behind me, and the cold barrel of an AK-47 was pushed behind my ear. Drop it, said the second man. I lost the Glock. The moment it dropped to the floor, the owner of the unseen voice appeared on the landing. Sadiq al-Mufti was dressed in his trademark suit, hair pulled back in a greasy ponytail, his eyes shining lifelessly black in the half-light. He pointed an MP5K one-handed and eyed me quizzically. You know the English saying, Mr. Cogan, a snow fool like an old fool. This is you, is it not? I knew that you would play the hero. I knew that you would come running for this woman, a worthless infidel woman at that. I turned down my mouth. You seem to know a lot about me. Why don't you answer that one? Indeed, I know many things about you, Scottish man. I've known all about the special air service since being a small child. But only recently did my father and I discover the names of the troopers that tried so hard to kill our family all those years ago. It was you, Mr. Cogan, wasn't it? You and your friend, Richard Fuller. It was you who tried to murder us all in our beds. Twenty years. How time flies, don't you think? And now you come to try and kill me a second time. He widened his eyes, and I considered the boy was either high as a kite or completely barking. What a fascinating coincidence, isn't it, Desmond? Siddiq made a gesture to the guy behind me, who expertly bound my wrists behind my back. He used thin plastic-covered line that cut into my skin, and I felt my hands start to numb instantly. Whoever had tied me was quickly joined by a third face. He grabbed my hair and pulled back my head so his boss could leer at my coupon. Al Mufti smiled and gripped Maggie by the arm. He pulled her to her feet and shoved her down the stairs towards me. She managed to stay upright and fell against my chest. She sobbed quietly. The Arab waved his MP5. And now, Mr. Cogan, let's sit together and talk about old times. He glanced at his gold watch on his wrist. Our transport won't be too long, and then we shall all go for a ride into the country. Rick Fuller's story The fact that Mason Carver had been turned was an issue. Just as frustrating was the fact that Mitch had been unable to obtain his last known address from official channels. Apparently, the CIA, FBI and various other US agencies don't like each other too much and they all gave him the runaround. In the end, I rang Cartwright and, other than his irritation at being roused from his bed after midnight, the old codger was neither surprised nor concerned by our revelations. Thankfully, it appeared the British Secret Service kept a better eye on American spies residing in their country. We had Carver's address. The CIA man had a top-floor penthouse in a newish 30-storey block in Piccadilly. It took us less than ten minutes to reach the gaff from the lock-up. Lauren worked the concierge who was so impressed with her cleavage he fell to notice two big angry blokes at the lift doors. The top floor housed just two massive penthouses. I was quite impressed. Lauren and I stood out of sight as Mitch knocked and waited. Music was playing from inside the apartment. We were in luck. Finally, the door was opened, but not by our man. A pale, willowy girl, dressed in nothing but one of Carver's shirts and a pair of cheap stilettos, stood at the door waving a £20 note. 
She gave Mitch the once over, then looked either side of him. Where is it? The ever polite American looked puzzled. Ma'am? The girl pouted. The takeaway, stupid. I mean, come on, it's been an hour. I rang just before and they said you were here already. Lauren had obviously heard enough. She twisted her body into the doorway, grabbed the glowering girl by the hair and marched her down the hallway. Hey, come on, she shouted. Don't damage the goods here. I pulled my sig but kept it behind my back. I didn't want to terrify the kid, but finding myself up close and personal with Carver, holding nothing but a pizza menu in my hand, was not an option either. We needn't have worried. Carver was going nowhere. The secret service man was firmly tied to his four-poster bed, naked but for a Red Sox baseball cap. Lauren released the hired help. She flounced onto a nearby chair and glared at Carver. I hope this means I still get my two hundred. In the light of the bedroom, I realised just how very young she was. Get dressed, I said. And if you earn two hundred an hour for this shit, you could at least buy decent shoes. She pulled her face, found some clothes and disappeared into the lounge. A minute later, we heard the front door slam and she was gone. Lauren stood at the side of Carver's bed, head cocked, hands on hips. What food did you order? she asked. Carver was red-faced. What is this? What are you fools doing in my house? Just fucking untie me now. Lauren tested one of his bonds for sturdiness. I kind of like you where you are, Carver. All trussed up like a steer at a rodeo. Come on, indulge me. What on God's green earth were you going to eat whilst tied to your bed? Especially with your daughter for company. How old was she? Sixteen? Seventeen? He turned his head away in embarrassment. She was of age. That is all that concerns you. He turned back, glowering with rage. And it was ice cream. Okay, happy now. Fucking ice cream. Right on cue, there was a knock at the door. Lauren smiled. That must be your order. Mitch, get that for me, will you? Oh, and bring me a sharp knife from the kitchen, please. Yes, ma'am, he said. Moments later, the American walked back into the bedroom with a large bladed carver and a bag full of Italian ice cream. Lauren took the knife and tested the blade for weight. Thank you, Mitch. Help yourself to gelato, boys. Mason won't mind, will you, Mason? You're finished for this, bawled Carver. All of you, particularly you, Collins, you'll never be able to set foot in Quantico again. Lauren pulled a copy of the photograph Larry had given her in the ostrich and held it in front of Carver's face. Remember this guy? she asked. His name is Sadiq al-Mufti. Fuck you, spat Carver. Is that what this is about? What do you think that picture proves? You have no idea what you're dealing with here, or how the intelligence agencies work. She folded the picture, handed it to Mitch, and began tracing the tip of the knife down Carver's chest towards his groin. Lauren kept her voice level. Mason, you know, just a few weeks ago, Mr. Fuller here cut off a man's testicles because he wouldn't be truthful. Unfortunately, he died of shock minutes later. She gave him her best beaming smile. I'd hope to keep you alive a while longer. Me being a nurse and all. Carver sneered. Who the fuck do you think you are? You really believe you can slice up a senior CIA agent right here in the UK? The fallout between our agencies would go on for years. Dream on, fool. Go on, start cutting. See where it gets you. Mitch squared his shoulders. I feel you owe us an explanation, sir. You have been filmed meeting with Siddiq al-Mufti, our prime subject in the Blackman murder case. Also, just hours after this recorded meeting, al-Mufti's men were given easy access to the Midland Hotel, where an attempt on Senator J.E. Blackman's life took place. Mitch stepped towards the bed, and for the first time I considered how difficult he would be to stop if... He decided to slot Carver before we got him to talk. You were in charge of security that day, sir, were you not? Carver pulled at his ties. Fuck you, Collins. You can't prove a thing. Mitchie's mood turned dark. He slipped his magnum from its holster and curled his lips, his calm and collected tone wavering with anger. 
Good men lost their lives that day, sir. Good God-fearing Americans, men with wives and children back home. Carver finally seemed to realize the danger he was in, stopped struggling, took a breath, and tried another tack. Look, Mitch, you know me. We go back a long way. Remember Iraq, huh? Are you gonna believe these mercenaries over me? These fucking limey bastards will work for anyone. Why do you think Blackman chose them? The only reason they're here is the million bucks on the table. I'm telling you, Mitch... There are bigger forces at work here than you know. Forces that want to make our country stronger. Now, I'm willing to let bygones be bygones, okay? You made a mistake, you picked the wrong team. Just untie me and I can explain everything. Mitch leaned over. Where is Sadiq Al-Mufti, Mr. Carver? Carver shook his head. Come on, Collins. Remember who you are. You're a U.S. Marine, trained to follow the chain of command. It isn't your place to interfere in these things. This is just too big for you. Now untie me. That's an order. Mitch pointed the magnum. I'm a reasonable man, Mr. Carter. I don't hold with torture of any kind. Therefore, I will not sit by and watch Miss North remove any part of your anatomy. He called the magnum. However, I will blow your head off. I'll ask you once more, sir. Where is Sadiq Al-Mufti? Fuck you, screamed Carver. You want dare, Marine? He thrashed against his ties once more, his face knotted in rage, twisting one way, then another, eyes wild. We watched him struggle in vain, until eventually he fell back, exhausted, bathed in sweat and breathing hard. He looked straight at me, wild-eyed. Fuller, you need to listen to me. They call Sadiq al-Mufti the dragon. You know why. He has no remorse. When it comes to inflicting pain, he even outstrips his father. He enjoys it, lives for it. The man is pure evil. Believe me, he will devour you all. Let me go, Fuller. Walk away from this while you still can. Carver's eyes widened even further. Walk away, Fuller, because it's you Al Mufti wants, my friend. Even more than Kulanovich wants J.E. Blackman. Didn't you know? Oh, yeah, he hates you so bad for what you did. He's been waiting to take his revenge on you for twenty years. A manic laugh escaped from Carver's mouth. A million dollars, eh? Blackman is paying you a measly million dollars to save his political skin, to keep his image whiter than white. Chicken feed, a pittance. The CIA man sneered. The moment Abdallah Al Mufti discovered it was you the Blackman had employed Fuller, well, money became no object. A million dollars became a mere drop in the ocean. The bastard was actually smiling. It was all so easy. That fool Cartwright gave me full access to your files. All the way back to your 13th birthday. I know more about you than your poor dead mother. It was all in there. The whole story of how you fucked up the Libyan operation and lost one of your team. What was his name now? Freddy. Frankie, I said quietly. Yeah, that was it. Frankie Green. Wife and three kids, I believe. Shame that. It must have been tough giving them the bad news, eh? But then again, you are used to bad news, aren't you, Fuller? It follows you around like a bad smell. I felt my temper getting the better of me. So you sold us out to a terrorist, you treacherous piece of shit. Carver snorted his derision. Money talks in any language, Fuller. You know that only too well. I slid the safety off my sig. You gave us to young fack, took their money. You went capping in to Abdullah al-Mufti and betrayed your country in the process. Carver scoffed. It was a very rewarding conversation, Fuller. And now the cat is out of the bag. Well, al-Mufti won't stop until you're dead. Preferably nailed to a cross like that little fag Todd Blackman. You and anyone associated with you. He turned to Lauren. Shame about that, honey. I always was a sucker for a brunette. 
Lauren's grip tightened on her knife. Carver was very close to losing his manhood. Somehow he didn't seem too concerned. Don't be a silly girl, Miss North. Killing me won't do you any good. You see, you need me. I'm the only one who can help you now. The CIA man's tone became conciliatory, conspiratorial. Listen, this is all over for all of you. You can't win this one. It's a job too far. No one can stop young fact from growing. They've already overtaken the Sicilians, even the Russians, and those Albanian fuckers are on the ropes. No one can stop Kulinovich from becoming the most powerful man in America. So, what's it to be for? Kill me right here or make a deal. A once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Cut these ropes and cut your losses. Walk away. Turn your back on this investigation and I'll pay you your million in cash anywhere in the world you desire. I'm telling you, Fuller, if you stay here and keep this inquiry going, you're all dead. I shrugged. We all appear to be breathing, Carver. He nodded. For now you are, but I think you'll find it's already too late for your Scottish friend, Cogan. Take the offer, Fuller. Take the million and run. Run for your life. Without warning, Mitch snatched the pillow from under Carver's head and held it over his face with his massive hand. Carver began his thrashing again, pleading this time, begging for his life. But it was no use to him. The immensely powerful American Marine pushed the muzzle of his magnum into the pillow and held it there a moment. He looked at me briefly. I thought I saw a flash of genuine hatred in his eyes. Traitor, he said and pulled the trigger. Lauren looked on as the white pillow flowered with crimson. We need to find Des, she said, and fast. I nodded. It'd help if we knew where he was. I know, said Mitch Holster in his gun, so I'll drive. Lauren North's story Google Maps will tell you that Piccadilly to Ancoats by car is a nine-minute drive. Not with Mitch driving my Audi RS6, it isn't. He manoeuvred the car expertly along the narrow streets, and four and a half minutes later, we rolled up outside the Prince of Wales. The pub was in darkness, the front door lying open. Two of the windows had been recently boarded, and broken glass glistened on the pavement. Mitch killed the engine. He jumped out and approached the pub doorway. Rick stopped in his tracks. He's not here, he said. Mitch made for the door. Oh, we need to search the pub to be certain of that, sir. Rick knelt down and picked up a small pipe from amongst the pebbles of glass. Then he took two paces and collected a brass zippo lighter. Another two paces found a small bag of tobacco. We all took in his silence. They've taken him, he said. Somewhere close by an engine fired and was revved hard. Seconds later, from the narrow alleyway at the rear of the Prince, a dark blue transit van powered out onto the road and slewed left, back the way we had come. Go! shouted Rick. I threw myself across the back seat. Mitch drove with Rick as his front passenger. The big Audi wouldn't turn so easily in the narrow streets full of parked cars, and Mitch was forced to complete a box manoeuvre and follow the exact course that the van had taken. By the time we'd exited the alley, it was out of sight. Mitch steadied the car and we all peered left and right down each side road and crossroads in the hope of catching a glimpse of the van. Less than a minute later, we saw them. Off to our left, three vehicles in front. Not too close, warned Rick as Mitch pushed the Aldi along at a pace. The American eased off and we followed at a discreet distance. Minutes later, the van took the slip road and joined the M67. There's Kogan's story. Yosef, I want to know if this Audi is a tail. Al Mufti was looking out of the rear windows of the van and shouting to his driver. The car had obviously been with us a while. I was sitting on the floor of the loading area, knees up against my chest facing the doors, too low down to see what the Arab was looking at. All I hoped was that the offending Audi was Lauren's RS6 and help was at hand. 
My wrists were still bound, but I'd worked at my restraints constantly. There was the merest movement in the bindings, and I could now feel my hands, but I'd caused myself a great deal of pain in the process. Al Mufti sat atop the internal wheel arch and peered out at the suspect car. The moment we had been thrown into the van, Maggie had regained her mettle and began giving the Arab trouble. She had tried to kick out at him. He had dealt with her disobedience with frightening viciousness, punching her repeatedly in the face. Maggie now lay on her side just feet from me, her nose broken and bleeding. She gave me the occasional frightened glance but stayed quiet. I stuck to the training I'd been given, playing the beaten man, head down, silent, waiting for any opportunity to escape. Faster! shouted Al Mufti to his driver. I said I wanted to know if this fool was following. Go! Go now! I heard the engine note change and the van begin to accelerate. We were rocked around in the back as the vehicle reached the limit of its power. Al Mufti looked out again and turned to me, that feverish smile back on his face. I think we have your friends behind us. I knew they would follow you. I knew they would not stop until they found you. I wanted to smash him to a pulp. He picked up his MP5. Maybe I will shoot them from here. What do you think, Desmond? I looked at the floor and did my best to play the downtrodden prisoner. If Wreck had any sense, he'd stay back, over a hundred metres away at least. If that was the case, then the MP5 wouldn't be much use, especially firing from a van that seemed intent on drifting from lane to lane at a terrifying rate of knots. Al Mufti seemed to lose interest in the car for a moment. Look at me, Desmond. I slowly raised my head. He examined me quizzically. Head cocked those black eyes of his like shimmering empty sockets. You hate me, don't you, Coggan? I don't hate anyone, I said quietly. I'm just doing my job. He pointed the MP5. The job of an infidel mercenary, a hired gun. I tried to play down any hint of my military past that could enrage him further. More like a private detective. It's been a long time since the army. Ah, a detective looking for Todd Blackman's killer. That's right. Al Mufti grasped what looked like two charms that dangled around his neck. He touched them like a nun would a crucifix. I couldn't make out exactly what they were. Then proudly he held them out for me to see. They were two nails hanging from a chain. So now you have found him. Your job is over. You crucified him? Yes. Isn't religion a wonderful thing? And you kept the nails from his feet? Not that ghoulish if you know your history. I just shook my head. You think I'm some kind of animal, a heathen, don't you? I think you're a hypocrite. You kill a young man because you want to show the world his sexuality, and yet you are gay yourself. That was a stupid thing to say. I should have just stayed quiet as I've been trained to, played dumb. Al Mufti flew into a rage. He leaned forward and smashed the butt of his MP5 into my skull. My vision blurred and I felt instantly sick. Blood poured down the side of my face. I lolled forward, only my knees keeping me from falling face down on the floor of the van. Al Mufti lifted my head by my hair and spat in my face. Liar! He bawled. Infidel! Liar! Sorry, I mumbled, falling back into the character I should have never strayed from. We were off the motorway, yet Scarily didn't appear to have slowed down. We seemed to be climbing too, and there was a definite lack of street lights. From what I'd seen and from my internal sense of direction, we were crossing the Pennines heading over the Woodhead Pass. The last thing we'd needed was a quiet moorland road for Al Mufti to dispose of his own. He wasn't finished with the rhetoric. How long were you in the SAS? he asked. I was in the army. He sneered at me. Don't make me hurt you again, Desmond. What is the point in suffering for something we both know to be true? 
I looked at the floor and watched my blood drip onto my jeans. The Arab looked out of the rear window again and spoke to the glass. Twenty-two SAS, to be precise, Mr. Cogan. Part of their counter-terrorism unit. He turned to me again. One of the men following us in that white Audi is another special air service trooper, eh? Your best friend, Richard Edward Fuller. He grinned. I speak the truth, yes. I played the game. I can't see from here, sorry. Al Mufti ignored my act. He was your corporal, remember? Back in November 1987, Libya, a small town called Tishi. On my ringing bells, Mr. Cogan, you came to assassinate me and my family. Instead, you killed over thirty of my father's men, wounded many more and ruined his business. He smiled again, and I wanted to knock out every tooth in his mouth. Instead, I let my head fall. Well, Mufti was on a fucking roll. You lost a man that day. Do you recall his name? I shook my head without looking up. No. Well, he remembered yours. He remembered it all too well. He gave you up as my father nailed his wrists to that post outside our house. He leaned closer to me, so close I could feel his breath. Oh, how he screamed your name, Desmond, before we gutted him like a plump trout. Come on, say your dead friend's name for me. It begins with the letter F. If that helps. I looked up into the Arab's face. He was really enjoying himself. Frankie Green. Yes, at last you recall. Excellent. You see, even though I was only nine at the time, I remember Frankie well. He had a wife and children, you know. Three kids, wasn't it? How he cried for those babies, Desmond. He called their names as I drove the nails into his feet. It took me ages. I was so young and inexperienced, you see. Not so good with a hammer. He sniggered. I made a bit of a mess of it. He leaned forward again and held the pair of nails that dangled around his neck. Oh, silly me, Desmond. I've led you up the garden path, haven't I? I've led you to believe that these were Todd's nails. He shook his head theatrically. No, I've saved those so we can send them to his disgusting excuse for a father. No, these are Freddy's nails. My father made me pull these from your dead friend's feet as he rotted on that post. I was nearly sick with the stench, Desmond, but I did it. My father put them on his necklace for me to wear as a constant reminder. Never forget what the infidels have done to us, he said. And never forgive. Al Mufti rummaged behind him and pulled out a bag. It was about the size of a supermarket carrier, but was made of a purple material and I remembered that the forensics guys at Todd's murder scene had recovered some similarly coloured fibres. Your nails are in here, he said. Yours and Mr. Fuller's. Father was insistent that you suffer the same fate as your friend, Freddy. He narrowed his gaze, and I was only too happy to oblige him. I caught Maggie's eye. She was crying again. I didn't react. The last thing I needed was to give Al Mufti more psychological ammunition to fire at me. Somehow he still picked up the vibe. Oh, and we spoiled your nice romantic interlude too, didn't we? How long have you two been lovers? I had been trained to deny relationships, friendships, even knowledge of another person if we could. If your captor or interrogator could find a way to get to you through another, it weakened your position. We're not lovers, I said softly. 
I called into the pub for a beer and was helping clear up the mess after the windows were broken. Al Mufti looked out of the back window again. I could see the flash of headlights on his face. The RSX must have been gaining. Speed up, he shouted to the driver, even though we were bouncing along at a fair lick. He turned again. Not lovers, you say? I shook my head. The van was on a downhill section and the engine was screaming as it revved over its maximum. Faster, shouted the Arab. Inshallah, the driver replied as he fought to keep the van steady. Definitely not lovers, you say, Desmond. I kept up the pretense. We've just met tonight, I told you we've... Al Mufti suddenly grabbed at a handle and kicked the rear doors open with a bang. The sudden rush of air into the low area buffeted us. It almost knocked the Arab off his feet, his jacket billowing in the wind. Undeterred, he grabbed Maggie and dragged her towards the opening. We were travelling over seventy miles an hour. I could see the RS6 on our tail. Whoever was driving must have seen the doors open, thought Al Mufti was about to open up with his H and K and hit the brakes. I saw the noise of the car dip and the car back off that precious hundred metres or so. Al Mufti grappled with Maggie, dragging her to a sitting position. Don't! I shouted over the rushing wind. Please! Al Mufti, there's no need to hurt her. It's me you want. The Arab looked into my eyes and flashed me that wicked smile. You hate me now, don't you, Desmond? Then he pushed Maggie out. Rick Fuller's story. The transit had been struggling as it climbed towards Woodhead, but as we began our descent it picked up speed, rocking dangerously as it went over and above its handling capabilities. When the back doors flew open, we all ducked instinctively, waiting for the onslaught of gunfire from the occupants. But it didn't come. Instead, a woman's body was thrown out into the carriageway. It hit the floor like a grotesque rag doll thrown from a speeding pram by a petulant child. We were doing just over 70 miles an hour. That's 102 feet per second. By the time we had realised we weren't being fired on and raised our heads, the RS6 had travelled 250 feet. The body was bouncing along the tarmac directly in our path. Mitch did his best, but we were way too close. The Audi slammed into what by now could only have been a corpse, as it was in mid-air. It clipped the top of the bonnet and spun. There was a sickening slap as it struck the windscreen directly in front of me. It was like hitting a brick wall. Miraculously, although being cracked, the screen held, but the force of the impact caused Mitch to lose control, and the car slew to the right. The American fought with the wheel, but even the tremendous technical prowess of the RS6 and the skill of the drive couldn't keep the car on the road. We hit the opposing curb and the car was instantly airborne. I ducked down and waited for the inevitable. We must have ploughed through a fence and bounced along for a while, but somehow Mitch kept the car upright. Finally we came to a halt. Everyone okay? shouted Mitch. Lauren didn't answer. She was out of the back doors and sprinting towards the body. Mitch and I followed. She knelt by the mangled mass of arms and legs, checked for vital signs, looked up and shook her head. I turned to see the van's tail lights disappearing down the hill. Des Kogan's story. 
Al Mufti steadied himself, stretched out a long arm and pulled the rear doors closed. Satisfied that the threat from the RS6 was now long behind us, the windows no longer held his interest and he turned his attention solely on yours truly. You think you're in pain now, don't you, Coggan? I didn't imagine I would ever be able to close my eyes again without seeing Maggie's broken body bouncing along that lonely stretch of road, crashing into the Audi and disappearing into the night. If that was what the bastard meant by my pain... He was on the money. I was physically hurting. My stomach lurched, my throat burned. I raised my head. You're gonna shoot me, I said. Al Mufti turned down his mouth and shook his head. He picked up the purple velvet bag and waved it in front of my face. No, Desmond, that is not an option. Too quick, too clean, too obvious. I struggled against my ties, but there wasn't enough play to release my hands. An all-consuming, smothering sense of loss overwhelmed me. Yet somehow it was physical, and I was beyond emotion. I was already dead inside. The Arab had taken something from me, something precious, something intrinsically good. I stared into his lifeless eyes. Why do they call you the dragon? I asked. He shrugged, smug arrogance. Maybe I breathe fire. Maybe you're full of shit. The smile left his face. I will enjoy cutting you open, Kogan. I shook my head. I told you, that isn't gonna happen. You're gonna shoot me. Al Mufti's eyes widened. You will pray for a bullet, Desmond. You will beg for the end. Just like Freddy. Just like Todd. Fucking no chance. I pushed both my heels under my backside and using all my strength threw my body forwards towards him. He was off guard and off balance. I caught him under the chin with the top of my skull. It felt like I'd been hit on the head with a lump hammer. I heard him grunt and he fell backwards against the rear doors with me on top of him, bleeding like a stuck pig. I rolled to my left, using my body to pin his right arm to the deck, preventing him from lifting the H and K upward into a firing position. He twisted under me, screaming in Arabic, face contorted, eyes cruel. I had no way of defending myself for long and he knew it. He brought up his left fist and punched me in the side of my head, once, twice... There was no weight behind the blows as he didn't have the angle or purchase, but they rattled my teeth and sent stars floating in my vision. He was desperately trying to lift the MP5. I raised my head and butted him in the face, my jaw snapping at him like a rabid terrier, hoping to lock on his nose. He caught me with a bigger punch and I was instantly dizzy and uncoordinated. A moment later, the H&K was free and I could barely focus on it. I rolled again in a vain attempt to smother the weapon. As I dropped onto the gun, he fired. The machine pistol was set to fully automatic. 900 rounds per minute equates to a 30-round mag every two seconds. Dozens of red-hot bullets clattered along the floor of the van, spitting sparks in all directions as they ricocheted about the load area. I felt the searing agony as I was hitting the arch of my left foot. The pain was shocking. I hadn't much left. It was nearly over. I raised my head again and drove it into Al Mufti's, unsure where I would connect. I thought I'd grazed his left eye, but my own kinetic energy meant my head carried on downwards and I struck the floor of the van with a sickening thump. Then all hell broke loose. The speeding van took a sudden change in direction. The tyres squealed like pigs at slaughter. I heard the front passenger shouting at the driver. A split second later we hit something hard and I was thrown forwards and upwards. The back of my neck slammed into the roof of the van. With my hands still bound I had no way to protect myself. Before I could think there was an even bigger collision than we were rolling. My bouncing body was thrown into the side of the low area and I felt something give in my shoulder. I brought my knees up to my chest and did my best to tuck my chin in. There was no way of knowing up from down, left from right. 
Time stopped, and my world went silent as the van completed another full slow motion rotation. I was weightless. Then it was over. The air was acrid with the smell of diesel and hot oil. I tried to move, but rivers of pain shot through my body. I'd been in an accident, I knew that. But why? I moved again. All my physical damage appeared to be on my left side. My collarbone was broken. Gingerly, I prodded around my shoulder socket and quickly confirmed that it too was dislocated. Then I felt the pain in my foot. There is nothing like a gunshot wound to bring you to your senses. A second later, my grey matter went into overdrive. I remembered everything. I was instantly overwhelmed by sorrow. Blood had continued to seep from my head wound whilst I'd been out cold. It had run into my eyes, and as I recalled Maggie's shocking demise, it mixed with tears of great sadness. I blinked away as much of the combination I could and tried to focus. I rolled on my right side. The back doors of the van had bust open in the crash, and I was alone. Where was the evil bastard? The transit was on its roof. Pushing myself backwards with my good leg, blowing out short breaths as I moved to try and manage my pain, I finally rested my back against the inside of the van. I turned to look in the passenger compartment. Through the mesh bulkhead, I could see that the driver had caught around in the middle of his back, causing the crash. The passenger had been crushed when the van's engine had been forced into the passenger compartment. I looked around the load area. I needed to free myself from my bonds. Finally, I saw the purple bag. I'll move to his crucifixion kit. Moving steadily, shuffling along on my backside, I reached the bag and felt blindly for the contents. A hammer, nails, and just what I'd hoped for. A knife. A very painful minute later, my hands were free. I checked my pockets for my mobile, found it and opened the screen. Busted. More shuffling around in near total darkness found the MP5. I grabbed it with my good arm, gripped the weapon between my knees and checked it over. Empty. Beggars couldn't be choosers. I returned to the velvet bag, pushed the knife in my back pocket and shuffled towards the doors. Sitting on the edge of the van's upturned roof, I looked out and tried to get my bearings. I was in a field... The road was about a hundred yards away at twelve o'clock. A section of flattened fence indicated the transit's entry point and a telegraph pole standing at a forty-five degree angle ten metres further inward explained the second massive impact that had pushed the engine inside the cab and sent the van tumbling. Now, the big question. Could I walk? I raised myself onto my good leg and tested my damaged left. It was like sticking a knitting needle in the wound. Maybe it would be best just to sit and wait for daylight and rescue. Maybe Rick would be looking for me now. The night was warm enough despite the altitude. The cloud cover moved swiftly above me, ensuring that the moor was black as pitch one minute, then bathed in moonlight the next. It was in one of those rare moments of monochrome visibility that I saw him. Sadiq al Mufti lay on his back not twenty yards from me. I pushed myself from the van and shuffled on my backside towards him. It took me a while and I was bathed in sweat and racked with pain, but I reached him. He had obviously been thrown clear of the accident, but he certainly hadn't walked. A shattered femur stuck out of his right thigh, wet, shining white, framed by the jet black of the blood pooled around it. He was mumbling what I guessed was a prayer. He shivered. He was dying. The mixture of the shock and the blood loss slowly taking his life. As I drew close, he turned his head and looked at me with the eyes of coal. Cogan, Cogan, help, help me, he whispered. I looked at him. His broken body slowly closing down. You want me to help you, you say? He nodded. 
I tapped the side of his face with my good hand. Oh, hey, lad, I'll help you, I'd hate. Of course I will. I pointed towards the van. I'll no be a minute, son. I'll be back in a wee while. I shuffled along on my ass all the way back to the transit. I didn't think it was possible to sweat so much in such a short time. As I collected what I wanted, I was soaked to the skin. Five minutes later, I was back sitting beside him. How are you feeling, pal? I asked, breathing hard, doing my best to ignore my pain. I'm cold, he said. Aye, that's normal when you're on your last legs, eh? When you're dying. I don't want to die. I rummaged in the velvet bag. It does, son. He gave me a curious look. What are you doing? I'm going to help you on your way. Gone was the boy's bravado, his swagger, his cold confidence. No, no, please don't. You can't do this. I have money, much money. My father will pay. He will forgive you, Kogan, and your friends. If you help me now, I will tell him how you saved me. He will forgive. I give my word. I selected a nail from the bag and examined it. Forgive, you say? Yes, he is a merciful man, my father. A fine man. I lifted myself up with my good arm and sat myself on the boy's chest. He began to struggle, but it was pointless. With my weight on top of him, he fought for breath. My voice was a mere whisper. Back in Tishy, pal, when you were a wee nipper, Frankie Green, the one you nailed to that post, he refused to blow up your house because you and your wee sister were tucked up inside. Funny that, eh? I tested the tip of the nail for sharpness with my thumb. We came to kill your father, you see, not you or your sister. Butch, well, he was a different matter. He wanted to slot all of you. But no Frankie or me or Rick. See, Frankie had kids, like you said. Now, he knew what forgiveness meant. I just about managed to hold the nail steady. My hands were shaking as my own pen began to take its toll on my nervous system. Keep still, son. I said as I rested the point of the nail on the centre of his forehead. It didn't or it couldn't move. Tears ran down the sides of his face. Please, he said. I beg you, I beg. I lifted the hammer above my head. Frankie might forgive, I said. But I won't. I brought the hammer down. You've been listening to The Follower by Robert White, narrated by Nicholas Cam, published by Whole Story Quest, an imprint of W.F. Howes Limited. This work is copyrighted 2017, Robert White. This recording is copyrighted 2018, W.F. Howes Limited.